Chapter 8 of A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clerk. Chapter 8 Part 1 Planets and Satellites. Continued. Part 1. The analogy between Mars and the Earth is perhaps by far the greatest in the whole solar system. So Herschel wrote in 1783. And so we may safely say today, after six score further years of scrutiny. The circumstance lends a particular interest to inquiries into the physical habitudes of our exterior planetary neighbor. Fontana first caught glimpses at Naples in 1636 and 1638 of dusky stains on the ruddy disk of Mars. They were next seen by Hook and Cassini in 1666, and this time with sufficient distinctness to serve as indices to the planet's rotation, determined by the latter as taking place in a period of 24 hours 40 minutes. Increased confidence was given to this result through Moraldi's precise verification of it in 1719. Among the spots observed by him, he distinguished two as stable in position, though variable in size. They were of a peculiar character, showing as bright patches round the poles, and had already been noticed during the sixty years back. A current conjecture of their snowy nature obtained validity when Herschel connected their fluctuations in extent with the progress of the Martian seasons. The inference of frozen precipitations could scarcely be resisted when once it was clearly perceived that the shining polar zones did actually, by turns, diminish and grow with the alternations of summer and winter in the corresponding hemisphere. This, it may be said, was the opening of our acquaintance with the state of things prevailing on the surface of Mars. It was accompanied by a steady assertion, on Herschel's part, of permanence in the dark markings, notwithstanding partial obscurations by clouds and vapors floating in a considerable but moderate atmosphere. Hence, the presumed inhabitants of the planet were inferred to probably enjoy a situation in many respects similar to ours. Schroeter, on the other hand, went altogether wide of the truth as regards Mars. He held that the surface visible to us is a mere shell of drifting cloud, deriving a certain amount of apparent stability from the influence on evaporation and condensation of subjacent but unseen areographical features, and his opinion prevailed with his contemporaries. It was, however, rejected by Kanowski in 1822, and finally overthrown by Beer in Madler's careful studies during five consecutive oppositions, 1830-39. through 39. They identified at each the same dark spots, frequently blurred with mists, especially when the local winter prevailed, but fundamentally unchanged. In 1862, Lockyer established a marvelous agreement with Beer in Madler's results of 1830, leaving no doubt as to the complete fixity of the main features amid daily, nay, hourly, variations of detail through transits of clouds. On 17 nights of the same opposition, F. Kaiser of Leiden obtained drawings in which nearly all the markings noted in 1830 at Berlin reappeared. Besides spots frequently seen respectively by Arago in 1813, by Herschel in 1783, and one sketched by Haugens in 1672, with a writing pen in his diary. From these data, the Leiden observer arrived at a period of rotation of 24 hours, 37 minutes, 22.62 seconds, being just one second shorter 
than that deduced exclusively from their own observations by Beer and Madler. The exactness of this result was practically confirmed by the inquiries of Professor Bakusen of Leiden. Using for a middle term of comparison the disinterred observations of Schroeter with those of Haugens at one and of Schiaparelli at the other end of an interval of 220 years, he was enabled to show, with something like certainty, that the time of rotation, 24 hours, 37 minutes, 22.735 seconds, ascribed to Mars by Mr. Proctor in reliance on a drawing executed by Hook in 1666, was too long by nearly one-tenth of a second. The minuteness of the correction indicates the nicety of care employed. Nor employed vainly, for owing to the comparative antiquity of the records available in this case, an almost infinitesimal error becomes so multiplied by frequent repetition as to produce palpable discrepancies in the positions of the markings at distant dates, Hence, Bakusen's period of 24 hours, 37 minutes, 22.66 seconds, is undoubtedly of a precision unapproached as regards any other heavenly body save the earth itself. Two facts bearing on the state of things at the surface of Mars were then fully acquired to science in or before the year 1862. The first was that of the seasonal fluctuations of the polar spots. The second, that of the general permanence of certain dark gray or greenish patches, perceived with the telescope as standing out from the deep yellow ground of the disk, that these varieties of tint correspond to the real diversities of a terraqueous globe, the ripe cornfield sections representing land, the dusky spots and streaks, oceans and straits, has long been the prevalent opinion. Sir J. Herschel, in 1830, led the way in ascribing the redness of the planet's light to an inherent peculiarity of soil. Previously, it had been assimilated to our sunset glows, rather than to our red sandstone formations, set down, that is, to an atmospheric stoppage of blue rays. But the extensive Martian atmosphere, implicitly believed in, on the strength of some erroneous observations by Cassini and Romer in the 17th century, vanished before the sharp occultation of a small star in Leo, witnessed by Sir James South in 1822, and Dawes's observation in 1865, that the ruddy tinge is deepest near the central parts of the disk, certified its non-atmospheric origin. The absolute whiteness of the polar snowcaps was alleged in support of the same inference by Sir William Huggins in 1867. All recent operations tend to show that the atmosphere of Mars is much thinner than our own. This was to have been expected a priori, since the same proportionate mass of air would, on his smaller globe, form a relatively sparse covering. Besides, gravity there possesses less than four-tenths its force here, so that this sparser covering would weigh less, and be less condensed than if it enveloped the earth. Atmospheric pressure would accordingly be of about two and a quarter, instead of fifteen terrestrial pounds per square inch. This corresponds with what the telescope shows us. It is extremely doubtful whether any features of the Earth's actual surface could be distinguished by a planetary spectator, however well provided with optical assistance. Professor Langley's inquiries led him to conclude that fully twice as much light is absorbed by our air as had previously been supposed, say 40%, of vertical rays in a clear sky. Of the sixty reaching the earth, less than a quarter would be reflected even from white sandstone, and this quarter would again pay heavy toll in escaping back to space. Thus, not more than perhaps ten or twelve out of the original hundred 
sent by the sun would under the most favorable circumstances and from the very center of the earth's disk reach the eye of a martian or lunar observer the light by which he views our world is there is little doubt light reflected from the various strata of our atmosphere cloud or mist laden or serene as the case may be with an occasional snow mountain figuring as a permanent white spot this consideration at once shows us how much more tenuous the martian air must be since it admits of topographical delineations of the martian globe the clouds too that form in it seem in general to be rather of the nature of ground mists than of heavy cumulus occasionally indeed durable and extensive strata become visible during the latter half of october eighteen ninety four for instance a region as large as europe remained apparently cloud covered yet most recent observers are unable to detect the traces of aqueous absorption in the martian spectrum noted by huggins in eighteen sixty seven and by vogel in eighteen seventy three campbell vainly looked for them visually in eighteen ninety four spectrographically in eighteen ninety six keeler was equally unsuccessful jewell holds that they could with present appliances only be perceived if the atmosphere of mars were much richer in water vapor than that of the earth there can be little doubt however that its supply is about the minimum adequate to the needs of a living and perhaps a life nurturing planet the climate of mars seems to be unexpectedly mild its theoretical mean temperature taking into account both distance from the sun and albedo is thirty four degrees centigrade below freezing yet its polar snows are both less extensive and less permanent than those on the earth the southern white hood noticed by schiaparelli in eighteen seventy seven to have survived the summer only as a small lateral patch melted completely in eighteen ninety four moreover mr w h pickering observed with astonishment the disappearance in the course of thirty-three days of june and july eighteen ninety two of one million six hundred thousand square miles of southern snow curiously enough the initial stage of shrinkage in the white calotte was marked by its division into two unequal parts as if in obedience to the mysterious principle of duplication governing so many martian phenomena changes of the hues associated respectively with land and water accompanied in lower latitudes and were thought to be occasioned by floods ensuing upon this rapid antarctic thaw it is true that scarcity of moisture would account for the scantiness and transitoriness of snowy deposits easily liquefied because thinly spread but we might expect to see the whole wintry hemisphere at any rate frostbound since the sun radiates less than half as much heat on mars as on earth water seems nevertheless to remain as a rule uncongealed everywhere outside the polar regions we are at a loss to imagine by what beneficent arrangement the rigorous conditions naturally to be looked for can be modified into a climate which might be found tolerable by creatures constituted like ourselves martian topography may be said to form nowadays a separate sub-department of descriptive astronomy the amount of detail becomes legible by close scrutiny on a little disk which once in fifteen years attains a maximum of about one five thousandth the area of the full moon must excite surprise and might provoke incredulity spurious discoveries however have little chance of holding their own where there are so many competitors quite as ready to dispute as to confirm the first really good map of mars was constructed in eighteen sixty nine by proctor from drawings by dawes kaiser of leyden followed in eighteen seventy two with a representation founded upon data of his own providing 
in 1862-64, and Turby, in his valuable areography, presented to the Brussels Academy in 1873 a careful discussion of all important observations from the time of Fontana downwards, thus virtually adding to the knowledge by summarizing and digesting it. The memorable opposition of September 5th, 1877, marked a fresh epoch in the study of Mars. While executing a trigonometrical survey, the first attempted, of the disk, then of the unusual size of 25 foot across, G. V. Schiaparelli, director of the Milan Observatory, detected a novel and curious feature. What had been taken from Martian continents were found to be, in point of fact, agglomerations of islands, separated from each other by a network of so-called canals, more properly channels. These are obviously extensions of, quote, seas, originating and terminating in them, and sharing their gray-green hue, but running sometimes to a length of three or four thousand miles in a straight line, and preserving throughout a nearly uniform breadth of about sixty miles. Further inquiries have fully substantiated the discovery made at the Brera Observatory. The canals of Mars are an actually existent and permanent phenomenon. An examination of the drawings in his possession showed M. Turby that they had been seen, though not distinctively recognized, by Dawes, Sesshi, and Holden. Several were independently traced out by Burton at the opposition of 1879. All were recovered by Schiaparelli himself in 1879 and 1881 through 82, and their indefinite multiplication resulted from Lowell's observations in 1894 and 1896. When the planet culminated at midnight, and was therefore in opposition December 26, 1881, its distance was greater, and its apparent diameter less than in 1877, in the proportion of 16 to 25. Its atmosphere was, however, more transparent, and ours of less impediment to northern observers, the object of scrutiny standing considerably higher in the northern skies. Never before, at any rate, had the true aspect of Mars come out so clearly as at Milan, with the eight and three-quarter inch Mertz refractor of the observatory, between December 1881 and February 1882. The canals were all again there, but this time they were, as in many as twenty cases, seen in duplicate. That is to say, a twin canal ran parallel to the original one at an interval of two hundred to four hundred miles. We are here brought face to face with an apparently insoluble enigma. Schiaparelli regards the germination of his canals as a periodical phenomenon depending upon the Martian seasons. It is assuredly not an illusory one, since it was plainly apparent during the opposition of 1886 to Mr. Perrotin and Tholen at Nice, and to the former using the new 30-inch refractor of that observatory in 1888. Mr. A. Stanley Williams, with the help of only a six and a half inch reflector, distinctly perceived in 1890 seven of the duplicate objects noted at Milan, and the Lick observations, both of 1890 and of 1892, together with the drawings made at Flagstaff and Mexico during the last favorable oppositions of the 19th century, brought unequivocal confirmation to the accuracy of Schiaparelli's impressions various conjectures have been hazarded in explanation of this bizarre appearance. The difficulty of conceiving a physical reality corresponding to it has suggested recourse to an optical rationale. Proctor regarded it as an effect of diffraction. Stanislas Munier of oblique reflection from overlying mist banks Flammarion considers it possible that companion canals might, under special circumstances, be evoked by refraction as a kind of mirage. But none of these speculations are really admissible, when all the facts are taken into account. 
the view that the canals of mars are vast rifts due to the cooling of the globe is recommended by the circumstance that they tend to follow great circles nevertheless it would break down if as schiaparelli holds the fluctuations in their divisibility depend upon actual obliterations and re-emergences fantastic though the theory of their artificial origin appear it is held by serious astronomers its vogue is largely due to mr lowell's ingenious advocacy he considers the martian globe to be everywhere intersected by an elaborate system of irrigation works rendered necessary by a perennial water famine relieved periodically by the melting of the polar snows nor does he admit the existence of oceans or lakes what have been taken for such are really tracts covered with vegetation, the bright areas intermixed with them representing sandy deserts. And it is noteworthy in this connection that Professor Barnard obtained in 1894 with the great Lick Refractor suggestive and impressive views, disclosing details of light and shade on the gray-green patches so intricate and minute as almost to preclude the supposition of their aqueous nature. The closeness of the terrestrial analogy has thus of late been much impaired. Even if the surface of Mars be composed of land and water, their distribution must be of a completely original type. The interlacing everywhere of continents with arms of the sea, if that be the correct interpretation of the visual effects, implies that their levels scarcely differ. And Schiaparelli carries most observers with him in holding that their outlines are not absolutely constant, encroachments of dusky upon bright tints suggesting extensive inundations. The late any Green's observations at Madeira in 1877 indicated, on the other hand, a rugged south polar region. The contour of the snow cap not only appeared indented, as if by valleys and promontories, but brilliant points that were discerned outside the white area, attributed to isolated snow peaks. Still more elevated, if similarly explained, must be the ice island first seen in comparatively low latitude by Dawes in January 1865. On August 4, 1892, Mars stood opposite to the sun at a distance of only 34,865,000 miles from the Earth. In point of vicinity, then, its situation was scarcely less favorable than in 1877. The low altitude of the planet, however, practically neutralized this advantage for northern observers and public expectation, which had been raised to the highest pitch by the announcements of sensation mongers, was somewhat disappointed at the meagerness of the news authentically received from Mars. Valuable series of observations were nevertheless made at Lick and Arequipa, and they unite in testifying to the genuine prevalence of surface variability, especially in certain regions of intermediate tint, and perhaps of the crude consistence of boggy sirtes, neither sea nor good dry land. Professor Holden insisted on the enormous difficulties in the way of completely explaining the recorded phenomenon by terrestrial analogies. Mr. W. H. Pickering spoke of conspicuous and startling changes. They, however, merely overlaid and partially disguised a general stability. Among the novelties detected by Mr. Pickering were a number of lakes, or oases, in Lowell's phraseology, under the aspect of black dots at the junction of two or more canals. And he, no less than Lick astronomers and Mr. Perrotin at Nice, observed brilliant clouds projecting beyond the terminator or above the limb while carried round by the planet's rotation. They seemed to float at an altitude of at least 20 miles, or about four times the height of terrestrial cirrus but this was not wonderful, considering the low power of gravity acting upon them. 
great capital was made in the journalistic interest out of these imaginary signals from intelligent martians desirous of opening communications with to them problematical terrestrial beings similar effects had however been seen before by mr knobel in eighteen seventy three and by mr turby in eighteen eighty eight at the lick observatory in eighteen ninety and they were discerned again with particular distinctness by professor husey at lick august twenty seven eighteen ninety six the first photograph of mars was taken by gould at cordoba in eighteen seventy nine little real service in planetary delineation has it is true been so far rendered by the art yet one achievement must be recorded to its credit a set of photographs obtained by mr w h pickering on wilson's peak california april nine eighteen ninety showed the southern polar cap of mars as of moderate dimensions but with a large dim adjacent area twenty-four hours later on a corresponding set the dim area was brilliantly white the polar cap had become enlarged in the interim apparently though a wide spreading snowfall by the annexation of a territory equal to that of the united states the season was towards the close of winter in mars never until then had the process of glacial extension been actually it might be said superintended in that distant globe mars was gratuitously supplied with a pair of satellites long before he was found actually to possess them kepler interpreted galileo's anagram of the triple saturn in this sense they were perceived by micromegas on his long voyage through space and the laputan astronomers had even arrived at a knowledge curiously accurate under the circumstances of their distances and periods but terrestrial observers could see nothing of them until the night of august eleventh eighteen seventy seven the planet was then within one month of its second nearest approach to the earth during the last century and in eighteen forty five the washington twenty six inch refractor was not in existence. Professor Asaph Hall, accordingly, determined to turn the conjecture to account for an exhaustive inquiry into the surroundings of Mars. Keeping his glaring disk just outside the field of view, a minute attendant speck of light was glimpsed August 11. Bad weather, however, intervened, and it was not until the 16th that it was ascertained to be what it appeared, a satellite. On the following evening, a second, still nearer to the primary, was discovered, which, by the bewildering rapidity of its passages hither and thither, produced at first the effect of quite a crowd of little moons. But these delicate objects have since been repeatedly observed, both in Europe and America, even with comparatively small instruments. At the opposition of 1884, indeed, the distance of the planet was too great to permit the detection of both elsewhere than at Washington. But the Lick Equatorial showed them July 18, 1888, when their brightness was only 0 0.12, its amount at the time of their discovery, so that they can now be followed for a considerable time before and after the least favorable oppositions. The names chosen for them were taken from the Iliad, where Deimos and Phobos, fear and panic, are represented as the companions in the battle of Ares. In several respects, they are interesting and remarkable bodies. As to size, they may be said to stand midway between meteorites and satellites. From careful photometric measures, executed at Harvard in 1877 and 1879, Professor Pickering concluded their diameters to be respectively six and seven miles. This is on the assumption that they reflect the same proportion of the light incident upon them that their primary does. But it may very well be that they are less reflective, in which case they will be more extensive. 
the albedo of mars is put by muller at zero point two seven his surface in other words returns twenty seven per cent of the rays striking it if we put the albedo of his satellites equal to that of our moon zero point seventeen their diameters will be increased from six and seven to seven and a half and nine miles phobos the inner one being the larger mr lowell however formed a considerably larger estimate of their dimensions it is interesting to note that deimos according to professor pickering's very distinct perception does not share the reddish tint of mars deimos completes its nearly circular revolutions in thirty hours eighteen minutes at a distance from the surface of its ruling body of twelve thousand five hundred miles phobos traverses an elliptical orbit in seven hours thirty nine minutes twenty two seconds at a distance of only three thousand seven hundred and sixty miles this is the only known instance of a satellite circulating faster than its primary rotates and is a circumstance of some importance as regards theories of planetary development to a martian spectator the curious effect would ensue of a celestial object seemingly exempt from the general motion of the sphere rising in the west setting in the east and culminating twice or even thrice a day which moreover in latitudes above sixty nine degrees north or south would be permanently and altogether hidden by the intervening curvature of the globe End of chapter 8, part 1. Part 2. Chapter 8 of A Popular History of Astronomy During the 19th Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Popular History of Astronomy During the 19th Century by agnes mary clerka chapter eight part two planets and satellites continued part two the detection of new members of the solar system has come to be one of the most ordinary of astronomical events since eighteen forty six no single year has passed without bringing its tribute of asteroidal discovery in the last of the seventies alone a full score of miniature planets were distinguished from the thronging stars amid which they seemed to move. 1875 brought 17 such recognitions. Their number touched a minimum of one in 1881. It rose in 1882 and again in 1886 to 11, dropped to six in 1889, and sprang up with the aid of photography to 27, in 1892. That high level has since on an average been maintained, and on January 1, 1902, nearly 500 asteroids were recognized as revolving between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Of these, considerably more than 100 are claimed by one investigator alone, Dr. Max Wolff of Heidelberg, Monsieur Charlois of nice comes second with 102 while among the earlier observers Pelisa of vienna contributed 86 and c h f peters of clinton new york whose varied and useful career terminated july 19 1890 52 to the grand total the construction by charconat and his successors at paris and more recently by peters at clinton of ecliptical charts showing all stars down to the thirteenth and fourteenth magnitudes respectively rendered the picking out of moving objects above that brightness a mere question of time and diligence both however are vastly economized by the photographic method tedious comparisons of the sky with charts are no longer needed for the identification of unrecorded because simulated stars Planetary bodies declare themselves by appearing upon the plate, not in circular, but in linear form. Their motion converts their images into trails, 
long or short, according to the time of exposure. The first asteroid, number 323, thus detected, was by Max Wolf, December 22, 1891. Eighteen others were similarly discovered in 1892 by the same skillful operator, and ten more through Chalois's adoption at Nice of the novel plan, now in exclusive use for picking up errant light specks. Far more onerous than the task of their discovery is that of keeping them in view once discovered, of tracking out their paths, fixing their places, and calculating the disturbing effects upon them of the mighty Jovian mass. These complex operations have come to be centralized at Berlin, under the superintendence of Professor Tietjen, and their results are given to the public through the medium of the Berliner Astronomisches Jahrbuch. The Cui Bono, however, began to be agitated. Was it worth while to maintain a staff of astronomers for the sole purpose of keeping hold over the identity of the innumerable component particles of a cosmical ring? The prospect, indeed, of all but a select few of the asteroids being thrown back by their contemptuous captors in the sea of space seemed so imminent that Professor Watson provided by will against the dereliction of the twenty-two discovered by himself. But the fortunes of the whole family improved through the distinction obtained by one of them. On August 14, 1898, the trail of a rapidly moving star-like object of the eleventh magnitude imprinted itself on a plate exposed by Herr Witt at the Urania Observatory, Berlin. Its originator proved to be unique among asteroids. Eros is, in sober fact, one of those mysterious stars which hide themselves between the Earth and Mars divine or imagined by shelley true several of its congeners invade the martian sphere at intervals but the proper habitat of eros is within that limit although its excursions transcend it in other words its mean distance from the sun is about one hundred and thirty five as compared with the martian distance of one hundred and forty one million miles further its orbit being so fortunately circumstanced, as to bring it once in sixty-seven years within some fifteen million miles of the earth, it is of extraordinary value to celestial surveyors. The calculation of its movements was much facilitated by detections through a retrospective search of many of its linear images among the star dots on the Harvard plates. The little body which can scarcely be more than twenty miles in diameter, shows peculiarities of behavior as well as of position. Dr. von Oppolzer, in February 1901, announced it to be extensively and rapidly variable. Once in two hours, thirty-eight minutes, it lost about three-fourths of its light, but these fluctuations quickly diminished in range, and in the beginning of May ceased altogether. Evidently, then, they depend upon the situation of the asteroid relatively to ourselves, and so far events lent countenance to Mr. Andre's eclipse hypothesis, since mutual occultations of the supposed planetary twins could only take place when the plane of their revolutions passed through the Earth, and this condition would be transitory. Yet the recognition in Eros of an Algol asteroid seems on other grounds inadmissible, nor until the phenomenon is conspicuously renewed, as it probably will be at the opposition of 1903, can there be much hope of finding its appropriate rationale. The crowd of orbits disclosed by asteroidal detections invites attentive study. De Arrest remarked in 1851, when only thirteen minor planets were known, that supposing their paths to be represented by solid hoops, not one of the thirteen could be lifted from its place without bringing the others with it. The complexity of interwoven tracks, thus illustrated, has grown almost in the numerical proportion of discovery. Yet no two actually intersect, 
because no two lie exactly in the same plane, so that the chances of collision are at present nil. There is only one case indeed which it seems to be eventually possible. Mr. Les Pugh has pointed out that the curves traversed by Fides and Maya approach so closely that a time may arrive when the bodies in question will either coalesce or unite to form a binary system. The maze threaded by the 500 asteroids contrasts singularly with the harmoniously ordered and rhythmically separated orbits of the larger planets, yet the seeming confusion is not without a plan. The established rules of our system are far from being totally disregarded by its minor members. The orbit of Pallas, with its inclination of 34 degrees 42 seconds, touches the limit of departure from the ecliptic level. The average obliquity of the asteroidal paths is somewhat less than that of the sun's equator. Their mean eccentricity is below that of the curve traced out by Mercury, and all without exception are pursued in the planetary direction from west to east. The zone in which these small bodies travel is about three times as wide as the interval separating the Earth from the Sun. It extends perilously near to Jupiter and dovetails into the sphere of Mars. Their distribution is very unequal. They are most densely congregated about the place where a single planet ought, by Bode's law, to revolve. It may indeed be said that only stragglers from the main body are found more than 50 million miles within or without a mean distance from the sun, 2.8 times that of the earth. Significant gaps, too, occur where some force prohibitive of their presence would seem to be at work. The probable nature of that force was suggested by the late Professor Kirkwood, first in 1866, when the number of known asteroids was only 88, and again with more confidence in 1876 from the study of a list then run up to 172. It appears that these bare spaces are found just where a revolving body would have a period, connected by a simple relation with that of Jupiter. It would perform two or three circuits to his one, five to his two, nine to his five, and so on. Kirkwood's inference was that the gaps in question were cleared of asteroids by the attractive influence of Jupiter. For disturbances recurring time after time, owing to commensurability of periods, nearly at the same part of the orbit, would have accumulated until the shape of that orbit was notably changed. The body thus displaced would have come in contact with other cosmical particles of the same family with itself. Then, it may be assumed, more evenly scattered than now, would have coalesced with them and permanently left its original track. In this way, the regions of maximum perturbation would gradually have become denuded of their occupants. We can scarcely doubt that this law of commensurability has largely influenced the present distribution of the asteroids, but its effects must have been produced while they were still in an unformed, perhaps a nebular condition. In a system giving room for considerable modification through disturbance, the recurrence of conjunctions with a dominating mass at the same orbital point need not involve instability. On the whole, the correspondence of facts with Kirkwood's hypothesis has not been impaired by their more copious collection. Some chasms of secondary importance have indeed been bridged, but the principal stand out more conspicuously through the denser scattering of orbits near their margins. Nor is it doubtful that the influence of Jupiter in some way produced them. Mr. Dufresne's study of the problem they present has, however, led him to the conclusion that they existed ab origine, thus testifying rather to the preventative than to the perturbing power of the giant planet. The existence, too, of numerous asteroidal pairs traveling in approximately coincident tracks must date from a remote antiquity. They result, Professor Kirkwood believed, from the divellent action of Jupiter upon embryo pygmy planets. J. 
just as comets moving in pursuit of one another are a consequence of the sundering influence of the sun. Le Verrier fixed in 1853 one-fourth of the Earth's mass as the outside limit for the combined masses of all the bodies circulating between Mars and Jupiter, but it is far from probable that this maximum is at all nearly approached. Mr. Berberich held that the moon would more than outweigh the whole of them, a million of the lesser bodies shining like stars of the twelfth magnitude being needed, according to his judgment, to constitute her mass. And Mr. Neeston estimated that the whole of the 216 asteroids discovered up to August 1880 amounted in volume to only one four thousandth of our globe, and we may safely add since they are tolerably certain to be lighter, bulk for bulk, than the Earth, that their proportionate mass is smaller still. A fairly concordant result was published in 1895 by Mr. B. M. Rosell. He found that the lunar globe probably contains 40 times the terrestrial globe, 3,240 times the quantity of matter parceled out among the first 311 minor planets. The actual size of a few of them may now be said to be known. Professor Pickering, from determinations of light intensity, assigned to Vesta a diameter of 319 miles, to Pallas 167, to Juno 94, down to 12 and 14 for the smaller members of the group. An albedo equal to that of Mars was assumed as the basis of the calculation. Moreover, Professor G. Miller of Potsdam examined photometrically the phases of seven among them, of which four, namely Vesta, Iris, Messalia, and Amphitrite, were found to conform precisely to the behavior of Mars as regards light change from position, while Ceres, Pallas, and Irene varied after the manner of the Moon and Mercury. The first group were hence inferred to resemble Mars in physical constitution, nature of atmosphere and reflective capacity, the second to be moon-like bodies. Finally, Professor Barnard, directly measuring with the Yerkes refractor the minute disks presented by the original quartet, obtained the following authentic data concerning them. Diameter of Ceres, 477 miles, albedo 0 0.18, Diameter of Pallas, 304 miles, albedo, 0 0.23. Diameter of Vesta, 239 miles, albedo, 0 0.74. Diameter of Juno, 120 miles, albedo, 0 0.45. Thus, the rank of premier asteroid proves to belong to Ceres, and to have been erroneously assigned to Vesta in consequence of its deceptive brilliancy. What kind of surface this indicates is hard to say. The dazzling whiteness of snow can hardly be attributed to bare rock. Yet the dynamical theory of gases, as Dr. John Stone Stoney pointed out in 1867, prohibits the supposition that bodies of insignificant gravitative power can possess aerial envelopes. Even our moon, it is calculated, could not permanently hold back the particles of oxygen, nitrogen, or water gas from escaping into infinite space, still less a globe of 1,000 times smaller. Vogel's suspicion of an airline in the spectrum of Vesta has accordingly not been confirmed. Crossing the zone of asteroids on our journey outward from the Sun, we meet with a group of bodies widely different from the inferior or terrestrial planets. Their gigantic size, low specific gravity, and rapid rotation, obviously from the first, threw the superior planets into a class apart, and modern research has added qualities still more significant of a dissimilar physical constitution. Jupiter, a huge globe 86,000 miles in diameter, stands preeminent among them. He is, however, only primus into Paris. All the wider inferences regarding his condition may be extended, with little risk of error, to his fellows, 
and inferences in this case rest on surer grounds than in the case of the others from the advantages offered for telescopic scrutiny by his comparative nearness now the characteristic modern discovery concerning jupiter is that he is a body midway between the solar and terrestrial stages of cosmical existence a decaying sun or a developing earth as we choose to put it whose vast unexpended stores of internal heat are mainly if not solely efficient in producing the interior agitations betrayed by the changing features of his visible disk this view impressed upon modern readers by mr proctor's popular works was anticipated in the last century buffo wrote in his epoch de la nature seventeen seventy eight la surface de jupiter est comme l'on sait sujet au des changements sensibles que semblant du quai que cette grosse planète est encore dans on est ta inconstance et tout primitive incandescence attendant in his fantastic view on planetary origin by cometary impacts with the sun combined he concluded with vast bulk to bring about this result jupiter has not yet had time to cool kant thought similarly in seventeen eighty five but the idea did not commend itself to the astronomers of the time and dropped out of sight until mr nasmith arrived at it fresh in eighteen fifty three even still however terrestrial analogies held their ground the dark belts running parallel to the equator first seen at naples in sixteen thirty continued to be associated as herschel had associated them in seventeen eighty one with jovian trade winds in raising which the deficient power of the sun was supposed to be compensated by added swiftness of rotation but opinion was not permitted to halt there in eighteen sixty g p bond of cambridge in the u s derived some remarkable indications from experiments on the light of jupiter they showed that fourteen times more of the photographic rays striking it are reflected by the planet than by our moon and that unlike the moon which sends its densest rays from the margin jupiter is brightest near the centre but the most perplexing part of his results was that jupiter actually seemed to give out more light than he received bond however rightly considered his data too uncertain for the support of so bold an assumption as that of original luminosity and even if the presence of native light were proved thought that it might emanate from oral clouds of the terrestrial kind the conception of a sun-like planet was still a remote and seemed an extravagant one only since it was adopted and enforced by zollner in 1865 can it be regarded as permanently acquired to science the rapid changes in the cloud belts both of jupiter and saturn he remarked attest a high internal temperature for we know that all atmospheric movements on the earth are sun heat transformed into motion but sun heat at the distance of jupiter possesses but one twenty seventh at that of saturn one one hundredth of its force here the large amount of energy then obviously exerted in those remote firmaments must have some other source to be found nowhere else than in their own active and all-pervading fires not yet banked in with a thick solid crust the same acute investigator dwelt in 1871 on the similarity between the modes of rotation of the great planets and of the sun applying the same principles of explanation to each case the fact of this similarity is undoubted cassini and schroter both noticed that markings on jupiter travelled quicker the nearer they were to his equator and cassini even hinted at their possible assimilation to sun-spots it is now well ascertained that as a rule not without exception equatorial spots give a period some five and a half minutes shorter than those in latitudes of about thirty degrees but as mr denning has pointed out no single period will satisfy the observations either of different markings at the same epoch 
or of the same markings at different epochs. Accelerations and retardations, depending upon processes of growth or change, take place in very much the same kind of way as in solar maculae, inevitably suggesting similarity of origin. The interesting query as to Jupiter's surface incandescence has been studied since Bond's time, with the aid of all the appliances furnished to physical inquirers by modern inventiveness, yet without bringing to it a categorical reply. Zollner in 1865, Merler in 1893, estimated his albedo at 0.62 and 0.75 respectively, that of fresh fallen snow being 0.78 and of white paper 0.70. But the disk of Jupiter is by no means purely white. The general ground is tinged with ochre. The polar zones are leaden or fawn-colored. Large spaces are at times stained or suffused with chocolate browns and rosy hues. It is occasionally seen ruled from pole to pole with dusky bars, and is never wholly free from obscure markings. The reflection, then by it, as a whole, of about 70% of the rays impinging upon it, might well suggest some original reinforcement. Nevertheless, the spectroscope gives little countenance to the supposition of any considerable permanent light emission. The spectrum of Jupiter, as examined by Huggins, 1862-64, and by Vogel, 1871-73, shows the familiar Freundhofer rays belonging to reflected sunlight, but it also shows lines of native absorption. Some of these are identical with those produced by the action of our own atmosphere, especially one or more groups due to aqueous vapors. Others are of unknown origin and it is remarkable that one among the latter, a strong band in the red, agrees in position with the dark line in the spectra of some ruddy stars. There is, besides, a general absorption of blue rays intensified, as Le Soya observed at Melbourne in 1869, in the dusky markings, evidently through an increase of depth in the atmospheric strata, traversed by the light proceeding from them. All these observations, however, setting aside the stellar line as of doubtful significance, point to a cool planetary atmosphere. One spectrograph, it is true, taken by Dr. Henry Draper, September 27, 1879, seemed to attest the action of intrinsic light. But the peculiarity was referred by Dr. Vogel with convincing clearness to a flaw in the film. So far, then, native emissions from any part of Jupiter's diversified surface have not been detected, and indeed the blackness of the shadows cast by his satellites on his disk sufficiently proves that he sends out virtually none but reflected light. This conclusion, however, by no means invalidates that of his high internal temperature. End of chapter 8, part 2《Chapter Eight of a Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clerke Part Two, Chapter Eight, Planets and Satellites, Continued, Part Three. The curious phenomena attending Jovian satellite transits may be explained partly as effects of contrast, partly as due to temporary obscurations of the small disks projected on the large disk of Jupiter. At their first entry upon its marginal parts, which are several times less luminous than those near the center, they invariably show as bright spots then usually vanish as the background gains luster, to reappear, after crossing the disk, thrown into relief, as before, against the dusky limb. But instances 
are not rare, more especially of the third and fourth satellites, standing out during the entire middle part of their course, in such inky darkness as to be mistaken for their own shadows. The earliest witness of a black transit was Cassini, September 2nd, 1665. Rumor in 1677 and Miraldi in 1707 and 1713 made similar observations which have been multiplied in recent years. In some cases, the process of darkening has been visibly attended by the formation or emergence into view of spots on the transiting body, as noted by the two bonds at Harvard, March 18, 1848. The third satellite was seen by Dawes, half dark, half bright, when crossing Jupiter's disk, August 21, 1867. One third dark, by Davidson of California, January 15, 1884, under the same circumstances, and unmistakably spotted, both on and off the planet, by Schroeter, Seshi, Dawes, and Lassell. The first satellite sometimes looks dusky, but never absolutely black, in traveling over the disk of Jupiter. The second appears uniformly white, a circumstance attributed by Dr. Spitta to its high albedo. The singularly different aspects, even during successive transits, of the third and fourth satellites are connected by Professor Holden with the varied luminosity of the segments of the planetary surface they are projected upon, and W. H. Pickering inclines to the same opinion. But fluctuations in their own brightness may be a concurrent cause. Herschel concluded in 1797 that, like our moon, they always turn the same face towards their primary, and as regards the outer satellite, Engelmann's researches in 1871 and C. E. Burton's in 1873 made this almost certain, while both for the third and fourth Jovian moons it was completely assured by W. H. Pickering's and A. E. Douglas's observations at Arequipa in 1892 and at Flagstaff in 1894 through 95. Strangely enough, however, the interior members of the system have preserved a relatively swift rotation, notwithstanding the enormous checking influence upon it of Jovi raised tides. All the satellites are stated, on good authority, to be more or less egg shaped. On September 8, 1890, Barnard saw the first elongated and bisected by a bright equatorial belt during one of its dark transits, and his observation, repeated August 3, 1891, was completely verified by Shaberl and Campbell, who ascertained, moreover, that the longer axis of the prolate body was directed towards Jupiter's center. The ellipticity of its companions was determined by Pickering and Douglas. Indeed, that of number three had long previously been noticed by Seshi. Number three also shows equatorial stripes, perceived in 1891 by Shaberl and Campbell, and evident later to Pickering and Douglas. Nor need we hesitate to admit as authentic their records of similar, though less conspicuous markings on the other satellites. A constitution analogous to that of Jupiter himself was thus unexpectedly suggested, and Vogel's detection of lines or traces of lines in their spectra, agreeing with the absorption rays derived from their primary, lend support to the conjecture that they possess gaseous envelopes similar to his. The system of Jupiter, as it was discovered by Galileo and investigated by Laplace, appeared in its outward aspect so symmetrical and displayed in its inner mechanism such harmonious dynamical relations that it might well have been deemed complete. Nevertheless, a new member has been added to it. Near midnight on September 9, 1892, Professor Barnard discerned with the Lick 36-inch a tiny speck of light, closely following the planet. He instantly divined its nature, watched its hurried disappearance in the adjacent glare, and made sure of the reality of his discovery 
on the ensuing night. It was a delicate business throughout, the Lilliputian luminary subsiding into invisibility before the slightest glint of Jovian light and tarrying, only for brief intervals, far enough from the disk to admit of its exclusion by means of an occulting plate. And the new satellite is estimated to be of the thirteenth stellar magnitude, and, if equally reflective of light with its next neighbor, Io, satellite number one, its diameter must be about one hundred miles. It revolves at a distance of 112,500 miles from Jupiter's center, and of 68,000 from his bulging equatorial surface. Its period of 11 hours, 57 minutes, 23 seconds, is just two hours longer than Jupiter's period of rotation, so that Phobos still remains a unique example of a secondary body revolving faster than its primary rotates. Jupiter's innermost moon conforms in its motions strictly, indeed inevitably, to the plane of his equatorial perturbance, following, however, a sensibly elliptical path, the major axis of which is in rapid revolution. Its very insignificance raises the suspicion that it may not prove solitary. Possibly it belongs to a zone peopled by asteroidal satellites. More than 15,000 such small bodies could be furnished out of the materials of a single full-sized satellite spoiled in the making. But we must be content for the present to register the fact without seeking to penetrate the meaning of its existence. Very high and very fine telescopic power is needed for its perception. Outside the United States it has been very little observed. The only instruments in this country successfully employed for its detection are, we believe, Dr. Common's five-foot reflector and Mr. Newell's 25-inch refractor. In the course of his observations on Jupiter at Brussels in 1878, Mr. Neeson was struck with a rosy cloud attached to a whitish zone beneath the dark southern equatorial band. Its size was enormous. At the distance of Jupiter, its measured dimensions of 13 minutes by 3 minutes implied a real extension in longitude of 30,000, in latitude of something short of 7,000 miles. The earliest record of its appearance seems to be by Professor Pritchett, director of the Morrison Observatory in the U.S., who figured and described it July 9, 1878. It was again delineated August 9 by Tempel in Florence. In the following year, it attracted the wonder and attention of almost every possessor of a telescope. Its color had by that time deepened into a full brick red, and was set off by contrast with a white equatorial spot of unusual brilliancy. During three ensuing years, these remarkable objects continued to offer a visible and striking illustration of the compound nature of the planet's rotation. The red spot completed a circuit in 9 hours, 55 minutes, 36 seconds, the white spot in about 5 and a half minutes less. The relative motion was thus no less than 260 miles an hour, bringing them together in the same meridian at intervals of 44 days, 10 hours, 42 minutes. Neither, however, preserved continuously the same uniform rate of travel. The period of each had lengthened by some seconds in 1883, while sudden displacements, associated with the recovery of luster after recurrent fadings, were observed in the position of the white spot recalling the leap forward of the reviving sun spot. Just the opposite effect attended the rekindling of the companion object, while semi-extinct in 1882 through 84, it lost little motion, but a fresh axis of retardation was observed by Professor Young in connection with its brightening in 1886. This suggests very strongly that the red spot is fed from below. A shining aureola of faculae described by Bredichin at Moscow 
and by Losa at Potsdam as encircling it in September 1879 was held to strengthen the solar analogy. The conspicuous visibility of this astonishing object lasted three years. When the planet returned to opposition in 1882 through 83, it had faded so considerably that Rico's uncertain glimpse of it at Palermo, May 31, 1883, was expected to be the last. It had, nevertheless, begun to recover in December, and presented to Mr. Denning in the beginning of 1886 much the same aspect as in October 1882. Observed by him in an intermediate stage, February 25, 1885, when a mere skeleton of its former self, it bore a striking likeness to an elliptical ring, descried in the same latitude by Mr. Gledhill in 1869-70. through 70. This indeed might be called the preliminary sketch for the famous object brought to perfection ten years later, but which Mr. H. C. Russell of Sydney saw and drew, still unfinished, in June 1876 before it had separated from its matrix, the dusky south tropical belt. In earlier times, too, a marking, at once fixed and transient, had been repeatedly perceived attached to the southernmost of the central belts. It gave Cassini, in 1665, a rotation period of 9 hours 56 minutes, reappeared and vanished eight times during the next 43 years, and was last seen by Maraldi in 1713. It was, however, very much smaller than the recent object, and showed no unusual color. The assiduous observations made on the Great Red Spot by Mr. Denning at Bristol and by Professor Howe at Chicago afforded grounds only for negative conclusions as to its nature. It certainly did not represent the outpourings of a Jovian volcano, it was in no sense attached to the jovian soil if the phrase have any application to that planet it was not a mere disclosure of a glowing mass elsewhere seethed over by rolling vapours it was indeed certainly not self-luminous a satellite projected upon it in transit having been seen to show as bright as upon the dusky equatorial bands a fundamental objection to all three hypotheses is that the rotation of the spot was variable. It did not then ride at anchor, but floated free. Some held that its surface was depressed below the average cloud level, and that the cavity was filled with vapors. Professor Wilson, on the other hand, observing with the 16-inch equatorial of the Goodsell Observatory in Minnesota, received a persistent impression of the object being at a higher level than the other markings. A crucial experiment on this point was proposed by Mr. Stanley Williams in 1890. A dark spot moving faster along the same parallel was timed to overtake the red spot towards the end of July. A unique opportunity hence appeared to be at hand of determining the relative vertical depths of the two formations, one of which must inevitably, it was thought, pass above the other. No forecast included a third alternative, which was nevertheless adopted by the dark spot. It evaded the obstacle in its path by skirting round its southern edge. Nothing, then, was gained by the conjunction beyond an additional proof of the singular repellent influence exerted by the red spot over the markings in its vicinity. It has, for example, gradually carved out a deep bay for its accommodation in the gray belt just north of it. The effect was not at first steadily present. A premonitory excavation was drawn by Schwab and Dessau, September 5, 1831, and again by Truvelo, Bernard, and Elvins in 1879. Yet there was no sign of it in the following year. Its development can be traced in Dr. Burdick's beautiful delineations of Jupiter made with a Parsonstown three-foot reflector from 1881 to 1886. 
They record the belt as straight in 1881, but as strongly indented from January 1883, and the cavity now promises to outlast the spot. So long as it survives, however, the forces at work in the spot can have lost little of their activity, for it must be remembered that the belt has a shorter rotation period than the red spot, which accordingly, as Mr. Elvins of Toronto has pointed out, breasts and diverts by its interior energy a current of flowing matter ever ready to fill up its natural bed and override the barrier of obstruction. The famous spot was described by Keeler in 1889 as of a pale pink color, slightly lighter in the middle. Its outline was a fairly true ellipse, framed in by bright white clouds. The fading continuously in progress from 1887 was temporarily interrupted in 1891. The revival, indeed, was brief. Professor Barnard wrote in August 1892, the great red spot is still visible, but it has just passed through a crisis that seemingly threatened its very existence. For the past month, it has been all but impossible to catch the feeblest trace of the spot, though the ever-persistent bay in the equatorial belt close north of it, and which has been so intimately connected with the history of the red spot, has been as conspicuous as ever. It is now, however, possible to detect traces of the entire spot. An obscuring medium seems to have been passing over it, and has now drifted somewhat preceding the spot. The object is now always inconspicuous, and often practically invisible, and may be said to float passively in the environing medium. Yet there are sparks beneath the ashes. A rosy tinge faintly suffused it, in April 1900, and its absolute end may still be remote. The extreme complexity of the planet's surface movements has been strikingly evinced by Stanley Williams' detailed investigations. He enumerated in 1896 nine principal currents, all flowing parallel to the equator, but unsymmetrically placed north and south of it and showing scant signs of conformity to the solar rule of retardation with increase of latitude. The linear rate of the planet's equatorial rotation was spectroscopically determined by Belopolsky and de Lissandres in 1895. Both found it to fall short of the calculated speed, whence an enlargement by self-refraction of the apparent disk was inferred. Jupiter was systematically photographed with the Lick 36-inch telescope during the oppositions of 1890, 1891, and 1892. The image thrown on the plates, after eight-fold direct enlargement, being one inch diameter. Mr. Stanley Williams' measurements and discussions of the set for 1891 showed the high value of the materials thus collected although much more minute details can be seen than can at present be photographed. The red spot shows as very distinctly annular in several of these pictures. Recently, the planet has been portrayed by Delessandres with the 62-foot Newton refractor. The extreme actinic feebleness of the equatorial bands was strikingly apparent on his plates. In 1870, Mr. Reynard, whose death... December 14, 1894, was a serious loss to astronomy, acting upon an earlier suggestion of Sir William Huggins, collected records of unusual appearances on the disk of Jupiter, with a view to investigate the question of their recurrence at regular intervals. He concluded that the development of the deeper tinges of color and of the equatorial porthole markings, girdling the globe in regular alternations of bright and dusky, agreed, so far as could be ascertained, with epochs of sunspot maximum. The further inquiries of Dr. Losa at Bothkamp in 1873 went to strengthen the coincidence, which had been anticipated a priori by Zollner in 1871. Moreover, 
separate and distinct evidence was alleged by mr denning in eighteen ninety nine of decennial outbreaks of disturbance in north temperate regions it may indeed be taken for granted that what hahn terms the universal pulse of the solar system affects the vicissitudes of jupiter but the law of those vicissitudes is far from being so obviously subordinate to the rhythmical flow of central disturbance as are certain terrestrial phenomena the great planet being in fact himself a semi-sun may be regarded as an originator no less than a recipient of agitating influences the combined effects of which may well appear insubordinate to any obvious laws it is likely that saturn is in a still earlier stage of planetary development than jupiter he is the lightest for his size of all the planets in fact he would float in water and since his density is shown by the amount of his equatorial bulging to increase centrally it follows that his superficial materials must be of a specific gravity so low as to be inconsistent on any probable supposition with the solid or liquid states moreover the chief arguments in favor of the high temperature of jupiter apply with increased force to saturn so that it may be concluded without much risk of error that a large proportion of his bulky globe seventy three thousand miles in diameter is composed of heated vapors kept in active and agitated circulation by the process of cooling his unique set of appendages has since the middle of the last century formed the subject of searching and fruitful inquiries both theoretical and telescopic the mechanical problem of the stability of saturn's rings was left by laplace in a very unsatisfactory condition considering them as rotating solid bodies he pointed out that they could not maintain their position unless their weight were in some way unsymmetrically distributed but made no attempt to determine the kind or amount of irregularity needed to secure this end some observations by herschel gave astronomers an excuse for taking for granted the fulfilment of the condition thus vaguely postulated and the question remained in abeyance until once more brought prominently forward by the discovery of the dusky ring in eighteen fifty the younger bond led the way among modern observers in denying the solidity of the structure the fluctuations in its aspect were he asserted in eighteen fifty one inconsistent with such a hypothesis the fine dark lines of division frequently detected in both bright rings and as frequently relapsing into imperceptibility were due in his opinion to the real nobility of the particles and indicated a fluid formation professor benjamin pierce of harvard university immediately followed with a demonstration on abstract grounds of their non-solidity streams of some fluid denser than water were he maintained the physical reality giving rise to the anomalous appearance first disclosed by galileo's telescope the mechanism of saturn's rings proposed as the subject of the adams prize was dealt with by james clerk maxwell in eighteen fifty seven his investigation forms the groundwork of all that is at present known in the matter its upshot was to show that neither solid nor fluid rings could continue to exist and that the only possible composition of the system was by an aggregated multitude of unconnected particles each revolving independently in a period corresponding to its distance from the planet the idea of a satellite formation had been remarkably enough several times entertained and lost sight of it was first put forward by roberville in the seventeenth century and again by jacques cassini in 1715 and with perfect definiteness by wright of durham in 1750 little heed however was taken of these casual anticipations of a truth which reappeared a virtual novelty 
as the legitimate outcome of the most refined modern methods. The details of telescopic observation accord on the whole admirably with this hypothesis. The displacements or disappearance of secondary dividing lines, the singular striated appearance first remarked by Short in the 18th century, last by Perrotin and Lockyer at Nice, March 18, 1884, show the effects of waves of disturbance traversing a moving mass of gravitating particles. The broken and changing line of the planet's shadow on the ring gives evidence of variety in the planes of the orbits described by those particles. The whole ring system, too, appears to be somewhat elliptical. End of chapter 8, part 3《Chapter Eight of a Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clerke. Part Two, Chapter Eight Planets and Satellites Continued, Part Four. The satellite theory has derived unlooked-for support from photometric inquiries. Professor Seligler pointed out in 1888 that the unvarying brilliancy of the outer rings under all angles of illumination from zero degrees to thirty degrees can be explained from no other point of view. Nor does the constitution of the obscure inner ring offer any difficulty for it is doubtless formed of similar small bodies to those aggregated in the lucid members of the system, only much more thinly strewn, and reflecting consequently much less light. It is not, indeed, at first easy to see why these sparser flights should show as a dense dark shading on the body of Saturn, yet this is invariably the case. The objection has been urged by Professor Hastings of Baltimore. The brightest parts of these appendages, he remarked, are more lustrous than the globe they encircle. But if the inner ring consists of identical materials, possessing, presumably, an equal reflective capacity, the mere fact of their scanty distribution would not cause them to show as dark against the same globe. Professor Ziegler, however, replied that the darkening is due to the never-ending swarms of their separate shadows transiting the planet's disk. Sunlight is not, indeed, wholly excluded. Many rays come and go between the open ranks of the meteorites, for the dusky ring is transparent. The planet it encloses shows through it, as if veiled with a strip of crepe, a beautiful illustration of its quality in this respect was derived by Professor Barnard from an eclipse of Japetus, November 1, 1889. The eighth moon remained steadily visible during its passage through the shadow of the inner ring, but with a progressive loss of luster in approaching its bright neighbor. There was no breach of continuity. The satellite met no gap corresponding to that between the dusky ring and the body of Saturn, through which it could shine with undiminished light, but was slowly lost sight of as it plunged into deeper and deeper gloom. The important facts were thus established, that the brilliant and obscure rings merge into each other, and that the latter thins out towards the Saturnian globe. The meteoric constitution of these appendages was beautifully demonstrated in 1895 by Professor Keeler, then director of the Allegheny Observatory, Pittsburgh. From spectrographs taken with the slit adjusted to coincidence with the equatorial plane of the system, he determined the comparative radial velocities of its different parts, and these supply a crucial test of Clerk Maxwell's theory. For if the rings were solid, the swiftest rates of rotation should be at their outer edges, corresponding to wider circles described in the same period. While, if they are pulverulent, the inverse relation must hold good. 
This proved to be actually the case. The motion slowed off outward in agreement with a diminishing speed of particles traveling freely, each in its own orbit. Keeler's result was promptly confirmed by Campbell, as well as by Delisandres and Bilopolsky. A question of singular interest, and one which cannot refrain from putting to ourselves, is whether we see in the rings of Saturn a finished structure, destined to play a permanent part in the economy of the system, or whether they represent merely a stage in the process of development out of the chaotic state, in which it is impossible to doubt that the materials of all planets were originally merged. Mr. Otto Struver attempted to give a definite answer to this important query. A study of earlier and later records of observations disclosed to him, in 1851, an apparent progressive approach of the inner edge of the bright ring to the planet. The rate of approach he estimated at about 57 English miles a year, or 11,000 miles during the 194 years elapsed since the time of Huygens. Were it to continue, a collapse of the system must be far advanced within three centuries. But was the change real or illusory? A plausible but deceptive inference from insecure data. Mr. Struve resolved to put it to the test. A set of elaborately careful micrometrical measures of the dimensions of Saturn's rings executed by himself at Polkova in autumn of 1851 was provided as a standard of future comparison, and he was enabled to renew them under closely similar circumstances in 1882. But the expected diminution of the space between Saturn's globe and his rings had not taken place. A slight extension in the width of the system, both outward and inward, was indeed hinted at, and it is worth notice that just such a separation of the rings was indicated by Clerk Maxwell's theory, so that there is an a priori likelihood of its being in progress. Yet Hall's measures in 1884 through 1887 failed to supply evidence of alteration with time and Barnard's, executed at Lick in 1894 through 1895, showed no sensible divergence from them. Hence, much weight cannot be laid upon Huygens's drawings and descriptions, which had been held to prove conclusively a partial filling up since 1657 of the interval between the ring and the planet. The rings of Saturn replace, in Professor G. H. Darwin's view, an abortive satellite, scattered by tidal action into annular form, for they lie closer to the planet than is consistent with the integrity of a revolving body of reasonable bulk. The limit of possible existence for such a mass was fixed by Rocha of Montpelier in 1848, at 2.44 mean radii of its primary, while the outer edge of the ring system is distant 2.38 radii of Saturn from his center. The virtual discovery of its pulverulent condition dates then, according to Professor Darwin, from 1848. He conjectures that the appendage will eventually disappear, partly through the dispersal of its constituent particles inward, and their subsidence upon the planet's surface, partly by their dispersal outward to a region beyond Roach's limit, where coalescence might proceed unhindered by the strain of unequal attractions. One modest satellite revolving inside Mimas would then be all that was left of the singular appurtenances we now contemplate with admiration. There seems reason to admit that Kirkwood's law of commensurability has had some effect in bringing about the present distribution of the matter composing them, here the influential bodies are Saturn's moons, while the divisions and boundaries of the rings represent the spaces where their disturbing action conspires to eliminate revolving particles. Kirkwood, in fact, showed in 1867 that a body circulating in the chasm between the bright rings, known as Cassini's division, would have a period nearly commensurable with those of four out of the eight moons 
and Meyer of Geneva subsequently calculated all such combinations, with the result of bringing out coincidences between regions of maximum perturbation and the limiting and dividing lines of the system. This is in itself a strong confirmation of the view that the rings are made up of independently revolving small bodies. On December 7, 1876, Professor Asaf Hall discovered at Washington a bright equatorial spot on Saturn, which he followed and measured through above 60 rotations, each performed in 10 hours, 14 minutes, 24 seconds. This, he was careful to add, represented the period not necessarily of the planet, but only of the individual spot. The only previous determination of Saturn's axial movement, setting aside some insecure estimates by Schroeder, was Herschel's in 1794, giving a period of 10 hours, 16 minutes. The substantial accuracy of Hall's result was verified by Mr. Denning in 1891. In May and June of that year, 10 vague bright markings near the equator were watched by Mr. Stanley Williams, who derived from them a rotation period only two seconds shorter than that determined at Washington. Nevertheless, similarly placed spots gave in 1892 and 1893 notably quicker rates, so that the task of timing the general drift of the Saturnian surface by the displacements of such objects is hampered to an indefinite extent by their individual proper motions. Saturn's outermost satellite, Japetus, is markedly variable, so variable that it sends us, when brightest, just four and a half times as much light as when faintest. Moreover, its fluctuations depend upon its orbital position in such a way as to make it a conspicuous telescopic object when west, a scarcely discernible one when east of the planet. Herschel's inference of a partially obscured globe turning always the same face towards its primary seems the only admissible one and is confirmed by Pickering's measurements of the varying intensity of its light. He remarked further that the dusky and brilliant hemispheres must be so posited as to divide the disk viewed from Saturn into nearly equal parts, so that this Saturnian moon, even when full, appears very imperfectly illuminated over one half of its surface. Zollner estimated the albedo of Saturn at 0 0.51, Müller at 0.88, a value impossibly high, considering that the spectrum includes no vestige of original emissions. Closely similar to that of Jupiter, it shows the distinctive dark line in the red, wavelength 618, which we may call the red star line. And Janssen, from the summit of Etna in 1867, found traces in it of aqueous absorption. The light from the ring appears to be pure reflected sunshine, unmodified by original atmospheric action. Uranus, when favorably situated, can easily be seen with the naked eye as a star between the fifth and sixth magnitudes. There is indeed some reason to suppose that he had been detected as a wandering orb by savage watchers of the skies in the Pacific long before he swam into Herschel's ken. Nevertheless, inquiries into his physical habitudes are still in an early stage. They are exceedingly difficult of execution, even with the best and largest modern telescopes, and their results remain clouded with uncertainty. It will be remembered that Uranus presents the unusual spectacle of a system of satellites traveling nearly at right angles to the plane of the ecliptic. The existence of this anomaly gives a special interest to investigations of his axial movement, which might be presumed, from the analogy of the other planets, to be executed in the same tilted plane. Yet this is far from being certainly the case. Mr. Buffum in 1870 through 1872 caught traces of bright markings on the Uranian disk, doubtfully suggesting a rotation in about twelve hours in a plane not coincident with that in which his satellites circulate. Dusky bands resembling those of Jupiter, 
but very faint, were barely perceptible to Professor Young at Princeton in 1883, yet though almost necessarily inferred to be equatorial, they made a considerable angle with the trend of the satellite's orbits. More distinctly by the brothers Henry, with the aid of their fine refractor, two gray parallel rulings separated by a brilliant zone were discerned, every clear night at Paris from January to June, 1884. What were taken to be the polar regions appeared comparatively dusky. The direction of the equatorial rulings, for so we may safely call them, made an angle of 40 degrees with the satellite's line of travel. Similar observations were made at Nice by Messrs. Perrotin and Tholen, March to June, 1884 a lucid spot near the equator in addition indicating rotation in a period of about ten hours the discrepancy was however considerably reduced by perrotin's study of the planet in eighteen eighty nine with the new thirty inch equatorial the dark bands thus viewed to better advantage than in eighteen eighty four appeared to deviate no more than ten per cent from the satellite's orbit plane no definitive results, on the other hand, were derived by Professors Holden, Schaeberl, and Keeler from their observations of Uranus in 1889 through 1890, with the potent instrument on Mount Hamilton. Shadings, it is true, were almost always, though faintly seen, but they appeared under an anomalous, possibly an illusory aspect. They consisted not of parallel, but of forked bands. Measurements of the little sea-green disk, which represents to us the massive bulk of Uranus, by Young, Schiaparelli, Safarik, H. C. Wilson, and Perrotin, prove it to be quite distinctly bulged. The compression at once caught Barnard's trained eye in 1894, when he undertook at Lick a micrometrical investigation of the system, and he was surprised to perceive that the major axis of the elliptical surface made an angle of about 28 degrees with the line of travel pursued by the satellites. Nothing more can be learned on this curious subject for some years, since the pole of the planet is now just turned nearly towards the Earth, but Barnard's conclusion is unlikely to be seriously modified. He fixed the mean diameter of Uranus at 34,900 miles but this estimate was materially reduced through dr c s elimination of irradiative effects by means of daylight measures executed at washington in nineteen o one the visual spectrum of this planet was first examined by father sesci in eighteen sixty nine and later with more advantages for accuracy by huggins vogel and keeler it is a very remarkable one in lieu of the reflected Freundhofer lines, imperceptible, perhaps through feebleness of light, six broad bands of original absorption appear, one corresponding to the blue-green ray of hydrogen, another to be red star line of Jupiter and Saturn, the rest as yet unidentified. The hydrogen band seems much too strong and diffuse to be the mere echo of a solar line and might accordingly be held to imply the presence of free hydrogen in the Iranian atmosphere. This, however, would be difficult of reconcilement with Keeler's identification of an absorption group in the yellow with telluric water band. Notwithstanding its high albedo, 0 0.62, according to Zollner, proof is wanting that any of the light of Uranus is inherent. Mr. Albert Taylor announced, indeed, in 1889, his detection, with Cummins' giant reflector, of bright flutings in its spectrum. But Professor Keeler's examination proved them to be merely contrast effects. Sir William and Lady Huggins, moreover, obtained about the same time a photograph purely solar in character, the spectrum it represented was crossed by numerous Freundhofer lines and by no others. It was then presumably composed entirely of reflected light. Judging from the indications of an almost evanescent spectrum, Neptune, as regards physical condition, is the twin of Uranus, as Saturn of Jupiter. 
of the circumstances of his rotation we are as good as completely ignorant mr maxwell hall indeed noticed at jamaica in november and december eighteen eighty three certain rhythmical fluctuations of brightness suggesting revolution on an axis in slightly less than eight hours but professor pickering reduces the supposed variability to an amount altogether too small for certain perception and dr g merler denies its existence in toto it is true their observations were not precisely contemporaneous with those of mr hall who believes the partial obscurations recorded by himself to have been of a passing kind and to have suddenly ceased after a fortnight of prevalence their less conspicuous renewal was visible to him in november eighteen eighty four confirming a rotation period of seven point ninety two hours it was ascertained at first by indirect means that the orbit of neptune's satellite is inclined about twenty degrees to his equator mr marth having drawn attention to the rapid shifting of its plane of motion mr tisserand and professor newcomb independently published the conclusion that such shifting necessarily results from neptune's ellipsoidal shape the movement is of the kind exemplified although with inverted relations in the precession of the equinoxes the pole of the satellite owing to the pull of neptune's equatorial protuberance describes a circle around the pole of his equator in a retrograde direction and in a period of over five hundred years the amount of compression indicated for the primary body is at the outside one eighty fifth whence it can be inferred that neptune possesses a lower rotary velocity than the other giant planets direct verification of the trend theoretically inferred for the satellite's movement was obtained by dr c in eighteen ninety nine the Washington 26-inch refractor disclosed to him, under exceptionally favorable conditions, a set of equatorial belts on the disk of Neptune, and they took just the direction prescribed by theory. Their objective reality cannot be doubted, although Barnard was unable, either with the Lick or the Yerkes telescope, to detect any definitive markings on this planet its diameter was found by him to be thirty two thousand nine hundred miles the possibility that neptune may not be the most remote body circling round the sun has been contemplated ever since he has been known to exist within the last few years the position at a given epoch of a planet far beyond his orbital verge has been approximately fixed by two separate investigators Professor George Forbes of Edinburgh adopted in 1880 a novel plan of search for unknown members of the solar system, the first idea of which was thrown out by Mr. Flammarion in November 1879. It depends upon the movements of comets. It is well known that those of moderately short periods are, for a reason already explained, connected with the larger planets in such a way that the cometary aphelia fall near some planetary orbit jupiter claims a large retinue of such partial dependents neptune owns six and there are two considerable groups the farthest distances of which from the sun lie respectively near one hundred and three hundred times that of the earth at each of these vast intervals one involving a period of one thousand the other of five thousand years Professor Forbes maintains that an unseen planet circulates. He even computed elements for the nearer of the two, and fixed its place on the celestial sphere. But the photographic searches made for it by Dr. Roberts at Crowborough and by Mr. Wilson at Daramona proved unavailing. Undeterred by Dykemuller's discouraging opinion that cometary orbits extending beyond the recognized bounds of the solar system are too imperfectly known to serve as the basis of trustworthy conclusions the edinburgh professor returned to the attack in nineteen o one he now sought to prove that the lost comet of fifteen fifty six actually returned in eighteen forty four but with the elements so transformed by ultra-Neptunian perturbations as to have escaped immediate identification. If so, the wanted planet has just entered the sign Libra, 
and being larger than Jupiter, should be possible to find. Almost simultaneously with Forbes, Professor Todd set about groping for the same object by the help of a totally different set of indications. Adams' approved method commended itself to him. But the hypothetical divigations of Neptune, having scarcely yet had time to develop, he was thrown back upon the residual errors of Uranus. They gave him a virtually identical situation for the new planet with that derived from the clustering of cometary Ophelia. Yet its assigned distance was little more than half that of the nearer of Professor Forbes' remote pair and it completed a revolution in 375 instead of a thousand years. The agreement in them between the positions determined, on separate grounds, for the ultra-Neptunian traveler, was merely an odd coincidence. Nor can we be certain, until it is seen, that we have really got into touch with it. End of section 29「Part two, Chapter nine of a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Carlo, San Clemente, California. A popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century by Agnes Mary Clark. Theories of Planetary Evolution Chapter 9. Theories of Planetary Evolution We cannot doubt that the solar system, as we see it, is the result of some process of growth, that, during innumerable ages, the forces of nature were at work upon its materials, blindly modeling them into the shape appointed for them, from the beginning by omnipotent wisdom. To set ourselves to inquire what that process was may be an audacity, but it is a legitimate, nay, an inevitable one. For man's implanted instinct to look before and after does not apply to his own little life alone, but regards the whole history of creation from the highest to the lowest, from the microscopic germ of an alga or fungus to the visible frame and furniture of the heavens. Kant considered that the inquiry into the mode of origin of the world was one of the easiest problems set by nature, but it cannot be said that his own solution of it was satisfactory. He, however, struck out in 1755 a track which thought still pursues. In his Allgemeine Naturgeschichte, the growth of sun and planets was traced from the cradle of a vast and formless mass of evenly diffused particles, and the uniformity of their movements was sought to be accounted for by the unvarying action of attractive and repulsive forces under the dominion of which their development was carried forward. In its modern form, the nebular hypothesis made its appearance in 1796. It was presented by Laplace with diffidence as a speculation unfortified by numerical buttresses of any kind, yet with visible exultation at having, as he thought, penetrated the birth secret of our system. He demanded, indeed, more in the way of postulates than Kant had done. He started with a sun ready-made and surrounded with a vast glowing atmosphere extending into space out beyond the orbit of the farthest planet and endowed with a slow rotatory motion. As this atmosphere or nebula cooled, it contracted, and as it contracted, its rotation, by a well-known mechanical law, became accelerated. At last, a point arrived when tangential velocity at the equator increased beyond the power of gravity to control, and equilibrium was restored by the separation of a nebulous ring revolving in the same period as the generating mass. After a time, the ring broke up into fragments, all eventually reunited in a single revolving and rotating body. This was the first and farthest planet." Meanwhile, 
the parent nebula continued to shrink and whirl quicker and quicker, passing as it did so through successive crises of instability, each resulting in and terminated by the formation of a planet at a smaller distance from the center and with a shorter period of revolution than its predecessor. In these secondary bodies, the same process was repeated on a reduced scale, the birth of satellites ensuing upon their contraction or not according to circumstances. Saturn's ring, it was added, afforded a striking confirmation of the theory of annular separation, and appeared to have survived in its original form in order to throw light on the genesis of the whole solar system, while the four first discovered asteroids offered an example in which the debris of a shattered ring had failed to coalesce into a single globe. This scene of cosmical evolution was a characteristic bequest from the 18th century to the 19th. It possessed the self-sufficing symmetry and entireness appropriate to the ideas of a time of renovation, when the complexity of nature was little accounted of in comparison with the imperious orderliness of the thoughts of man. Since its promulgation, however, knowledge has transgressed many boundaries and set at naught much ingenious theorizing. How has it fared with Laplace's sketch of the origin of the world? It has, at least, not been discarded as a feat. The groundwork of speculation on the subject is still furnished by it. It is, nevertheless, admittedly inadequate. Of much that exists, it gives no account, or an erroneous one. The march of events certainly did not everywhere, even if it did anywhere, follow the exact path prescribed for it. Yet, Modern science attempts to supplement, but scarcely ventures to supersede it. Thought has, in many directions, been profoundly modified by Mayer's and Joule's discovery, in 1842, of the equivalence between heat and motion. Its corollary was the grand idea of the conservation of energy, now one of the cardinal principles of science. This means that, under the ordinary circumstances of observation, the old maxim ex nihilo nihil fit applies to force as well as to matter. The supplies of heat, light, electricity must be kept up, or the stream will cease to flow. The question of the maintenance of the sun's heat was thus inevitably raised, and with the question of maintenance, that of origin is indissolubly connected. Dr. Julius Robert Mayer, a physician residing at Heilbronn, was the first to apply the new light to the investigation of what Sir John Herschel had termed the Great Secret. He showed that if the sun were a body either simply cooling or in a state of combustion, it must long since have gone out. Had an equal mass of coal been set alight four or five centuries after the building of the Pyramid of Cheops, and kept burning at such a rate as to supply solar light and heat during the interim, only a few cinders would now remain in lieu of our undiminished glorious orb. Mayer looked round for an alternative. He found it in the meteoric hypothesis of solar conservation. The importance in the economy of our system of the bodies known as falling stars was then, in 1848, beginning to be recognized. It was known that they revolved in countless swarms round the sun, that the earth daily encountered millions of them, and it was surmised that the cone of the zodiacal light represented their visible condensation towards the attractive center. From the zodiacal light, then, Mayer derived the store needed for supporting the sun's radiations. He proved that, by the stoppage of their motion through falling into the sun, bodies would evolve from 4,600 to 9,200 times as much heat, according to their ultimate velocity, as would result from the burning of equal masses of coal, their precipitation upon the sun's surface being brought about, by the resisting medium observed to affect the revolutions of Enki's comet. There was, however, a difficulty. The quantity of matter needed to keep, by the sacrifice of its movement, the hearth of our system warm and bright would be very considerable. 
Mayer's lowest estimate, put it at 94,000 billion kilograms per second, or a mass equal to that of our moon biannually. But so large an addition to the gravitating power of the sun would quickly become sensible in the movement of the bodies dependent upon him. Their revolutions would be notably accelerated. Mayer admitted that each year would be shorter than the previous one by a not insignificant fraction of a second, and postulated an unceasing waste of substance, such as Newton had supposed must accompany emission of the material corpuscles of light to neutralize continual reinforcement. Mayer's views obtained a very small share of publicity, and owned Mr. Waterston as their independent author in this country. The meteoric or dynamical theory of solar sustentation was expounded by him before the British Association in 1853. It was developed with his usual ability by Lord Kelvin in the following year. The inflow of meteorites, he remarked, is the only one of all conceivable causes of solar heat which we know to exist from independent evidence. We know it to exist, but we now also know it to be entirely insufficient. The supplies presumed to be contained in the zodiacal light would be quickly exhausted. A constant inflow from space would be needed to meet the demand. But if moving bodies were drawn into the sun at anything like the required rate, the air, even out here at ninety-three millions of miles distance, would be thick with them. The earth would be red-hot from their impacts. Geological deposits would be largely meteoric, to say nothing of the effects on the mechanism of the heavens. Lord Kelvin himself urged the inadmissibility of the extra-planetary theory of meteoric supply on the very tangible ground that, if it were true, the year would be shorter now, actually by six weeks, than at the opening of the Christian era. The intraplanetary supply, however, is too scanty to be anything more than a temporary makeshift. The meteoric hypothesis was naturally extended from the maintenance of the sun's heat to the formation of the bodies circling round him. The Earth, no less doubtless than the other planets, is still growing. Cosmical matter in the shape of falling stars and aerolites, to the amount adopting Professor Newton's estimate of 100 tons daily, is swept up by it as it pursues its orbital round. Inevitably, the idea suggested itself that this process of appropriation gives the key to the life history of our globe, and that the momentary streak of fire in the summer sky represents a feeble survival of the glowing hailstorm by which in old times it was fashioned and warmed. Mr. E. W. Braley supported this view of planetary production in 1864, and it has recommended itself to Haidinger, Helmholtz, Proctor, and Fay. But the negative evidence of geological deposits appears fatal to it. The theory of solar energy, now generally regarded as the true one, was announced by Helmholtz in a popular lecture in 1854. It depends upon the same principle of the equivalence of heat and motion, which had suggested the meteoric hypothesis. But here the movement surrendered and transformed belongs to the particles, not of any foreign bodies, but of the sun itself. Drawn together from a wide ambit by the force of their own gravity, their fall towards the sun's center must have engendered a vast thermal store, of which 453 of 454 are computed to be already spent. Presumably, however, this stream of reinforcement is still flowing. In the very act of parting with heat, the sun develops a fresh stock, his radiations, in short, are the direct result of shrinkage through cooling. A diminution of the solar diameter by 380 feet yearly would just suffice to cover the present rate of emission, and would for ages remain imperceptible with our means of observation, since, after the lapse of 6,000 years, the lessening of angular size would scarcely amount to one second. But the process, though not terminated, is strictly a terminable one. In less than five million years, the sun will have contracted to half its present bulk. 
in seven million more, it will be as dense as the earth. It is difficult to believe that it will then be a luminous body. Nor can an unlimited past duration be admitted. Helmholtz considered that radiation might have gone on with its actual intensity for twenty-two. Langley allows only eighteen million years. The period can scarcely be stretched by the most generous allowances to double the latter figure, but this is far from meeting the demands of geologists and biologists. An attempt was made in 1881 to supply the sun with machinery analogous to that of a regenerative furnace, enabling it to consume the same fuel over and over again, and so to prolong indefinitely its beneficent existence. The inordinate waste of energy, which shocks our thrifty ideas, was simultaneously abolished. The earth stops and turns variously to account one two thousand two hundred and fifty millionth part of the solar radiations. Each of the other planets and satellites takes a proportionate share. The rest, being all but an infinitesimal fraction of the whole, is dissipated through endless space to serve what purpose we know not. Now, on the late Sir William Siemens' plan, this reckless expenditure would cease. The solar incomings and outgoings would be regulated on approved economic principles, and the inevitable final bankruptcy would be staved off to remote ages. But there was a fatal flaw in its construction. He imagined a perpetual circulation of combustible materials, alternately surrendering and regaining chemical energy, the round being kept going by the motive force of the sun's rotation. This, however, was merely to perch the globe upon a tortoise while leaving the tortoise in the air. The sun's rotation contains a certain definite amount of mechanical power, enough, according to Lord Kelvin, if directly converted into heat, to keep up the sun's emission during 116 years and six days, a mere moment in cosmical time. More economically applied, it would no doubt go farther. Its exhaustion would, nevertheless, under the most favorable circumstances, ensue in a comparatively short period. Many other objections equally unanswerable have been urged to the regenerative hypothesis, but this one suffices. Dr. Kroll's collision hypothesis is less demonstrably unsound, but scarcely less unsatisfactory. By the mutual impact of two dark masses rushing together with tremendous speed, he sought to provide the solar nebula with an immense original stock of heat for the reinforcement of that subsequently evolved in the course of its progressive contraction. The sun, while still living on its capital, would thus have a larger capital to live on, and the time demands of the less exacting geologists and biologists might be successfully met. But the primitive event, assumed for the purpose of dispensing them from the inconvenience of hurrying up their phenomena, is not one that a sane judgment can readily admit to have ever, in point of actual fact, happened. There remains, then, as the only intelligible rationale of solar sustentation, Helmholtz's shrinkage theory. And this has a very important bearing upon the nebular view of planetary formation, it may, in fact, be termed its complement, for it involves the idea that the sun's materials, once enormously diffused, gradually condensed to their present volume with development of heat and light, and, it may plausibly be added, with the separation of dependent globes. The data furnished by spectrum analysis, too, favor the supposition of a common origin for sun and planets by showing their community of substance, while gaseous nebulae present examples of vast masses of tenuous vapor, such as our system may plausibly be conjectured to have primitively sprung from. But recent science raises many objections to the details, if it supplies some degree of confirmation to the fundamental idea of Laplace's cosmogony. The detection of the retrograde movement of Neptune's satellite made it plain that the anomalous conditions of the Uranian world were due to no extraordinary disturbance, but to a systematic variety of arrangement at the outskirts of the solar domain, so that, were a trans-Neptunian planet discovered, 
we should be fully prepared to find it rotating and surrounded by satellites circulating from east to west. The uniformity of movement, upon the probabilities connected with which the French geometer mainly based his scheme, thus at once vanishes. The excessively rapid revolution of the inner Martian moon is a further stumbling block. On Laplace's view, no satellite can revolve in a shorter time than its primary rotates, for in its period of circulation survives the period of rotation of the parent mass, which filled the sphere of its orbit at the time of giving it birth, and rotation quickens as contraction goes on. Therefore, the older time of axial rotation should invariably be longer. This obstacle can, however, as we shall presently see, be turned. More serious is one connected with the planetary periods pointed out by Babinet in 1861. In order to make them fit in with the hypothesis of successive separation from a rotating and contracting body, certain arbitrary assumptions have to be made of fluctuations in the distribution of the matter forming that body at the various epochs of separation. Such expedients usually merit the distrust which they inspire. Primitive and permanent irregularities of density in the solar nebula, such as Miss Young's calculations suggest, do not, on the other hand, appear intrinsically improbable. Again, it was objected by Professor Kirkwood in 1869 that there could be no sufficient cohesion in such an enormously diffused mass as the planets are supposed to have sprung from to account for the wide intervals between them. The matter separated through the growing excess of centrifugal speed would have been cast off, not by rarely recurring efforts, but continually, fragmentarily, pari passu with condensation and acceleration. Each wisp of nebula, as it found itself unduly hurried, would have declared its independence and set about revolving and condensing on its own account. The result would have been a meteoric, not a planetary system. Moreover, it is a question whether the relative ages of the planets do not follow in order just the reverse of that concluded by Laplace. Professor Newcomb holds the opinion that the rings which eventually constituted the planets divided from the main body of the nebula almost simultaneously, priority, if there were any, being on the side of the inner and smaller ones, while in M. Fay's cosmogony, the retrograde motion of the systems formed by the two outer planets is ascribed, on grounds it is true of dubious validity, to their comparatively late origin. This ingenious scheme was designed not merely to complete, but to supersede that of Laplace, which undoubtedly, through the inclusion by our system of oppositely directed rotations, forfeits its claim simply and singly to account for the fundamental peculiarities of its structure. M. Fay's leading contention is that, under the circumstances assumed by Laplace, not the two outer planets alone, but the whole company must have been possessed of retrograde rotation, for they were formed, ex hypothesi, after the sun. Central condensation had reached an advanced stage when the rings they were derived from separated. The principle of inverse squares consequently held good, and Kepler's laws were in full operation. Now, particles circulating in obedience to these laws can only, since their velocity decreases outward from the center of attraction, coalesce into a globe with a backward axial movement. Nor was Laplace blind to this flaw in his theory, but his effort to remove it, though it passed muster for the best part of a century, was scarcely successful. His planet-forming rings were made to rotate all in one piece, their outer parts thus necessarily traveling at a swifter linear rate than their inner parts, and eventually uniting, equally of necessity, into a forward-spinning body. The strength of cohesion involved may, however, safely be called impossible, especially when it is considered that nebulous materials were in question. The reform proposed by M. Fay consists in admitting that all the planets inside Uranus are of pre-solar origin, that they took globular form in the bosom of a nearly homogeneous nebula, revolving in a single period, with motion accelerated from center to circumference, 
and hence agglomerating into masses with a direct rotation. Uranus and Neptune owed their exceptional characteristics to their later birth. When they came into existence, the development of the sun was already far advanced, central force had acquired virtually its present strength, unity of period had been abolished by its predominance, and motion was retarded outward. Thus, what we may call the relative chronology of the solar system is thrown once more into confusion. The order of seniority of the planets is now no easier to determine than who first, who last, among the victims of Hector's spear. For M. Fay's arrangements, notwithstanding the skill with which he has presented them, cannot be unreservedly accepted. The objections to them, thoughtfully urged by M. C. Wolfe and Professor Darwin, are grave. Not the least so is his omission to take account of an agency of change presently to be noticed. A further valuable discussion of the matter was published by M. Ligondès in 1897. His views are those of Fay, modified to disarm the criticisms they had encountered, and special attention may be claimed for his weighty remark that each planet has a life history of its own, essentially distinct from those of the others, and, despite original unity, not to be confounded with them. The drift of recent investigations seems, indeed, to be to find the embryonic solar system already potentially complete in the parent nebula, like the oak in an acorn, and to regulate detailed explanations of its peculiarities to the dim pre-nebular foretime. We now come to a most remarkable investigation— one indeed unique in its profession to lead us back with mathematical certainty towards the origin of a heavenly body. We refer to Professor Darwin's inquiries into the former relations of the earth and moon. They deal exclusively with the effects of tidal friction, and primarily with those resulting not from oceanic, but from bodily tides, such as the sun and moon must have raised in past ages on a liquid or viscous earth. The immediate effect of either is, as already explained, to destroy the rotation of the body on which the tide is raised, as regards the tide-raising body, bringing it to turn always the same face towards its disturber. This, we can see, has been completely brought about in the case of the moon. There is, however, a secondary or reactive effect. Action is always mutual. Precisely as much as the moon pulls the terrestrial tidal wave backward, the tidal wave pulls the moon forward. But pulling a body forward in its orbit implies the enlargement of that orbit. In other words, the moon is, as a consequence of tidal friction, very slowly receding from the earth. This will go on, other circumstances remaining unchanged, until the lengthening day overtakes the more tardily lengthening month, when each month will be of about 1,400 hours. A position of what we may call tidal equilibrium between Earth and Moon will, apart from disturbance by other bodies, then be attained. If, however, it be true that, in the time to come, the Moon will be much farther from us, it follows that in the time past, she was much nearer to us than she now is. Tracing back her history by the aid of Professor Darwin's clue, we at length find her revolving in a period of somewhere between two and four hours, almost in contact with an earth rotating just at the same rate. This was before tidal friction had begun its work of grinding down axial velocity and expanding orbital range but the position was not one of stable equilibrium. The slightest inequality must have set on foot a series of uncompensated changes. If the moon had whirled the least iota faster than the earth spun, she must have been precipitated upon it. Her actual existence shows that the trembling balance inclined the other way. By a second or two, to begin with, the month exceeded the day. The tidal wave crept ahead of the moon— Tidal friction came into play, and our satellite started on its long spiral journey outward from the parent globe. This must have occurred, it is computed, at least 54 million years ago. 
That this kind of tidal reactive effect played its part in bringing the moon into its present position, and is still, to some slight extent, at work in changing it, there can be no doubt whatever. An irresistible conjecture carried the explorer of its rigidly deducible consequences one step beyond them. The moon's time of revolution, when so near the earth as barely to escape contact with it, must have been, by Kepler's law, more than two and less than two and a half hours. Now, it happens that the most rapid rate of rotation of a fluid mass of the earth's average density, consistent with spheroidal equilibrium, is two hours and twenty minutes. Quicken the movement, but by one second, and the globe must fly asunder. Hence, the inference that the Earth actually did fly asunder through overfast spinning, the ensuing disruption representing the birth throes of the Moon. It is likely that the event was hastened or helped by solar tidal disturbance. To recapitulate, analysis tracks backward the two bodies until it leaves them in very close contiguity, one rotating and the other revolving in approximately the same time, and that time certainly not far different from, and quite possibly identical with, the critical period of instability for the terrestrial spheroid. Is this, Professor Darwin asks, a mere coincidence? Or does it not rather point to the breakup of the primeval planet into two masses in consequence of a too rapid rotation? We are tempted, but are not allowed, to give an unqualified assent. Mr. James Nolan of Victoria has made it clear that the moon could not have subsisted as a continuous mass under the powerful disruptive strain which would have acted upon it when revolving almost in contact with the present surface of the earth, and Professor Darwin, admitting the objection, concedes to our satellite, in its initial stage, the alternative form of a flock of meteorites. But such a congregation must have been quickly dispersed by tidal action into a meteoric ring. The same investigator subsequently fixed 6,500 miles from center to center as the minimum distance at which the moon could have revolved in its entirety, and he concluded it necessary to suppose that after the birth of a satellite, if it takes place at all in this way, a series of changes occur which are quite unknown. The evidence, however, for the efficiency of tidal friction in bringing about the actual configuration of the lunar terrestrial system is not invalidated by this failure to penetrate its natal mystery. Under its influence, the principal elements of that system fall into interdependent mutual relations. It connects, casually and quantitatively, the periods of the moon's revolution and of the earth's rotation, the obliquity of the ecliptic, the inclination and eccentricity of the lunar orbit. All this can scarcely be accidental. Professor Darwin's first researches on this subject were communicated to the Royal Society December 18, 1879. They were followed January 20, 1881, by an inquiry on the same principles into the earlier condition of the entire solar system. The results were a warning against hasty generalization, they showed that the lunar terrestrial system, far from being a pattern for their development, was a singular exception among the bodies swayed by the sun. Its peculiarity resides in the fact that the moon is proportionately by far the most massive attendant upon any known planet. Its disturbing power over its primary is thus abnormally great, and tidal friction has, in consequence, played a predominant part in bringing their mutual relations into their present state. The comparatively late birth of the moon tends to ratify this inference. The dimensions of the earth did not differ, according to our present authority, very greatly from what they now are when her solitary offspring came, somehow, into existence. This is found not to have been the case with any other of the planets, it is unlikely that the satellites of Jupiter, Saturn, or Mars, we may safely add of Uranus or Neptune, ever revolved in much narrower orbits than those they now traverse. It is practically certain that they did not, like our moon, originate very near the present surfaces of their primaries. 
what follows? The tide-raising power of a body grows with vicinity in a rapidly accelerated ratio. Lunar tides must then have been on an enormous scale when the moon swung round at a fraction of its actual distance from the earth, but no other satellite with which we are acquainted occupied at any time a corresponding position. Hence, no other satellite ever possessed tide-raising capabilities in the least comparable to those of the moon. We conclude, once more, that tidal friction had an influence here very different from its influence elsewhere. Quite possibly, however, that influence may be more nearly spent than in less advanced combinations of revolving globes. Mr. Nolan concluded in 1895 that it still retains appreciable efficacy in the several domains of the outer planets. The moons of Jupiter and Saturn are, by his calculations, in course of sensible retreat, under compulsion of the perennial ripples raised by them on the surfaces of their gigantic primaries. He thus connects the interior position of the fifth Jovian satellite with its small mass. The feebleness of its tide-raising power obliged it to remain behind its companions, for there is no sign of its being more juvenile than the Galilean quartet. The yielding of plastic bodies to the strain of unequal attractions is a phenomenon of far-reaching consequence. We know that the sun as well as the moon causes tides in our oceans. There must, then, be solar, no less than lunar, tidal friction. The question at once arises, what part has it played in the development of the solar system? Has it ever been one of the leading importance, or has its influence always been, as it now is, subordinate, almost negligible. To this, too, Professor Darwin supplies an answer. It can be stated, without hesitation, that the sun did not give birth to the planets, as the earth has been supposed to have given birth to the moon, by the disruption of its already condensed, though viscous and glowing mass, pushing them then gradually backward from its surface into their present places. For the utmost possible increase in the length of the year through tidal friction is one hour, and five minutes is a more probable estimate. So far as the pull of tide waves raised on the sun by the planets is concerned, then, the distances of the latter have never been notably different from what they now are, though that cause may have converted the paths traversed by them from circles into ellipses. Over their physical history, however, it was probably in a large measure influential. The first vital issue for each of them was, satellites or no satellites. Were they to be governors as well as governed? Or should they revolve in sterile isolation throughout the eons of their future existence? Here there is strong reason to believe that solar tidal friction was the overruling power. It is remarkable that planetary fecundity increases, at least so far outward as Saturn, with distance from the Sun. Can these two facts be in any way related? In other words, is there any conceivable way by which tidal influence could prevent or impede the throwing off of secondary bodies? We have only to think for a moment in order to see that this is precisely one of its direct results. Tidal friction, whether solar or lunar, tends to reduce the axial movement of the body it acts upon. But the separation of satellites depends, according to the received view, upon the attainment of a disruptive rate of rotation. Hence, if solar tidal friction were strong enough to keep down the pace below this critical point, the contracting mass would remain intact. There would be no satellite production. This, in all probability, actually occurred in the case both of Mercury and Venus. They cooled without dividing, because the solar friction break applied to them was too strong to permit acceleration to pass the limit of equilibrium. The complete destruction of their relative axial movement has been rendered probable by recent observations, and that the process went on rapidly is a reasonable further inference. The earth barely escaped the fate of loneliness incurred by her neighbors. Her first and only epoch of instability was retarded until she had nearly reached maturity. The late appearance of the moon accounts for its large relative size. 
through the increased cohesion of an already strongly condensed parent mass, and for the distinctive peculiarities of its history and influence on the producing globe. Solar tidal friction, although it did not hinder the formation of two minute dependents of Mars, has been invoked to explain the anomalously rapid revolution of one of them. Phobos, we have seen, completes more than three revolutions while Mars rotates once. But this was probably not always so. The two periods were originally nearly equal. The difference, it is alleged, was brought about by tidal waves raised by the sun on the semi-fluid spheroid of Mars. Rotatory velocity was thereby destroyed, the Martian day slowly lengthened, and as a secondary consequence, the period of the inner satellite, become shorter than the augmented day, began progressively to diminish. So that Phobos, unlike our moon, was in the beginning farther from its primary than now. But here again, Mr. Nolan entered a caveat. Applying the simple test of numerical evaluation, he showed that before solar tidal friction could lengthen the rotation period of Mars by so much as one minute, Phobos should have been precipitated upon its surface. For the enormous disparity of mass between it and the Sun is so far neutralized by the enormous disparity in their respective distances from Mars that solar tidal force there is only fifty times that of the little satellite. But the tidal effects of a satellite circulating quicker than its primary rotates exactly reverse those of one moving, like our moon, comparatively slowly, so that the tides raised by Phobos tend to shorten both periods. Its orbital momentum, however, is so extremely small in proportion to the rotational momentum of Mars that any perceptible inroad upon the latter is attended by a lavish and ruinous expenditure of the former. It is as if a man owning a single five-pound note were to play for equal stakes with a man possessing a million. The bankruptcy, sure to ensure, is typified by the coming fate of the Martian inner satellite. The catastrophe of its fall needs to bring it about only a very feeble reactive pull compared with the friction which the sun should apply in order to protract the Martian day by one minute and from the proportionate strength of the forces at work, it is quite certain that one result cannot take place without the other. Nor can things have been materially different in the past. Hence, the idea must be abandoned that the primitive time of rotation of Mars survives in the period of its inner satellite. The anomalous shortness of the latter may, however, in M. Wolff's opinion, be explained by the trainis elliptiques with which Rocher supplemented nebular annulation. These are traced back to the descent of separating strata from the shoulders of the great nebulous spheroid towards its equatorial plane. Their rotational velocity being thus relatively small, they formed inner rings, very much nearer to the center of condensation than would have been possible on the unmodified theory of Laplace. Phobos might, in this view, be called a polar offset of Mars, and the rings of Saturn are thought to own a similar origin. Outside the orbit of Mars, solar tidal friction can scarcely be said to possess at present any sensible power, but it is far from certain that this was always so. It seems not unlikely that its influence was the overruling one in determining the direction of planetary rotation. Monsieur Fay, as we have seen, objected to Laplace's scheme that only retrograde secondary systems could be produced by it. In this, he was anticipated by Kirkwood, who, however, supplied an answer to his own objection. Sun-raised tides must have acted with great power on the diffused masses of the embryo planets. By their means, they doubtless very soon came to turn, in lunar fashion, the same hemisphere always towards their center of motion. This amounts to saying that, even if they started with retrograde rotation, it was, by solar tidal friction, quickly rendered direct. 
for it is scarcely necessary to point out that a planet turning an invariable face to the sun rotates in the same direction in which it revolves and in the same period, as, with the progress of condensation, tides became feebler and rotation more rapid, the accelerated spinning necessarily proceeded in the sense thus prescribed for it. Hence, the backward axial movements of Uranus and Neptune may very well be a survival, due to the inefficiency of solar tides at their great distance, of a state of things originally prevailing universally throughout the system. The general outcome of Mr. Darwin's researches has been to leave Laplace's cosmogony untouched. He concludes nothing against it, and, what perhaps tells with more weight in the long run, has nothing to substitute for it. In one form or the other, if we speculate at all on the development of the planetary system, our speculations are driven into conformity with the broad lines of the nebular hypothesis, to the extent, at least, of admitting an original material unity and motive uniformity. But we can see now, better than formerly, that these supply a bare and imperfect sketch of the truth. We should err gravely were we to suppose it possible to reconstruct, with the help of any knowledge our race is ever likely to possess, the real and complete history of our admirable system. The subtlety of nature, Bacon says, transcends in many ways the subtlety of the intellect and senses of man. By no mere barren formula of evolution, indiscriminately applied all round, the results we marvel at, and by a fragment of which our life is conditioned, were brought forth. But by the manifold play of interacting forces, variously modified and variously prevailing, according to the local requirements of the design, they were appointed to execute. End of Part 2, Chapter 9, Theories of Planetary Evolution Recording by Aaron Carlo San Clemente, California. Part 2, Chapter 10, Recent Comets, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Carlo in San Clemente, California. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clark. Recent Comets, Part 1. Chapter 10. Recent Comets. On the 2nd of June, 1858, Giambattista Donati discovered at Florence a feeble round nebulosity in the constellation of Leo, about one-tenth the diameter of the full moon. It proved to be a comet approaching the sun, but it changed little in apparent place or brightness for some weeks. The gradual development of a central condensation of light was the first symptom of coming splendor. At Harvard, in the middle of July, a strong stellar nucleus was seen. On August 14th, a tail began to be thrown out. As the comet wanted still over six weeks of the time of its perihelion passage, it was obvious that great things might be expected of it. They did not fail of realization. Not before the early days of September was it generally recognized with the naked eye, though it had been detected without a glass at Polkova, August 19th. But its growth was thenceforward surprisingly rapid, as it swept with accelerated motion under the hindmost foot of the great bear and past the starry locks of Berenice. A sudden leap upward in luster was noticed on September 12th when the nucleus shone with about the brightness of the pole star, and the tail, notwithstanding large foreshortening, could be traced with the lowest telescopic power over six degrees of the sphere. The appendage, however, attained its full development only after perihelion, September 30th, by which time, too, it lay nearly square to the line of sight from the Earth. On October 10th, 
it stretched in a magnificent scimitar-like curve over a third and upwards of the visible hemisphere, representing a real extension in space of fifty-four million miles. But the most striking view was presented on October 5th, when the brilliant star Arcturus became involved in the brightest part of the tail, and during many hours contributed, its luster undiminished by the interposed nebulous screen, to heighten the grandeur of the most majestic celestial object of which living memories retain the impress. Donati's comet was, according to Admiral Smythe's testimony, outdone as a mere sight object by the great comet of 1811, but what it lacked in splendor it surely made up in grace and variety of what we may call scenic effects. Some of these were no less interesting to the student than impressive to the spectator. At Polkova, on 16th September, Vinica, the first director of the Strasbourg Observatory, observed a faint outer envelope resembling a veil of almost evanescent texture flung somewhat widely over the head. Next evening, the first of the secondary tales appeared, possibly as part of the same phenomenon. This was a narrow straight ray forming a tangent to the strong curve of the primary tail and reaching to a still greater distance from the nucleus. It continued faintly visible for about three weeks, during part of which time it was seen in duplicate. For from the chief train itself, at a point where its curvature abruptly changed, issued, as if through the rejection of some of its materials, a second beam nearly parallel to the first, the rigid line of which contrasted singularly with the softly diffused and waving aspect of the plume of light from which it sprang. Olber's theory of unequal repulsive forces was never more beautifully illustrated. The triple tail seemed a visible solar analysis of cometary matter. The processes of luminous emanation going on in this body forcibly recalled the observations made on the comets of 1744 and 1835. From the middle of September, the nucleus, estimated by Bond to be under 500 miles in diameter, was the center of action of the most energetic kind. Seven distinct envelopes were detached in succession from the nebulosity surrounding the head, and, after rising towards the sun during periods of from four to seven days, finally cast their material backward to form the right and left branches of the great train. The separation of these by an obscure axis, apparently as black quite close up to the nucleus as the sky, indicated for the tail a hollow, cone-like structure, while the repetition of certain spots and rays in the same corresponding situation on one envelope after another served to show that the nucleus, to some local peculiarity of which they were doubtless due, had no proper rotation, but merely shifted sufficiently on an axis to preserve the same aspect towards the sun as it moved round it. This observation of Bond's was strongly confirmatory of Bessel's hypothesis of opposite polarities in such bodies' opposite sides. The protrusion towards the sun, on September 25th, of a brilliant luminous fan-shaped sector completed the resemblance to Halley's comet. The appearance of the head was now somewhat that of a bat's wing gaslight. There were, however, no oscillations to and fro, such as Bessel had seen and speculated upon in 1835. As the size of the nucleus contracted with approach to perihelion, its intensity augmented. On October 2nd, it outshone Arcturus, and for a week or ten days was a conspicuous object half an hour after sunset. Its luster, setting aside the light derived from the tail, was at that date 6,300 times what it had been on June 15th, though theoretically, taking into account, that is, only the differences of distance from Sun and Earth, it should have been only one thirty-third of that amount. Here, it might be thought, was convincing evidence of the comet itself becoming ignited under the growing intensity of the solar radiations. Yet, Experiments with the polariscope were interpreted in an adverse sense. 
and Bond's conclusion that the comet sent us virtually unmixed reflected sunshine was generally acquiesced in. It was, nevertheless, negatived by the first application of the spectroscope to these bodies. Very few comets have been so well or so long observed as Donati's. It was visible to the naked eye during 112 days. It was telescopically discernible for 275, the last observation having been made by Mr. William Mann at the Cape of Good Hope, March 4, 1859. Its course through the heavens combined singularly with the orbital place of the Earth to favor curious inspection. The tail, when near its greatest development, lost next to nothing by the effects of perspective, and at the same time lay in a plane sufficiently inclined to the line of sight to enable it to display its exquisite curves to the greatest advantage. Even the weather was, on both sides of the Atlantic, propitious during the period of greatest interest, and the moon as little troublesome as possible. The volume compiled by the younger Bond is a monument to the care and skill with which these advantages were turned to account. Yet this stately apparition marked no turning point in the history of cometary science. By its study, knowledge was indeed materially advanced, but along the old lines. No quick and vivid illumination broke upon its path. Quite insignificant objects, as we have already partly seen, have often proved more vitally instructive. Donati's comet has been identified with no other. Its path is an immensely elongated ellipse, lying in a plane far apart from that of the planetary movements, carrying it at perihelion considerably within the orbit of Venus, and at aphelion out into space to five and a half times the distance from the sun of Neptune. The entire circuit occupies over two thousand years and is performed in a retrograde direction, or against the order of the signs. Before its next return, about the year 4000 AD, the enigma of its presence and its purpose may have been to some extent, though we may be sure not completely, penetrated. On June 30th, 1861, the Earth passed, for the second time in the century, through the tail of a great comet. Some of our readers may remember the unexpected disclosure on the withdrawal of the sun below the horizon on that evening of an object so remarkable as to challenge universal attention. A golden yellow planetary disk, wrapped in dense nebulosity, shone out while the June twilight of these latitudes was still in its first strength. The number and complexity of the envelopes surrounding the head produced, according to the late Mr. Webb, a magnificent effect. Portions of six distinct emanations were traceable. It was as though a number of light, hazy clouds were floating round a miniature full moon. As the sky darkened, the tail emerged to view. Although in brightness and sharpness of definition he could not compete with the display of 1858, its dimensions proved to be extraordinary. It reached upwards beyond the zenith when the head had already set. By some authorities, its extreme length was stated at 118 degrees, and it showed no trace of curvature. Most remarkable, however, was the appearance of two widely divergent rays, each pointing towards the head, though cut off from it by sky illumination, of which one was seen by Mr. Webb and both by Mr. Williams at Liverpool a quarter of an hour before midnight. There seems no doubt that Webb's interpretation was the true one and that these beams were, in fact, the perspective representation of a conical or cylindrical tail hanging closely above our heads and probably just being lifted up out of our atmosphere. The cometary train was then rapidly receding from the earth, so that the sides of the outspread fan of light shown by it, when we were right in the line of its axis, must have appeared, as they did, to close up 
in departure. The swiftness with which the visually opened fan shut proved its vicinity, and indeed Mr. Hinn's calculation showed that we were not so much near as actually within its fold at that very time. Already Monsieur Lier, from his observations at Rio de Janeiro, June 11th to 14th, and Mr. Tebbit, by whom the comet was discovered in New South Wales on May 13th, had anticipated such an encounter, while the former subsequently proved that it must have occurred in such a way as to cause an immersion of the earth in cometary matter to a depth of 300,000 miles. The comet then lay between the earth and the sun at a distance of about 14 million miles from the former, its tail stretched outward just along the line of intersection of its own with the terrestrial orbit to an extent of 15 million miles, so that our globe, happening to pass at the time, found itself during some hours involved in the flimsy appendage. No perceptible effects were produced by the meeting. It was known to have occurred by theory alone. A peculiar glare in the sky, thought by some to have distinguished the evening of June 30th, was, at best, inconspicuous. Nor were there any symptoms of unusual electric excitement. The Greenwich instruments were, indeed, disturbed on the following night, but it would be rash to infer that the comet had art or part in their agitation. The perihelion passage of this body occurred June 11th, 1861, and its orbit has been shown by M. Kreutz of Bonn from a very complete investigation founded on observations extending over nearly a year to be an ellipse traversed in a period of 409 years. Towards the end of August, 1862, a comet became visible to the naked eye high up in the northern hemisphere, with a nucleus equaling in brightness the lesser stars of the plough and a feeble tail twenty degrees in length. It thus occupied quite a secondary position among the members of its class. It was, nevertheless, a splendid object in comparison with the telescopic nebulosity discovered by Temple at Marseilles, December 19, 1865. This, the sole comet of 1866, slipped past perihelion January 11th, without pomp of train or other appendages, and might have seemed hardly worth the trouble of pursuing. Fortunately, this was not the view entertained by observers and computers, since upon the knowledge acquired of the movements of these two bodies has been founded one of the most significant discoveries of modern times. The first of them is now styled the comet 1862-3 of the August meteors, the second 1866-1, that of the November meteors. The steps by which this curious connection came to be ascertained were many, and were taken in succession by a number of individuals. But the final result was reached by Schiaparelli of Milan, and remains deservedly associated with his name. The idea prevalent in the 18th century as to the nature of shooting stars was that they were mere aerial ignis fatui, inflammable vapors accidentally kindled in our atmosphere. But Halley had already entertained the opinion of their cosmical origin, and Chladni, in 1794, formally broached the theory that space is filled with minute circulating atoms which, drawn by the Earth's attraction and ignited by friction in its gaseous envelope, produce the luminous effects so frequently witnessed. Acting on his suggestion, Brandes and Betzenberg, two students at the University of Göttingen, began in 1798 to determine the heights of falling stars by simultaneous observations at a distance. They soon found that they move with planetary velocities in the most elevated regions of our atmosphere, and, by the ascertainment of this fact, laid a foundation of distinct knowledge regarding them. Some of the data collected, however, served only to perplex opinion, and even caused Chladni temporarily to renounce his. Many high authorities, headed by Laplace in 1802, declared for the lunar volcanic origin of meteorites. But thought on the subject was turbid, and inquiry seemed only to stir up the mud of ignorance. It needed one of those amazing spectacles at which man assists no longer in abject terror for his own frail fortunes, 
but with keen curiosity and the vivid expectation of new knowledge to bring about a clarification. On the night of November 12-13, 1833, a tempest of falling stars broke over the earth. North America bore the brunt of its pelting, from the Gulf of Mexico to Halifax, until daylight with some difficulty put an end to the display. The sky was scored in every direction with shining tracks and illuminated with majestic fireballs. At Boston, the frequency of meteors was estimated to be about half that of flakes of snow in an average snowstorm. Their numbers, while the first fury of their coming lasted, were quite beyond counting, but as it waned a reckoning was attempted from which it was computed, on the basis of that much diminished rate, that 240,000 must have been visible during the nine hours they continued to fall. Now there was one very remarkable feature common to the innumerable small bodies which traversed, or were consumed, in our atmosphere that night. They all seemed to come from the same part of the sky. Traced backward, their paths were invariably found to converge to a point in the constellation Leo. Moreover, that point traveled with the stars in their nightly round. In other words, it was entirely independent of the Earth and its rotation. It was a point in interplanetary space. The effective perception of this fact amounted to a discovery, as Olmsted and Twining, who had simultaneous ideas on the subject, were the first to realize. Denison Olmsted was then professor of mathematics in Yale College. He showed early in 1834 that the emanation of the showering meteors from a fixed radiant proved their approach to the earth along nearly parallel lines, appearing to diverge by an effect of perspective and that those parallel lines must be sections of orbits described by them round the sun and intersecting that of the earth. For the November phenomenon was now seen to be a periodical one. On the same night of the year 1832, although with less dazzling and universal splendor than in America in 1833, it had been witnessed over great part of Europe and in Arabia. Olmsted accordingly assigned to the cloud of cosmical particles, or comet as he chose to call it, by terrestrial encounters with which he supposed the appearances in question to be produced, a period of about 182 days, its path and narrow ellipse meeting near its farthest end from the sun, the place occupied by the earth on November 12th. Once for all, then, as the result of the starfall of 1833, the study of luminous meteors became an integral part of astronomy. Their membership of the solar system was no longer a theory or a conjecture. It was an established fact. The discovery might be compared to, if it did not transcend in importance, that of the asteroidal group. C'est un nouveau monde planétaire, Arago wrote, qui commence à se révéler à nous. Evidences of periodicity continued to accumulate. It was remembered that Humboldt and Bonpland had been the spectators at Cumana after midnight on November 12, 1799, of a fiery shower little inferior to that of 1833, and reported to have been visible from the equator to Greenland. Moreover, in 1834 and some subsequent years, there were waning repetitions of the display, as if through the gradual thinning out of the meteoric supply. The extreme irregularity of its distribution was noted by Olbers in 1837, who conjectured that we might have to wait until 1867 to see the phenomenon renewed on its former scale of magnificence. This was the first hint of a 33- or 34-year period. The falling stars of November did not alone attract the attention of the learned, Similar appearances were traditionally associated with August 10 by the popular phrase in which they figured as the tears of St. Lawrence. But the association could not be taken on trust from medieval authority. It had to be proved scientifically, and this Quetelet of Brussels succeeded in doing in December 1836. A second meteoric revolving system was thus shown to exist, but its establishment was at once perceived to be fatal to the cosmical cloud hypothesis of Olmsted. 
for if it be a violation of probability to attribute to one such agglomeration a period of an exact year, or sub-multiple of a year, it would be plainly absurd to suppose the movements of two or more regulated by such highly artificial conditions. An alternative was proposed by Adolf Ehrmann of Berlin in 1839. No longer in clouds, but in closed rings, he supposed meteoric matter to revolve around the sun. Thus, the mere circumstance of intersection by a meteoric of the terrestrial orbit, without any coincidence of period, would account for the Earth meeting some members of the system at each annual passage through the node or point of intersection. This was an important step in advance, yet it decided nothing as to the forms of the orbits of such annular assemblages, nor was it followed up in any direction for a quarter of a century. Hubert A. Newton took up in 1864 the dropped thread of inquiry. The son of a mathematical mother, he attained, at the age of twenty-five, to the dignity of professor of mathematics in Yale University, and occupied the post until his death in 1896. The diversion of his powers, however, from purely abstract studies, stimulated their effective exercise, and constituted him one of the founders of meteoric astronomy. A search through old records carried the November phenomenon back to the year 902 A.D., long distinguished as the Year of the Stars, for in the same night in which Teramina was captured by the Saracens and the cruel Aglabite tyrant Ibrahim ibn Abed died, by the judgment of God, before Cosenza, stars fell from heaven in such abundance as to amaze and terrify beholders far and near. This was on October 13th, and recurrences were traced down through subsequent centuries, always with a day's delay in about seventy years. It was easy, too, to derive from the dates a cycle of thirty-three and a quarter years, so that Professor Newton did not hesitate to predict the exhibition of an unusually striking meteoric spectacle on November 13 through 14, 1866. For the astronomical explanation of the phenomena, recourse was had to a method introduced by Ehrmann of computing meteoric orbits. It was found, however, that conspicuous recurrences every 33 or 34 years could be explained on the supposition of five widely different periods, combined with varying degrees of extension in the revolving group. Professor Newton himself gave the preference to the shortest of 354 and a half days, but indicated the means of deciding with certainty upon the true one. It was furnished by the advancing motion of the node, or that day's delay of the November shower every seventy years, which the old chronicles had supplied data for detecting. For this is a strictly measurable effect of gravitational disturbance by the various planets, the amount of which naturally depends upon the course pursued by the disturbed bodies. Here, the great mathematical resources of Professor Adams were brought to bear. By laborious processes of calculation, he ascertained that four out of Newton's five possible periods were entirely incompatible with the observed nodal displacement, while for the fifth, that of thirty-three and a quarter years, a perfectly harmonious result was obtained. This was the last link in the chain of evidence proving that the November meteors, or Leonids, as they had by that time come to be called, revolve round the sun in a period of thirty-three point two seven years, in an ellipse spanning the vast gulf between the orbits of the Earth and Uranus, the group being so extended as to occupy nearly three years in defiling past the scene of terrestrial encounters. But before it was completed in March 1867, the subject had assumed a new aspect and importance. Professor Newton's prediction of a remarkable star shower in November 1866 was punctually fulfilled. This time, Europe served as the main target of the celestial projectiles, and observers were numerous and forewarned. The display, although according to Mr. Baxendale's memory inferior to that of 1833, was of extraordinary impressiveness. Dense crowds of meteors, equal in luster to the brightest stars, and some rivaling Venus at her best, darted from east to west across the sky with enormous apparent velocities, 
and with a certain determinateness of aim, as if let fly with a purpose and at some definite object. Nearly all left behind them trains of emerald green or clear blue light, which occasionally lasted many minutes before they shriveled and curled up out of sight. The maximum rush occurred a little after one o'clock on the morning of November 14th, when attempts to count were overpowered by frequency. But during a previous interval of seven minutes five seconds, four observers at Mr. Bishop's observatory at Twickenham reckoned 514, and during an hour, 1,120. Before daylight, the Earth had fairly cut her way through the star-bearing stratum, the ethereal rockets had ceased to fly. This event brought the subject of shooting stars once more vividly to the notice of astronomers. Schiaparelli had, indeed, been already attracted by it. The results of his studies were made known in four remarkable letters addressed, before the close of the year 1866, to Father Secchi and published in the Bulletino of the Roman Observatory. Their upshot was to show in the first place, that meteors possess a real velocity considerably greater than that of the Earth, and travel, accordingly, to enormously greater distances from the Sun along tracks resembling those of comets in being very eccentric, in lying at all levels indifferently, and in being pursued in either direction. It was next inferred that comets and meteors equally have an origin foreign to the solar system, but are drawn into it temporarily by the sun's attraction, and occasionally fixed in it by the backward pull of some planet. But the crowning fact was reserved for the last. It was the astonishing one that the August meteors move in the same orbit with the bright comet of 1862, that the comet, in fact, is but a larger member of the family named Perseids, because their radiant point is situated in the constellation Perseus. This discovery was quickly capped by others of the same kind. Le Verrier published, January 21, 1867, Elements for the November Swarm, founded on the most recent and authentic observations, at once identified by Dr. C. F. W. Peters of Altona with Apolzer's Elements for Temple's Comet of 1866. A few days later, Schiaparelli, having recalculated the orbit of the meteors from improved data, arrived at the same conclusion, while Professor Weiss of Vienna pointed to the agreement between the orbits of a comet which had appeared in 1861 and of a star shower found to recur on April 20th, Lyraides, as well as between those of Biela's comet and certain conspicuous meteors of November 28th. These instances do not seem to be exceptional. The number of known or suspected accordances of cometary tracks with meteor streams contained in a list drawn up in 1878 by Professor Alexander S. Herschel, who has made the subject peculiarly his own, amounts to 76. Although the four first detected still remain the most conspicuous, and perhaps the only absolutely sure examples of a relation as significant as it was, to most astronomers, unexpected. There had indeed been anticipatory ideas, not that Kepler's comparison of shooting stars to minute comets or Maskelyne's Forza Risotere Che Essi Sono Comita in a letter to the Abate Cesaris, December 12, 1774, need count for much. But Chladni in 1819 considered both to be fragments or particles of the same primitive matter irregularly scattered through space as nebulae, and Morstadt of Prague suggested about 1837 that the meteors of November might be dispersed atoms from the tail of Biela's comet, the path of which is cut across by the earth near that epoch. Professor Kirkwood, however, by a luminous intuition, penetrated the whole secret so far as it has yet been made known. In an article published, or rather buried, in the Danville Quarterly Review for December 1861, he argued from the observed division of Biela and other less noted instances of the same kind that the sun exercises a divalent influence on the nuclei of comets, which may be presumed to continue its action 
until their corporate existence, so to speak, ends in complete pulverization. May not, he continued, our periodic meteors be the debris of ancient but now disintegrated comets whose matter has become distributed round their orbits? The gist of Schiaparelli's discovery could not be more clearly conveyed, for it must be borne in mind that with the ultimate destiny of comets' tails this had nothing to do. The tenuous matter composing them is, no doubt, permanently lost to the body from which it emanated, but science does not pretend to track its further wanderings through space. It can, however, state categorically that these will no longer be conducted along the paths forsaken under solar compulsion. From the central and probably solid parts of comets, on the other hand, are derived the granules by the swift passage of which our skies are seamed with periodic fires. It is certain that a loosely agglomerated mass, such as cometary nuclei most likely are, must gradually separate through the unequal action of gravity on its various parts, through, in short, solar tidal influence. Thenceforward, its fragments will revolve independently in parallel orbits, at first as a swarm, finally, when time has been given for the full effects of the lagging of the slower-moving particles to develop, as a closed ring. The first condition is still, more or less, that of the November meteors. Those of August have already arrived at the second. For this reason, Le Verrier pronounced, in 1867, the Perseid to be of the older formation than the Leonid system. He even assigned a date at which the introduction of the last named bodies into their present orbit was probably effected through the influence of Uranus. In 126 AD, a close approach must have taken place between the planet and the parent comet of the November stars, after which its regular returns to perihelion and the consequent process of its disintegration set in. Though not complete, it is already far advanced. The view that meteorites are the dust of decaying comets was now to be put to a definite test of prediction. Biela's comet had not been seen since its duplicate return in 1852, yet it had been carefully watched for with the best telescopes. Its path was accurately known. Every perturbation it could suffer was scrupulously taken into account. Under these circumstances, its repeated failure to come up to time might fairly be thought to imply a cessation from visible existence. Might it not, however, be possible that it would appear under another form? that a star shower might have sprung from and would commemorate its dissolution? End of Part 2, Chapter 10, Recent Comets, Part 1 Recording by Aaron Carlo in San Clemente, California Part 2, Chapter 10, Recent Comets, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Carlo, San Clemente, California. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clark. Recent Comets, Part 2. An unusually large number of falling stars were seen by Borondes, December 6, 1798. Similar displays were noticed in the years 1830, 1838, and 1847, and the point from which they emanated was shown by Heiss at Aix-la-Chapelle to be situated near the bright star Gamma Andromeda. Now, this is precisely the direction in which the orbit of Biela's comet would seem to lie as it runs down to cut the terrestrial track very near the place of the Earth at the above dates. The inference was, then, an easy one, that the meteors were pursuing the same path with the comet, and it was separately arrived at early in 1867 by Weiss, D'Arrest, and Gala. But Biela travels in the opposite direction to Temple's comet and its attendant Leonids. Its motion is direct, or from west to east, while theirs is retrograde. Consequently, 
the motion of its node is in the opposite direction too. In other words, the meeting place of its orbit with that of the Earth retreats, and very rapidly, along the ecliptic instead of advancing. So that if the Andromedes stood in the supposed intimate relation to Biela's comet, they might be expected to anticipate the times of their occurrence by as much as a week in half a century. All doubt as to the fact may be said to have been removed by Signor Tezzioli's observation of the annual shower in more than usual abundance at Bergamo, November 30th, 1867. The missing comet was next due at perihelion in the year 1872, and the probability was contemplated by both Weiss and Gala of its being replaced by a copious discharge of falling stars. The precise date of the occurrence was not easily determinable, but Gala thought the chances in favor of November 28th. The event anticipated the prediction by 24 hours. Scarcely had the sun set in Western Europe on November 27th when it became evident that Biela's comet was shedding over us the pulverized products of its disintegration. The meteors came in volleys from the foot of the chained lady, their numbers at times baffling the attempt to keep a reckoning. At Moncarlieri, about 8 p.m., they constituted, as Father Densa said, a real rain of fire. Four observers counted, on an average, 400 each minute and a half, and not a few fireballs, equaling the moon in diameter, traversed the sky. On the whole, however, the stars of 1872, though about equally numerous, were less brilliant than those of 1866. The phosphorescent tracks marking their passage were comparatively evanescent and their movements sluggish. This is easily understood when we remember that the Andromedes overtake the Earth while the Leonids rush to meet it. The velocity of encounter for the first class of bodies being under 12, for the second above 44 miles a second. The spectacle was, nevertheless, magnificent. It presented itself successively to various parts of the Earth, from Bombay and the Mauritius to New Brunswick and Venezuela, and was most diligently and extensively observed. Here it had well nigh terminated by midnight. It was attended by a slight aurora, and although Tacchini had telegraphed that the state of the sun rendered some show of polar lights probable, it has too often figured as an accompaniment of star showers to permit the coincidence to rank as fortuitous. Admiral Wrangel was accustomed to describe how, during the prevalence of an aurora on the Siberian coast, the passage of a meteor never failed to extend the luminosity to parts of the sky previously dark and an enhancement of electrical disturbance may well be associated with the flittings of such cosmical atoms. A singular incident connected with the meteors of 1872 has now to be recounted. The late Professor Klinkenfuss, who had observed them very completely at Göttingen, was led to believe that not merely the debris strewn along its path, but the comet itself must have been in immediate proximity to the Earth during their appearance. If so, it might be possible, he thought, to descry it as it retreated in the diametrically opposite direction from that in which it had approached. On November 30th, accordingly, he telegraphed to Mr. Pogson, the Madras astronomer, Biela touched Earth November 27th, Search near Theta Centauri, the anti-radiant, as it is called, being situated close to that star. Bad weather prohibited observation during 36 hours, but when the rain clouds broke on the morning of December 2nd, there a comet was, just in the indicated position. In appearance, it might have passed well enough for one of the Biela twins. It had no tail, but a decided nucleus, and was about forty-five seconds across, being thus altogether below the range of naked-eye discernment. It was again observed, December 3rd, when a short tail was perceptible, but overcast skies supervened, and it has never since been seen. Its identity, accordingly, remains in doubt. It seems tolerably certain, however, that it was not the lost comet which ought to have passed that spot twelve weeks earlier, and was subject to no conceivable disturbance capable of delaying to that extent 
its revolution. On the other hand, there is the strongest likelihood that it belonged to the same system, that it was a third fragment torn from the parent body of the Andromedes at a period anterior to our first observations of it. In thirteen years, Biela's comet, or its relics, travels nearly twice round its orbit, so that a renewal of the meteoric shower of 1872 was looked for on the same day of the year 1885, the probability being emphasized by an admonitory circular from Dunecht. Astronomers were accordingly on the alert and were not disappointed. In England, observation was partially impeded by clouds, but at Malta, Palermo, Beirut, and other southern stations, the scene was most striking. The meteors were both larger and more numerous than in 1872. Their numbers in the densest part of the drift were estimated by Professor Newton at 75,000 per hour, visible from one spot to so large a group of spectators that practically none could be missed. Yet each of these multitudinous little bodies was found by him to travel in a clear cubical space of which the edge measured 20 miles. Thus the dazzling effects of a luminous throng was produced without jostling or overcrowding by particles. It might also be said isolated in the void. Their aspect was strongly characteristic of the Andromeda family of meteors. They invariably, Mr. Denning wrote, traversed short paths with very slow motions and became extinct in evolved streams of yellowish sparks. The conclusion seemed obvious that these meteors are formed of very soft materials which expand while incalescent and are immediately crumbled and dissipated into exiguous dust. The Biela meteors of 1885 did not merely gratify astronomers with a fulfilled prediction, but were the means of communicating to them some valuable information. Although their main body was cut through by the moving Earth in six hours and was not more than 100,000 miles across, skirmishers were thrown out to nearly a million miles on either side of the compact central battalions. Members of the system were, on the 26th of November, recorded by Mr. Denning at the hourly rate of about 130, and they did not wholly cease to be visible until December 1st. They afforded, besides, a particularly well-marked example of that diffuseness of radiation previously observed in some less conspicuous displays. Their paths seemed to diverge from an area rather than from a point in the sky. They came so ill to focus that divergences of several degrees were found between the most authentically determined radiance. These incongruities are attributed by Professor Newton to the irregular shape of the meteoroids producing unsymmetrical resistance from the air, and hence causing them to glance from their original direction on entering it. Thus, their luminous tracks did not always represent, even apart from the effects of the Earth's attraction, the true prolongation of their course through space. The Andromedes of 1872 were laggards behind the comet from which they sprang, those of 1885 were its avant couriers. That wasted and disrupted body was not due at the node until January 26, 1886, sixty days, that is, after the Earth's encounter with its meteoric fragments. These are now probably scattered over more than 500 million miles of its orbits. Yet Professor Newton considers that all must have formed one compact group with Biela at the time of its close approach to Jupiter about the middle of 1841, for otherwise both comet and meteorites could not have experienced, as they seem to have done, the same kind and amount of disturbance. The rapidity of cometary disintegration is thus curiously illustrated. A short-lived persuasion that the missing heavenly body itself had been recovered was created by Mr. Edwin Holmes's discovery, at London, November 6, 1892, of a tolerably bright, tailless comet, just in a spot which Biela's comet must have traversed in approaching the intersection of its orbit with that of the Earth. A hasty calculation by Beberich assigned elements to the newcomer seemingly not only to ratify the identity, but to promise a quasi-encounter with the Earth on November 21st. 
The only effect of the prediction, however, was to raise a panic among the Negroes of the southern states of America. The comet quietly ignored it, and moved away from, instead of towards, the appointed meeting place. Its projection, then, on the night of its discovery, upon a point of the Biela orbit, was by a mere caprice of chance. North America, nevertheless, was visited on November 23rd by a genuine Andromeda shower. Although the meteors were less numerous than in 1885, Professor Young estimated that 30,000 at the least of their orange fire streaks came, during five hours, within the range of view at Princeton. Bredichin estimated the width of the space containing them at about 2,700,000 miles. The anticipation of their due time by four days implied, if they were a prolongation of the main Biela group, the nucleus of which passed the spot of encounter five months previously, a recession of the node since 1885 by no less than three degrees. Unless, indeed, Mr. Denning were right in supposing the display to have proceeded from an associated branch of the main swarm through which we passed in 1872 and 1885. The existence of separated detachments of Biela meteors due to disturbing planetary action was contemplated as highly probable by Schiaparelli. Such may have been the belated flights met with in 1830, 1838, 1841, and 1847, and such the advance flight plunged through in 1892. A shower looked for November 23, 1899, did not fall, and no further display from this quarter is probable until November 17, 1905, although one is possible a year earlier. The Leonids, through the adverse influence of Jupiter and Saturn, inflicted upon multitudes of eager watchers a still more poignant disappointment. A dense part of the swarm, having nearly completed a revolution since 1866, should, traveling normally, have met the Earth November 15, 1899. In point of fact, it swerved sunward, and the millions of meteorites which would otherwise have been sacrificed for the illumination of our skies escaped a fiery doom. The contingency had been forecast in the able calculations of Dr. Johnstone Stoney and Dr. A. M. W. Downing, superintendent of the Nautical Almanac Office, but the verification scarcely compensated the failure. Nor was the situation retrieved in the following years. Only ragged fringes of the great tempest cloud here and there touched our globe. As the same investigators warned us to expect, the course of the meteorites had been not only rendered sinuous by perturbation, but also broken and irregular. We can no longer count upon the Leonids. Their glory, for scenic purposes, is departed. The comet associated with them also evaded observation. Although it doubtless kept its tryst with the sun in the spring of 1899, the attendant circumstances were too unfavorable to allow it to be seen from the Earth. By an almost fantastic coincidence, nevertheless, a faint comet was photographed November 14, 1898, by Dr. Chase of the Yale College Observatory, close to the Leonid Radiant, whither a meteorograph was directed with a view to recording trails left by precursors of the main Leonid body. A promising start, too, was made on the same occasion with meteoric researches from sensitive plates. Indeed, Schäberle and Colton had already, in 1896, determined the height of a Leonid by means of photographs taken at stations on different ridges of Mount Hamilton, and Professor Pickering has prosecuted similar work at Harvard, with encouraging results. Everything in this branch of science depends upon how far they can be carried. Without the meteorograph, rigid accuracy in the observation of shooting stars is unattainable, and rigid accuracy is the sine qua non for obtaining exact knowledge. Biela does not offer the only example of cometary disruption. Setting aside the unauthentic reports of early chroniclers, we meet the double comet discovered by Liet at Olinda, Brazil, February 27, 1860, of which the division appeared recent and about to be carried farther. But a division once established, separation must continually progress. 
the periodic times of the fragments will never be identical. One must drop a little behind the other at each revolution, until at length they come to travel in remote parts of nearly the same orbit. Thus the comet predicted by Klinkerfus and discovered by Pogson had already lagged to the extent of twelve weeks, and we shall meet instances farther on where the retardation is counted not by weeks, but by years. Here original identity emerges only from calculation and comparison of orbits. Comets, then, die, as Kepler wrote long ago, sicut bombisis filo fundendo. This certainty, anticipated by Kirkwood in 1861, we have at least acquired from the discovery of their generative connection with meteors. Nay, their actual materials become, in smaller or larger proportions, incorporated with our globe. It is not, indeed, universally admitted that the ponderous masses of which, according to Dabre's estimate, at least 600 fall annually from space upon the Earth, ever formed part of the bodies known to us as comets. Some follow Chermak in attributing to aerolites a totally different origin from that of periodical shooting stars. That no clear line of demarcation can be drawn is no valid reason for asserting that no real distinction exists. And it is certainly remarkable that a meteoric fusillade may be kept up for hours without a single solid projectile reaching its destination. It would seem as if the celestial army had been supplied with blank cartridges. Yet, since a few detonating meteors have been found to proceed from ascertained radiance of shooting stars, it is difficult to suppose that any generic difference separates them. Their assimilation is further urged, though not with any demonstrative force, by two instances, the only two on record, of the tangible descent of an aerolite during the progress of a star shower. On April 4, 1095, the Saxon Chronicle informs us that stars fell so thickly that no man could count them, and adds that one of them having struck the ground in France, a bystander cast water upon it, which was raised in steam with a great noise of boiling. And again, on November 27, 1885, while the skirts of the Andromeda tempest were trailing over Mexico, a ball of fire was precipitated from the sky at Mazapil within view of a ranchman. Scientific examination proved it to be a siderite, or mass of nickel iron. Its weight exceeded eight pounds, and it contained many nodules of graphite. We are not, however, authorized by the circumstances of its arrival to regard the Mazapil fragment of cosmic metal as a specimen torn from Biela's comet. In this, as in the preceding case, the coincidence of the fall with the shower may have been purely causal since no hint is given of any sort of agreement between the tracks followed by the sample provided for curious study, and the swarming meteors consumed in the upper air. Professor Newton's inquiries into the tracks pursued by meteorites previous to their collisions with the Earth tend to distinguish them, at least specifically, from shooting stars. He found that nearly all had been traveling with a direct movement in orbits, the perihelia of which lay in the outer half of the space separating the Earth from the Sun. Shooting stars, on the contrary, are entirely exempt from such limitations. The Yale professor concluded that the larger meteorites moving in our solar system are allied much more closely with the group of comets of short period than with the comets whose orbits are nearly parabolic. They would thus seem to be more at home than might have been expected amid the planetary family. Father Carbonell has, moreover, shown that meteorites, if explosion products of the Earth or Moon, should, with rare exceptions, follow just the kind of paths assigned to them from data of observation by Professor Newton. Yet it is altogether improbable that projectiles from terrestrial volcanoes should, at any geological epoch, have received impulses powerful enough to enable them not only to surmount the Earth's gravity, but to penetrate its atmosphere. A striking, indeed an almost startling, peculiarity, on the other hand, 
divides from their congeners a class of meteors identified by Mr. Denning during ten years' patient watching of such phenomena at Bristol. These are described as meteors with stationary radiance, since for months together they seem to come from the same fixed points in the sky. Now, this implies quite a portentous velocity. The direction of meteor radiance is affected by a kind of aberration analogous to the aberration of light. It results from a composition of terrestrial with meteoric motion. Hence, unless that of the Earth in its orbit be, by comparison, insignificant, the visual line of encounter must shift, if not perceptibly from day to day, at any rate conspicuously from month to month. The fixity, then, of many systems observed by Mr. Denning seems to demand the admission that their members travel so fast as to throw the Earth's movement completely out of the account. The required velocity would be, by Mr. Raynard's calculation, at least 880 miles a second, but the aspect of the meteors justifies no such extravagant assumption. Their seeming swiftness is very various, and what is highly significant, it is notably less when they pursue than when they meet the Earth. Yet the incredible and unaccountable fact of the existence of these long radiants, although doubted by Tisserand because of its theoretical refractoriness, must apparently be admitted. The first plausible explanation of them was offered by Professor Turner in 1899. They represent, in his view, the cumulative effects of the Earth's attraction. The validity of his reasoning is, however, denied by Monsieur Berlichin, who prefers to regard them as a congeries of separate streams. The enigma they present has evidently not yet received its definitive solution. The Perseids afford, on the contrary, a remarkable instance of a shifting radiant. Mr. Denning's observations of these yellowish leisurely meteors extend over nearly six weeks, from July 8th to August 16th, the point of radiation meantime progressing no less than 57 degrees in right ascension. Doubts as to their common origin were hence freely expressed, especially by Mr. Monk of Dublin. But the late Dr. Kleiber showed, by strict geometrical reasoning, that the 49 radiants successively determined for the shower were all, in fact, comprised within one narrowly limited region of space. In other words, the application of the proper correction for the terrestrial movement and the effects of attraction by which each individual shooting star is compelled to describe a hyperbola around the Earth's center reduces the extended line of radiance to a compact group with the cometary radiant for its central point, the cometary radiant being the spot in the sky met by a tangent to the orbit of the Perseid comet of 1862 at its intersection with the orbit of the Earth. The reality of the connection between the comet and the meteors could scarcely be more clearly proved, while the vast dimensions of the stream into which the latter are found to be diffused cannot but excite astonishment not unmixed with perplexity. The first successful application of the spectroscope to comets was by Donati in 1864. A comet discovered by Temple, July 4th, brightened until it appeared like a star somewhat below the second magnitude with a feeble tail 30 degrees in length. It was remarkable as having, on August 7th, almost totally eclipsed a small star, a very rare occurrence. On August 5th, Donati admitted its light through his train of prisms and found it, thus analyzed, to consist of three bright bands, yellow, green, and blue, separated by wider, dark intervals. This implied a good deal. Comets had previously been considered, as we have seen, to shine mainly, if not wholly, by reflected sunlight. They were now perceived to be self-luminous and to be formed, to a large extent, of glowing gas. The next step was to determine what kind of gas it was that was thus glowing in them, and this was taken by Sir William Huggins in 1868. A comet of subordinate brilliancy, known as Comet 1868-2, or sometimes as Vinica's, was the subject of his experiment. 
on comparing its spectrum with that of an oleophant gas vacuum tube rendered luminous by electricity, he found the agreement exact. It has since been abundantly confirmed. All the 18 comets tested by light analysis between 1868 and 1880 showed the typical hydrocarbon spectrum common to the whole group of those compounds, but probably due immediately to the presence of acetylene. Some minor deviations from the laboratory pattern in the shifting of the maxima of light from the edge towards the middle of the yellow and blue bands have been experimentally reproduced by Vogel and Hasselberg in tubes containing a mixture of carbonic oxide with oleophant gas. Their illumination by disruptive electric discharges was, however, a condition sine qua non for the exhibition of the cometary type of spectrum. When a continuous current was employed, the carbonic oxide bands asserted themselves to the exclusion of the hydrocarbons. The distinction has great significance as regards the nature of comets. Of particular interest in this connection is the circumstance that carbonic oxide is one of the gases evolved by meteoric stones and irons under stress of heat. For it must apparently have formed part of an aeriform mass in which they were immersed at an early stage of their history. In a few exceptional comets, the usual carbon bands have been missed. Two such were observed by Sir William Huggins in 1866 and 1867, respectively. In each, a green ray, approximating in position to the fundamental nebular line, crossed an otherwise unbroken spectrum. And Holmes's comet of 1892 displayed only a faint prismatic band devoid of any characteristic feature. Now these three might well be set down as partially effete bodies, but a brilliant comet, visible in southern latitudes in April and May 1901, so far resembled them in the quality of its light as to give a spectrum mainly, if not purely, continuous. This, accordingly, is no symptom of decay. The earliest comet of first-class luster to present itself for spectroscopic examination was that discovered by Coggia at Marseille, April 17, 1874. Invisible to the naked eye till June, it blazed out in July a splendid ornament of our northern skies with a just perceptibly curved tail reaching more than halfway from the horizon to the zenith and a nucleus surpassing in brilliancy the brightest stars in the swan. Bredichin, Fogel, and Huygens were unanimous in pronouncing its spectrum to be that of marsh or oleophant gas. Father Secchi, in the clear sky of Rome, was able to push the identification even closer than had heretofore been done. The complete hydrocarbon spectrum consists of five zones of variously colored light. Three of these only, the three central ones, had till then been obtained from comets, owing, it was supposed, to their temperature not being high enough to develop the others. The light of Kogia's comet, however, was found to contain all five traces of the violet band emerging June 4th, of the red July 2nd. Presumably, all five would show universally in cometary spectra, were the dispersed rays strong enough to enable them to be seen. The gaseous surroundings of comets are, then, largely made up of a compound of hydrogen with carbon. Other materials are also present, but the hydrocarbon element is probably unfailing and predominant. Its luminosity is, there is little doubt, an effect of electrical excitement. Zollner showed in 1872 that, owing to evaporation and other changes produced by rapid approach to the sun, electrical processes of considerable intensity must take place in comets, and that their original light is immediately connected with these and depends upon solar radiation rather through its direct or indirect electrifying effects than through its more obvious thermal power, may be considered a truth permanently acquired to science. They are not, it thus seems, bodies incandescent through heat, but glowing by electricity, and this is compatible under certain circumstances with a relatively low temperature. The gaseous spectrum of comets is accompanied, in varying degrees, by a continuous spectrum. 
This is usually derived most strongly from the nucleus, but extends more or less to the nebulous appendages. In part, it is certainly due to reflected sunlight, in part most likely to the ignition of minute solid particles. End of Part 2, Chapter 10, Recent Comets, Part 2 Recording by Aaron Carlo in San Clemente, California. Part 2, Chapter 11 of A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Carlo in San Clemente, California. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clark. Part 2, Chapter 11, Part 1. Recent Comets. Continued. The mystery of comets' tails had been to some extent penetrated, so far, at least, that by making certain assumptions strongly recommended by the facts of the case, their forms can be, with very approximate precision, calculated beforehand. We have, then, the assurance that these extraordinary appendages are composed of no ethereal or supersensual stuff, but of matter such as we know it, and subject to the ordinary laws of motion, though in a state of extreme tenuity. Olbers, as already stated, originated in 1812 the view that the tails of comets are made up of particles subject to a force of electrical repulsion proceeding from the sun. It was developed and enforced by Bessel's discussion of the appearances presented by Halley's comet in 1835. He, moreover, provided a formula for computing the movement of a particle under the influence of a repulsive force of any given intensity, and thus laid firmly the foundation of a mathematical theory of cometary emanations. Professor W. A. Norton of Yale College considerably improved this by inquiries begun in 1844 and resumed on the apparition of Donati's comet, and Dr. C. F. Pape at Altena gave numerical values of the impulses outward from the sun, which must have actuated the materials respectively of the curved and straight tails adorning the same beautiful and surprising object. The physical theory of repulsion, however, was, it might be said, still in the air. Nor did it even begin to assume consistency until Zona took it in hand in 1871. It is perfectly well ascertained that the energy of the push or pull produced by electricity depends, other things being the same, upon the surface of the body acted on, that of gravity upon its mass. The efficacy of solar electrical repulsion relatively to solar gravitational attraction grows, consequently, as the size of the particle diminishes. Make this small enough and it will virtually cease to gravitate, and will unconditionally obey the impulse to recession. This principle, Zöllner, was the first to realize in its application to comets. It gives the key to their constitution. Admitting that the sun and they are similarly electrified, their more substantially aggregated parts will still follow the solicitation of his gravity, while the finely divided particles escaping from them will, simply by reason of their minuteness, fall under the sway of his repellent electric power. They will, in other words, form tails. Nor is any extravagant assumption called for as to the intensity of the electrical charge concerned in producing these effects. Zollner, in fact, showed that it need not be higher than that attributed by the best authorities to the terrestrial surface. Forty years have elapsed since M. Bredekin, director successively of the Moscow and the Polkova observatories, turned his attention to these curious phenomena. His persistent inquiries on the subject, however, date from the appearance of Kogia's comet in 1874. On computing the value of the repulsive force exerted in the formation of its tail, 
and comparing it with the values of the same force arrived at by him in 1862 for some other conspicuous comets, it struck him that the numbers representing them fell into three well-defined classes. This idea was confirmed on further investigation. In 1882, the appendages of 36 well-observed comets had been reconstructed theoretically, without a single exception being met with to the rule of the three types. A further study of 40 comets led, in 1885, only to a modification of the numerical results previously arrived at. In the first of these, the repellent energy of the sun is 14 times stronger than his attractive energy. The particles forming the enormously long straight rays projected outward from this kind of comet leave the nucleus with a mean velocity of just 7 kilometers per second, which, becoming constantly accelerated, carries them in a few days to the limit of visibility. The great comets of 1811, 1843, and 1861, that of 1744, so far as its principal tail was concerned, and Halley's Comet at its various apparitions, belonged to this class. Less narrow limits were assigned to the values of the repulsive force employed to produce the second type. For the axis of the tail, it exceeds by one-tenth the power of solar gravity. For the anterior edge, it is more than twice, for the posterior only half as strong. The corresponding initial velocity, for the axis, is 1500 meters a second, and the resulting appendage, a scimitar-like or plumy tail, such as Donati's and Cogia's comets furnished splendid examples of. Tails of the third type are constructed with forces of repulsion from the sun, ranging from one-tenth to three-tenths that of his gravity, producing an accelerated movement of attenuated matter from the nucleus, beginning at the leisurely rate of 300 to 600 meters a second. They are short, strongly bent, brush-like emanations, and in bright comets seem to be only found in combination with tails of the higher classes. Multiple tails, indeed, that is, tails of different types emitted simultaneously by one comet, are perceived, as experience advances and observation becomes closer, to be rather the rule than the exception. Now, what is the meaning of these three types? Is any translation of them into physical fact possible? To this question, Bredechin supplied, in 1879, a plausible answer. It was already a current surmise that multiple tails are composed of different kinds of matter, differently acted on by the sun. Both Olbers and Bessel had suggested this explanation of the straight and curved emanations from the comet of 1807. Norton had applied it to the faint light tracks proceeding from that of Donati, Winnicky to the varying deviations of its more brilliant plumage. Bredechin defined and ratified the conjecture. He undertook to determine, provisionally as yet, the several kinds of matter appropriated severally to the three classes of tails. These he found to be hydrogen for the first, hydrocarbons for the second, and iron for the third. The ground for this apportionment is that the atomic weights of these substances bear to each other the same inverse proportion as the repulsive forces employed in producing the appendages they are supposed to form. And Zollner had pointed out in 1875 that the heliofugal power by which comets' tails are developed would, in fact, be effective just in that ratio. Hydrogen, as the lightest known element, that is, the least under the influence of gravity, was naturally selected as that which yielded most readily to the counter-persuasions of electricity. Hydrocarbons had been shown by the spectroscope to be present in comets, and were fitted by their specific weight, as compared with that of hydrogen, to form tails of the second type. While the atoms of iron were just heavy enough to compose those of the third, and, from the plentifulness of their presence in meteorites, might be presumed to enter in no inconsiderable proportion into the mass of comets. These three substances, however, were by no means supposed to be the sole constituents of the appendages in question. On the contrary, 
the great breadth of what, for the present, were taken to be characteristically iron tails, were attributed to the presence of many kinds of matter of high and slightly different specific weights, while the expanded plume of Donati was shown to be, in reality, a whole system of tails made up of many substances, each spreading into a separate hollow cone, more or less deviating from, and partially superposed upon the others. Yet these felicities of explanation must not make us forget that the chemical composition attributed to the first type of cometary trains has, so far, received no countenance from the spectroscope. The emission lines of free incandescent hydrogen have never been derived from any part of these bodies. Dissentient opinions, accordingly, were expressed as to the cause of their structural peculiarities. Rainyard, Zenker, and others advocated the agency of heat repulsion in producing them. Care somewhat obscurely explains them through the evolution of gases by colliding particles. Hertz of Vienna concludes tails to be more illusory appendages produced by electrical discharges through the rare medium assumed to fill space. But Hearn conclusively showed that no such medium could possibly exist without promptly bringing ruin upon our daedal earth and its revolving companions. On the whole, modern researches tend to render superfluous the chemical diversities postulated by Bredichin. Electricity alone seems competent to produce the varieties of cometary emanation they were designed to account for. The distinction of types rests on a solid basis of fact, but probably depends upon differences rather in the mode of action than in the kind of substance acted upon. Suggestive sketches of electrical and light pressure theories of comets have been published respectively by Mr. Fessenden of Allegheny and by M. Arrhenius at Stockholm. Although evidently of a tentative character, they possess great interest. Bredichin's hypothesis was promptly and profusely illustrated. Within three years of its promulgation, five bright comets made their appearance, each presenting some distinctly peculiarity by which knowledge of these curious objects was materially helped forward. The first of these is remembered as the Great Southern Comet. It was never visible in these latitudes, but made a short though stately progress through southern skies. Its earliest detection was at Cordoba on the last evening of January 1880, and it was seen on February 1st as a luminous streak extending just after sunset from the southwest horizon towards the pole in New South Wales at Montevideo and the Cape of Good Hope. The head was lost in the solar rays until February 4th, when Dr. Gould, then director of the National Observatory of the Argentine Republic at Cordoba, caught a glimpse of it very low in the west, and on the following evening Mr. Eddy, at Grahamstown, discovered a faint nucleus of a straw-colored tinge about the size of the annular nebula in Lyra. Its condensation, however, was very imperfect, and the whole apparition showed an exceedingly filmy texture. The tail was enormously long. On February 5th it extended, large perspective retrenchment notwithstanding, over an arc of fifty degrees, but its brightness nowhere exceeded that of the Milky Way in Taurus. There was little curvature perceptible, the edges of the appendage ran parallel, forming a nebulous causeway from star to star, and the comparison to an auroral beam was appropriately used. The aspect of the famous comet of 1843 was forcibly recalled to the memory of Mr. Janisch, governor of St. Helena, and the resemblance proved not merely superficial. But the comet of 1880 was less brilliant, and even more evanescent. After only eight days of visibility, it had faded so much as no longer to strike, though still discoverable by the unaided eye, and on February 20th it was invisible with the great Cordoba equatorial pointed to its known place. But the most astonishing circumstance connected with this body is the identity of its path with that of its predecessor in 1843. This is undeniable. 
Dr. Gould, Mr. Hind, and Dr. Copeland each computed a separate set of elements from the first rough observations, and each was struck with an agreement between the two orbits so close as to render them virtually indistinguishable. "'Can it be possible,' Mr. Hind wrote to Sir George Airy, "'that there is such a comet in the system, almost grazing the sun's surface in perihelion, and revolving in less than thirty-seven years?' I confess I feel a difficulty in admitting it, notwithstanding the above extraordinary resemblance of orbits. Mr. Hind's difficulty was shared by other astronomers. It would, indeed, be a violation of common sense to suppose that a celestial visitant so striking in appearance had been for centuries back an unnoticed frequenter of our skies. Various expedients, accordingly, were resorted to for getting rid of the anomaly. The most promising at first sight was that of the resisting medium. It was hard to believe that a body, largely vaporous, shooting past the sun at a distance of less than a hundred thousand miles from his surface, should have escaped powerful retardation. It must have passed through the very midst of the corona. It might easily have had an actual encounter with a prominence. Escape from such proximity might, indeed, very well have been judged beforehand to be impossible, even admitting no other kind of opposition than that dubiously supposed to have affected Enki's comet, the result in shortening the period ought to be of the most marked kind. It was proved by Opulzer that if the comet of 1843 had entered our system from stellar space with parabolic velocity, it would, by the action of a medium such as Enki postulated, varying in density inversely as the square of the distance from the sun, have been brought down by its first perihelion passage to elliptic movement in a period of twenty-four years, with such rapid diminution that its next return would be in about ten. But such restricted observations as were available on either occasion of its visibility gave no sign of such a rapid progress towards engulfment. Another form of the theory was advocated by Klinkerfus. He supposed that four returns of the same body had been witnessed within historical memory, the first in 371 BC, the next in 1668, besides those of 1843 and 1880, an original period of 2039 years being successively reduced by the withdrawal, at each perihelion passage, of one 1,320th of the velocity acquired by falling from the far extremity of its orbit towards the sun to 175 and 37 years. A continuance of the process would bring the comet of 1880 back in 1897. Unfortunately, the earliest of these apparitions cannot be identified with the recent ones unless by doing violence to the plain meaning of Aristotle's words in describing it. He states that the comet was first seen during the frosts and in the clear skies of winter, setting due west nearly at the same time as the sun. This implies some considerable north latitude, but the objects lately observed had practically no north latitude. They accomplished their entire course above the elliptic in two hours and a quarter, during which space they were barely separated a hand's breadth, one might say, from the sun's surface. For the purposes of the desired assimilation, Aristotle's comet should have appeared in March. It is not credible, however, that even a native of Thrace should have termed March winter. With the comet of 1668, the case seemed more dubious. The circumstances of its appearance are barely reconcilable with the identity attributed to it, although too vaguely known to render certainty one way or the other attainable. It might, however, be expected that recent observations would at least decide the questions whether the comet of 1843 could have returned in less than 37, and whether the comet of 1880 was to be looked for at the end of seventeen and a half years. But the truth is that both of these objects were observed over so small an arc, eight degrees and three degrees respectively, that their periods remained virtually undetermined. For while the shape and position of their orbits could be and were fixed with a very close approach to accuracy, 
the length of those orbits might vary enormously without any very sensible difference being produced in the small part of the curves traced out near the sun. Dr. Wilhelm Meyer, however, arrived by an elaborate discussion at a period of 37 years for the comet of 1880, while the observations of 1843 were, admittedly, best fitted by Hubbard's ellipse of 533 years. But these Dr. Meyer supposed to be affected by some constant source of error, such as would be produced by a mistaken estimate of the position of the comet's center of gravity. He inferred, finally, that, in spite of previous non-appearances, the two comets represented a single regular denizen of our system, returning once in thirty-seven years along an orbit of such extreme eccentricity that its movement might be described as one of precipitation towards and rapid escape from the sun, rather than of sedate circulation round it. The geometrical test of identity has hitherto been the only one which it was possible to apply to comets, and in the case before us it may fairly be said to have broken down. We may then, tentatively, and with much hesitation, try a physical test, though scarcely yet, properly speaking, available. We have seen that the comets of 1843 and 1880 were strikingly alike in general appearance, though the absence of a formed nucleus in the latter and its inferior brilliancy detracted from the convincing effect of the resemblance. Nor was it maintained when tried by exact methods of inquiry. M. Bredechin found that the gigantic raid emitted in 1843 belonged to his type number 1, that of 1880 to type number 2. The particles forming 1 were actuated by a repulsive force ten times as powerful as those forming the other. It is true that a second noticeable curved tail was seen in Chile, March 1st, and at Madras, March 11th, 1843, and the conjecture was accordingly hazarded that the materials composing on that occasion the principal appendage having become exhausted, those of the secondary one remaining predominant, and reappeared alone in the hydrocarbon train of 1880. But the one known instance in point is against such a supposition. Halley's Comet, the only great comet of which the returns have been securely authenticated and carefully observed, has preserved its type unchanged through many successive revolutions. The dilemma presented to astronomers by the Great Southern Comet of 1880 was unexpectedly renewed in the following year. On the 22nd of May, 1881, Mr. John Tebbett of Windsor, New South Wales, scanning the western sky, discerned a hazy-looking object which he felt sure was a strange one. A marine telescope at once resolved it into two small stars and a comet the latter of which quickly attracted the keen attention of astronomers. For Dr. Gould, computing its orbit from his first observations at Cordoba, found it to agree so closely with that arrived at by Bessel for the comet of 1807 that he telegraphed to Europe June 1st, announcing the unexpected return of that body. So unexpected that theoretically it was not possible before the year 3346 and Bessel's investigation was one which inspired and eminently deserved confidence. Here, then, once more, the perplexing choice had to be made between a premature and unaccountable reappearance and the admission of a plurality of comets moving nearly in the same path. But in this case, facts proved decisive. Tebbet's comet passed the sun June 16th at a distance of 68 millions of miles, and became visible in Europe six days later. It was, in the opinion of some, the finest object of the kind since 1861. In traversing the constellation Auriga on its debut in these latitudes, it outshone Capella. On June 24th and some subsequent nights, it was unmatched in its brilliancy by any star in the heavens. In the telescope, the two interlacing arcs of light which had adorned the head of Kogia's comet were reproduced, while a curious dorsal spine of strong illumination formed the axis of the tail, which extended in clear skies over an arc of twenty degrees. 
it belonged to the same type as Donati's great plume, the particles composing it being driven from the sun by a force twice as powerful as that urging them towards it. But the appendage was, for a few nights, and by two observers perceived to be double. Temple, on June 27th, and Louis Boss at Albany, New York, June 26 and 28, saw a long straight ray corresponding to a far higher rate of emission than the curved train, and shown by Bredichin to be a member of the so-called hydrogen class. It had vanished by July 1st, but made a temporary reappearance July 22nd. The appendages of this comet were of remarkable transparency. Small stars shone wholly undimmed across the tail, and a very nearly central transit of the head over one of the seventh magnitude on the night of June 29th produced, if any change, an increase of brilliancy in the object of this spontaneous experiment. Dr. Meyer, indeed, at the Geneva Observatory, detected apparent signs of refractive action upon rays thus transmitted, but his observations remain isolated and were presumably illusory. The track pursued by this comet gave peculiar advantages for its observation. Ascending from Ariga through Camelopardus, it stood, July 19th, on a line between the pointers and the pole within eight degrees of the latter, and thus remained for a lengthened period constantly above the horizon of northern observers. Its brightness, too, was no transient blaze, but had a lasting quality which enabled it to be kept steadily in view during nearly nine months. Visible to the naked eye until the end of August, the last telescopic observation of it was made February 14, 1882, when its distance from the Earth considerably exceeded 300 miles. Under these circumstances, the knowledge acquired of its orbit was of more than usual accuracy, and showed conclusively that the comet was not a simple return of Bessels, for this would involve a period of seventy-four years, whereas Tebbet's comet cannot revisit the sun until after the lapse of two and a half millenniums. Nevertheless, the twin bodies move so nearly in the same path that an original connection of some kind is obvious and the recent example of Biela readily suggested a conjecture as to what the nature of that connection might have been. The comets of 1807 and 1881 are, then, regarded with much probability as fragments of a primitive, disrupted body, one following in the wake of the other at an interval of seventy-four years. Imperfect photographs were taken of Donati's comet both in England and America, but Tebbet's comet was the first to which the process was satisfactorily applied. The difficulties to be overcome were very great. The chemical intensity of cometary light is, to begin with, extraordinarily small. Janssen estimated it at one three hundred thousandth of moonlight. Hence, if the ordinary process by which lunar photographs are taken had been applied to the comet of 1881, an exposure of at least three days would have been required in order to get an impression of the head with about a tenth part of the tail. But by that time, a new method of vastly increased sensitiveness had been rendered available, by which dried gelatin plates were substituted for the wet collodion plates hitherto in use. And this improvement alone reduced the necessary time of exposure to two hours. It was brought down to half an hour by Janssen's employment of a reflector, specially adapted, to give an image illuminated eight or ten times as strongly as that produced in the focus of an ordinary telescope. The photographic feebleness of cometary rays was not the only obstacle in the way of success. The proper motion of these bodies is so rapid as to render the usual devices for keeping a heavenly body steadily in view quite inapplicable. The machinery by which the diurnal movement of the sphere is followed must be especially modified to suit each eccentric career. This too was done, and on June 30, 1881, Janssen secured a perfect photograph of the brilliant object then visible, 
showing the structure of the tail with beautiful distinctness to a distance of two and a half degrees from the head. An impression to nearly ten degrees was obtained about the same time by Dr. Henry Draper at New York with an exposure of 162 minutes. Tebbets was also the first comet of which the spectrum was so much as attempted to be chemically recorded. Both Huygens and Draper were successful in this respect, but Huygens was more completely so. The importance of the feat consisted in its throwing open to investigation a part of the spectrum invisible to the eye, and so affording an additional test of cometary constitution. The result was fully to confirm the origin from carbon compounds assigned to the visible rays by disclosing additional bands belonging to the same series in the ultraviolet, as well as to establish unmistakably the presence of a not inconsiderable proportion of reflected solar light by the clear impression of some of the principal Fraunhofer lines. Thus, the polariscope was found to have told the truth, though not the whole truth. The photograph so satisfactorily communicative was taken by Sir William Huggins on the night of June 24th, and on the 29th at Greenwich, the tail-tail Fraunhofer lines were perceived to interrupt the visible range of the spectrum. This was at first so vividly continuous that the characteristic cometary bands could scarcely be detached from their bright background. But as the nucleus faded towards the end of June, they came out strongly and were more and more clearly seen, both at Greenwich and at Princeton, to agree not with the spectrum of hydrocarbons glowing in a vacuum tube, but with that of the same substances burning in a Bunsen flame. It need not, however, be inferred that cometary materials are really in a state of combustion. This, from all that we know, may be called an impossibility. The additional clue furnished was rather to the manner of their electrical illumination. The spectrum of the tail was, in this comet, found to be not essentially different from that of the head. Professor Wright of Yale College ascertained a large percentage of its light to be polarized in a plane passing through the sun, and hence to be reflected sunlight. A faint, continuous spectrum corresponded to this portion of its radiance, but gaseous emissions were also present. At Potsdam, on June 30th, the hydrocarbon bands were indeed traced by Fogel to the very end of the tail, and they were kept in sight by Young at a greater distance from the nucleus than the more equably dispersed light. There seems little doubt that, as in the solar corona, the relative strength of the two orders of spectra is subject to fluctuations. The comet of 1881-3 was thus of signal service to science. It afforded, when compared with the comet of 1807, the first undeniable example of two such bodies traveling so nearly in the same orbit as to leave absolutely no doubt of their existence of a genetic tie between them, and cometary spectroscopy made a notable advance by means of it. Before it was yet out of sight, it was provided with a successor. End of Part 2, Chapter 11, Part 1 Recording by Aaron Carlo in San Clemente, California Chapter 11 of A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Carlo, San Clemente, California. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clark. Recent Comets Continued. Part 2. At Ann Arbor Observatory, Michigan, on July 14th, a comet was discovered by Dr. Chevrolet, which, as his claim to priority is undisputed, is often allowed to bear his name, although designated in strict scientific parlance, Comet 1881-IV. 
It was observed in Europe after three days, became just discernible by the naked eye at the end of July, and brightened consistently up to its perihelion passage August 22nd, when it was still about 50 million miles from the sun. During many days of that month, the uncommon spectacle was presented of two bright comets circling together, though at widely different distances, round the north pole of the heavens. The newcomer, however, never approached the pristine luster of its predecessor. Its nucleus, when brightest, was comparable to the star Cor Caroli, a narrow, perfectly straight ray proceeding from it to a distance of ten degrees. This was easily shown by Bredekin to belong to the hydrogen type of tails, while a strange faint second tail or bifurcation of the first one, observed by Captain Noble, August 24th, fell into the hydrocarbon class of emanations. It was seen, August 22nd and 24th, by Dr. F. Turby of Louvain, as a short nebulous brush, like the abortive beginning of a congeries of curving trains, but appeared no more. Its well-attested presence was significant of the complex constitution of such bodies and the manifold kinds of action progressing in them. The only peculiarity in the spectrum of Chevrolet's comet consisted in the almost total absence of continuous light. The carbon bands were nearly isolated and very bright. Barely from the nucleus proceeded a rainbow-tinted streak indicative of solid or liquid matter, which, in this comet, must have been a very scanty amount. Its visit to the sun in 1881 was, so far as is known, the first. The elements of its orbit showed no resemblance to those of any previous comet, nor any marked signs of periodicity, so that, although it may be considered probable, we do not know that it is moving in a closed curve, or will ever again penetrate the precincts of the solar system. It was last seen from the southern hemisphere October 19, 1881. The third of a quartet of lucid comets visible within sixteen months was discovered by Mr. C. S. Wells at the Dudley Observatory, Albany, March 17, 1882. Two days later, it was described by Mr. Lewis Boz as a great comet in miniature, so well defined and regularly developed were its various parts and appendages. Discernible with optical aid early in May, it was on June 5th observed on the meridian at Albany just before noon, an astronomical event of extreme rarity. Comet Wells, however, never became an object so conspicuous as to attract general attention, owing to its immersion in the evening twilight of our northern June. But the study of its spectrum revealed new facts of the utmost interest. All the comets till then examined had been found, with the two transiently observed exceptions already mentioned, to conform to one invariable type of luminous emission. Individual distinctions there had been, but no specific differences. Now all these bodies had kept at a respectful distance from the sun, for of the great comet of 1880 no spectroscopic inquiries had been made. Comet Wells, on the other hand, approached its surface within little more than five million miles on June 10, 1882, and the vicinity had the effect of developing a novel feature in its incandescence. During the first half of April, its spectrum was of the normal type, though the carbon bands were unusually weak, but with approach to the sun they died out, and the entire light seemed to become concentrated into a narrow, unbroken, brilliant streak, hardly to be distinguished from the spectrum of a star. This unusual behavior excited attention, and a strict watch was kept. It was rewarded at the Dunecht Observatory, May 27, by the discernment of what had never before been seen in a comet, the yellow ray of sodium. By June 1st, this had kindled into a blaze overpowering all other emissions. The light of the comet was practically monochromatic, and the image of the entire head, with the root of the tail, could be observed like a solar prominence, depicted in its new saffron vesture of vivid illumination within the jaws of an open slit. 
At Potsdam, the bright yellow line was perceived with astonishment by Vogel on May 31st, and was next evening identified with Frauenhofer's D. Its character led him to infer a very considerable density in the glowing vapor emitting it. Hasselberg founded an additional argument in favor of the electrical origin of cometary light on the changes in the spectrum of comet wells, for they were closely paralleled by some earlier experiments of Wiedemann in which the gaseous spectra of vacuum tubes were at once effaced on the introduction of metallic vapors. It seemed as if the metal had no sooner been rendered volatile by heat then it usurped the entire office of carrying the discharge, the resulting light being thus exclusively of its production. Had simple incandescence by heat been in question, the effect would have been different. The two spectra would have been superposed without prejudice to either. Similarly, the replacement of the hydrocarbons bands in the spectrum of the comet by the sodium line proved electricity to be the exciting agent for the increasing thermal power of the sun might, indeed, have ignited the sodium, but it could not have extinguished the hydrocarbons. Sir William Huggins succeeded in photographing the spectrum of comet wells by an exposure of one hour and a quarter. The result was to confirm the novelty of its character. None of the ultraviolet carbon groups were apparent, but certain bright rays, as yet unidentified, had imprinted themselves. Otherwise, the spectrum was strongly continuous, uninterrupted even by the Fraunhofer lines detected in the spectrum of Tebbet's comet. Hence, it was concluded that a smaller proportion of reflected light was mingled with the native emissions of the later arrival. All that is certainly known about the extent of the orbit traversed by the first comet of 1882 is that it came from, and is now retreating towards, vastly remote depths of space. An American computer found a period indicated for it of no less than 400,000 years. A. Thrayen of Dingelstedt arrived at one of 3,617. Both are perhaps equally insecure. We have now to give some brief account of one of the most remarkable cometary apparitions on record, and, with the single exception of that identified with the name of Halley, the most instructive to astronomers. The lessons learned from it were as varied and significant as its aspect was splendid, although, from the circumstance of its being visible in general only before sunrise, the spectators of its splendor were comparatively few. The discovery of a great comet at Rio Janeiro, September 11, 1882, became known in Europe through a telegram from M. Krulls, director of the observatory at that place. It had, however, as appeared subsequently, been already seen on the 8th by Mr. Finlay of the Cape Observatory, and at Auckland as early as September 3rd. A later but very singularly conditioned detection, quite unconnected with any of the preceding, was effected by Dr. Common at Ealing. Since the eclipse of May 17th, when a comet, named Tufik in honor of the Khedive of Egypt, was caught on Dr. Schuster's photographs, entangled, one might almost say, in the outer rays of the corona, he had scrutinized the neighborhood of the sun on the infinitesimal chance of intercepting another such body on its rapid journey thence or thither. We record with wonder that after an interval of exactly four months, that infinitesimal chance turned up in his favor. On the forenoon of Sunday, September 17th, he saw a great comet close to and rapidly approaching the sun. It was, in fact, then within a few hours of perihelion. Some measures of position were promptly taken, but a cloud veil covered the interesting spectacle before midday was long past. Mr. Finlay at the Cape was more completely fortunate. Divided from his fellow observer by half the world, he unconsciously finished, under a clearer sky, his interrupted observation. The comet, of which the silvery radiance contrasted strikingly with the reddish-yellow glare of the sun's margin it drew near to, was followed continuously right into the boiling of the limb, 
a circumstance without precedent in cometary history. Dr. Elkin, who watched the progress of the event with another instrument, thought the intrinsic brilliancy of the nucleus scarcely surpassed by that of the sun's surface. Nevertheless, it had no sooner touched it than it vanished as if annihilated. So sudden was the disappearance at 4 hours 40 minutes 58 seconds Cape Mean Time that the comet was at first believed to have passed behind the sun. But this proved not to have been the case. The observers at the Cape had witnessed a genuine transit, nor could non-visibility be explained by equality of luster. For the gradations of light on the sun's disk are amply sufficient to bring out against the dusky background of the limb any object matching the brilliancy of the center, while an object just equally luminous with the limb must inevitably show dark at the center. The only admissible view, then, is that the bulk of the comet was of too filmy a texture and its presumably solid nucleus too small to intercept any noticeable part of the solar rays, a piece of information worth remembering. On the following morning, the object of this unique observation showed, in Sir David Gill's words, an astonishing brilliancy as it rose behind the mountains on the east of Table Bay, and seemed in no way diminished in brightness when the sun rose a few minutes afterward. It was only necessary to shade the eye from direct sunlight with the hand at arm's length to see the comet, with its brilliant white nucleus and dense white, sharply bordered tail of quite half a degree in length. All over the world, wherever the sky was clear during that day, September 18th, it was obvious to ordinary vision. Since 1843, nothing had been seen like it, from Spain, Italy, Algeria, southern France, dispatches came in announcing the extraordinary appearance. At Cordoba in South America, the blazing star near the sun was the one topic of discourse. Moreover, and this is altogether extraordinary, the records of its daylight visibility to the naked eye extend over three days. At Rius, near Tarragona, it showed bright enough to be seen through a passing cloud when only three of the sun's diameters from his limb, just before its final rush passed perihelion on September 17th, while at Carthagena in Spain on September 19th, it was kept in view during two hours before and two hours after noon, and was similarly visible in Algeria on the same day. But still more surprising than the appearance of the body itself were the nature and relations of the path it moved in. The first rough elements computed for it by Mr. Tebbett, Dr. Chandler, and Mr. White, assistant at the Melbourne Observatory, showed at once a striking resemblance to those of the twin comets of 1843 and 1880. This suggestive fact became known in this country, September 27th, through the medium of a Dunecht circular, it was fully confirmed by subsequent inquiries for which ample opportunities were luckily provided. The likeness was not, indeed, so absolutely perfect as in the previous case. It included some slight, though real, differences, but it bore a strong and unmistakable stamp, broadly challenging explanation. Two hypotheses only were really available. Either the comet of 1882 was an accelerated return of those of 1843 and 1880, or it was a fragment of an original mass to which they also had belonged. For the purposes of the first view, the resisting medium was brought into full play. The opinion of its efficacy was for some time both prevalent and popular, and formed the basis, moreover, of something of a sensational panic. For a comet which, at a single passage through the sun's atmosphere, encountered sufficient resistance to shorten its period from thirty-seven to two years and eight months, must, in the immediate future, be brought to rest on his surface, and the solar conflagration thence ensuing was represented in some quarters with more license of imagination than countenance from science, as likely to be of catastrophic import to the inhabitants of our little planet. 
But there was a test available in 1882 which it had not been possible to apply either in 1843 or in 1880. The two bodies visible in those years had been observed only after they had already passed perihelion. The third member of the group, on the other hand, was accurately followed for a week before that event, as well as during many months after it. Finlay's and Elkin's observation of its disappearance at the sun's edge formed, besides, a peculiarly delicate test of its motion. The opportunity was thus afforded, by directly comparing the comet's velocity before and after its critical plunge through the solar surroundings, of ascertaining with approximate certainty whether any considerable retardation had been experienced in the course of that plunge. The answer distinctly given was that there had not. The computed and observed places on both sides of the sun fitted harmoniously together. The effect, if any were produced, was too small to be perceptible. This result is, in itself, a memorable one. It seems to give the coup de grace to Encke's theory, discredited in addition by Bachlund's investigation, of a resisting medium growing rapidly denser inwards. For the perihelion distance of the comet of 1882, though somewhat greater than that of its predecessors, was nevertheless extremely small. It passed at less than 300,000 miles of the sun's surface, but the ethereal substance long supposed to obstruct the movement of Encke's comet would there be nearly 2,000 times denser than at the perihelion of the smaller body, and must have exerted a conspicuous retarding influence. That none such could be detected seems to argue that no such medium exists. Further evidence of a decisive kind was not wanting on the question of identity. The Great September Comet of 1882 was in no hurry to withdraw itself from curious terrestrial scrutiny. It was discerned with the naked eye at Cordoba as late as March 7, 1883, and still showed in the field of the Great Equatorial on June 1st as an excessively faint whiteness. It was then about 480 millions of miles from the Earth, a distance to which no other comet, not even excepting the peculiar one of 1729, had been pursued. Moreover, an arc of 340 out of the entire 360 degrees of its circuit had been described under the eyes of astronomers, so that its course came to be very well known. That its movement is in a very eccentric ellipse, traversed in several hundred years, was ascertained. The later inquiries of Dr. Kreutz, completed in a volume published in 1901, demonstrated the period to be of about 800 years, while that of its predecessor, in 1843, might possibly agree with it, but is much more probably estimated at 512 years. The hypothesis that they, or any of the comets associated with them, were returns of an individual body is peremptorily excluded. They may all, however, have been separated from one original mass by the devalent action of the sun at close quarters. Each has doubtless its own period, since each has most likely suffered retardations or accelerations special to itself, which, though trifling in amount, would avail materially to alter the length of the major axis, while leaving the remaining elements of the common orbit virtually unchanged. End of Recent Comets Continued, Part 2 Recording by Aaron Carlo, San Clemente, California Part 2, Chapter 11, Part 3 of a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Carlo in San Clemente, California. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clark. Part 2, Chapter 11. Part 3. Recent Comets Continued A fifth member was added to the family in 1887. On the 18th of January in that year, M. Tom discovered at Cordoba a comet reproducing with curious fidelity 
the lineaments of that observed in the same latitudes seven years previously. The narrow ribbon of light, contracting towards the sun, and running outward from it to a distance of thirty-five degrees. The unsubstantial head availed nothingness as it appeared, since no distinct nucleus could be made out. The quick fading into invisibility were all accordant peculiarities, and they were confirmed by some rough calculations of its orbit, showing geometrical affinity to be no less unmistakable than physical likeness. The observations secured were indeed, from the nature of the apparition, neither numerous nor over-reliable, and the earliest of them dated from a week after perihelion, passed almost by a touch-and-go escape January 11th. On January 27th, this mysterious object could barely be discerned telescopically at Cordoba. That it belonged to the series of southern comets can scarcely be doubted, but the inference that it was an actual return of the comet of 1880, improbable in itself, was negatived by its non-appearance in 1894. Myers in corporation with this extraordinary group of the Ellipse Comet of 1882 has been approved by Kreutz after searching examination. The idea of cometary systems was first suggested by Thomas Clausen in 1831. It was developed by the late M. Hoek, director of the Utrecht Observatory in 1865 and some following years. He found that in quite a considerable number of cases, the paths of two or three comets had a common point of intersection far out in space, indicating, with much likelihood, a community of origin. This consisted, according to his surmise, in the disruption of a parent mass during its sweep round the star latest visited. Be this as it may, the fact is undoubted that numerous comets fall into groups in which similar conditions of motion betray a pre-existing physical connection. Never before, however, had geometrical relationship been so notorious as between the comets now under consideration and never before, in a comet still, it might be said, in the prime of life, had physical peculiarities tending to account for that affinity been so obvious as in the chief member of the group. Observation of a granular structure in cometary nuclei dates far back into the 17th century, when Caesatus and Hevelius described the central parts of the comets of 1618 and 1652 respectively, as made up of a congeries of minute stars. Analogous symptoms of a loose state of aggregation have of late been not unfrequently detected in telescopic comets, besides the instances of actual division offered by those connected with the names of Biela and Lie. The forces concerned in producing these effects seem to have been peculiarly energetic in the Great Comet of 1882. The segmentation of the nucleus was first noticed in the United States and at the Cape of Good Hope, September 30th. It proceeded rapidly. At Kiel, on October 5th and 7th, Professor Kruger perceived two centers of condensation. A definite and progressive separation into three masses was observed by Professor Holden, October 13th and 17th. A few days later, M. Temple found the head to consist of four lucid aggregations ranged nearly along the prolongation of the caudal axis, and Dr. Common, January 27, 1883, saw five nuclei in a line like pearls on a string. This remarkable character was preserved to the last moment of the comet's distinct visibility. It was a consequence, according to Dr. Kreutz, of violent interior action in the comet itself while close to the sun. There were, however, other curious proofs of a disaggregative tendency in this body. On October 9th, Schmidt discovered at Athens a nebulous object four degrees southwest of the great comet and traveling in the same direction. It remained visible for a few days, and from Oppenheim's and Hein's calculations, there can be little doubt that it was really the offspring by fission of the body it accompanied. This is rendered more probable by the unexampled spectacle offered October 14th to Professor Bernard, then of Nashville, Tennessee, 
of six or eight distinct cometary masses within six degrees south by west of the comet's head, none of which reappeared on the next opportunity for a search. A week later, however, one similar object was discerned by Mr. W. R. Brooks in the opposite direction from the comet. Thus, Space appeared to be strewn with the filmy debris of this beautiful but fragile structure all along the track of its retreat from the sun. Its tail was only equaled, if it were equaled, in length by that of the comet of 1843. It extended in space to the vast distance of two hundred millions of miles from the head. But so imperfectly were its proportions displayed to terrestrial observers that it at no time covered an arc of the sky of more than thirty degrees. This apparent extent was attained during a few days previous to September 25th by a faint, thin, rigid streak noticed only by a few observers, by Elkin at the Cape Observatory, Eddy at Grahamstown, and Cruels at Rio Janeiro. It diverged at a low angle from the denser curved train and was produced, according to Bredechin, by the action of a repulsive force twelve times as strong as the counterpole of gravity. It belonged, that is, to type one, while the great bifurcate appendage, obvious to all eyes, corresponded to the lower rate of emission characteristic of type two. This was remarkable for the perfect definiteness of its termination, for its strongly forked shape, and for its unusual permanence. Down to the end of January, 1883, its length, according to Schmidt's observations, was still 93 million miles, and a week later it remained visible to the naked eye without notable abridgment. Most singular of all was an anomalous extension of the appendage towards the sun. During the greater part of October and November, a luminous tube or sheath of prodigious dimensions seemed to surround the head and project in a direction nearly opposite to that of the usual outpourings of attentuated matter. See Plate 3. Its diameter was computed by Schmidt to be, October 15th, no less than four million miles, and it was described by Krulls as a truncated cone of nebulosity, stretching three or four degrees sunwards. This and the entire anterior part of the comet were again surrounded by a thin but enormously voluminous paraboloidal envelope observed by Schiaparelli for a full month from October 19th. There can be little doubt that these abnormal effluxes were consequence of the tremendous physical disturbance suffered at perihelion, and it is worth remembering that something analogous was observed in the comet of 1680, Newton's, also noted for its excessively close approach to the sun, and possibly moving in a related orbit. The only plausible hypothesis as to the mode of their production is that of an opposite state of electrification in the particles composing the ordinary and extraordinary appendages. The spectrum of the great comet of 1882 was, in part, a repetition of that of its immediate predecessor, thus confirming the inference that the previously unexampled sodium blaze was in both a direct result of the intense solar action to which they were exposed. But the D line was, this time, not seen alone. At Dunecht, on the morning of September 18th, Drs. Copeland and J. G. Loza succeeded in identifying six brilliant rays in the green and yellow with as many prominent iron lines. A very significant addition to our knowledge of cometary constitution, and one which lent countenance to Bredechin's assumption of various kinds of matter issuing from the nucleus with velocities inversely as their atomic weights. All the lines equally showed a slight displacement, indicating a recession from the earth of the radiating body at the rate of 37 to 46 miles a second. A similar observation made by M. Tollen at Nice on the same day gave emphatic sanction to the spectroscopic method of estimating movement in the line of sight. Before anything was yet known of the comet's path or velocity, he announced, from the position of the double sodium line alone, that at 3 p.m. on September 18th 
it was increasing its distance from our planet by from 61 to 76 kilometers per second. M. Bigordin's subsequent calculations showed that its actual swiftness of recession was at that moment 73 kilometers. Changes in the inverse order to those seen in the spectrum of comet wells soon became apparent. In the earlier body, carbon bands had died out with approach to perihelion and had been replaced by sodium emissions. In its successor, sodium emissions became weakened and disappeared with retreat from perihelion and found their substitute in carbon bands. Professor Rico was, in fact, able to infer from the sequence of prismatic phenomenon that the comet had already passed the sun, thus establishing a novel criterion for determining the position of a comet in its orbit by the varying quality of its radiations. Recapitulating what was learnt from the five conspicuous comets of 1880-82, to 82, we find that the leading facts acquired to science were these three. First, that comets may be met with pursuing each other, after intervals of many years, in the same or nearly the same track, so that identity of orbit can no longer be regarded as a sure test of individual identity. Secondly, that at least the outer corona may be traversed by such bodies with perfect apparent impunity. Finally, that their chemical constitution is highly complex, and that they possess, in some cases at least, a metallic core resembling the meteoric masses which occasionally reach the Earth from planetary space. A group of five comets, including Halley's, own a sort of clientel dependence upon the planet Neptune. They travel out from the Sun just to about his distance from it, as if to pay homage to a powerful protector who gets the credit of their establishment as periodical visitors to the solar system. The second of these bodies to effect a looked-for return was a comet, the sixteenth within ten years, discovered by Pons, July 20, 1812, and found by Enke to revolve in an elliptic orbit with a period of nearly 71 years. It was not, however, until September 1, 1883, that Mr. Brooks caught its reappearance. It passed perihelion January 25th and was last seen January 2, 1884. At its brightest, it had the appearance of a second-magnitude star, furnished with a poorly developed double tail, and was fairly conspicuous to the naked eye in southern Europe from December to March. One exceptional feature distinguished it. Its fluctuations in form and luminosity were unprecedented in rapidity and extent. On September 21st, Dr. Chandler observed it at Harvard as a very faint, diffused nebulosity with slight central condensation. On the next night, there was found in its place a bright star of the eighth magnitude scarcely marked out by a bare trace of environing haze from the genuine stars it counterfeited. The change was attended by an eightfold augmentation of light and was proved by Schiaparelli's confirmatory observations to have been accomplished within a few hours. The stellar disguise was quickly cast aside. The comet appeared on September 23rd as a wide nebulous disk, and soon after faded down to its original dimness. Its distance from the sun was then no less than 200 million miles, and its spectrum showed nothing unusual. These strange variations recurred slightly on October 15th and with marked emphasis on January 1st, when they were witnessed with amazement and photometrically studied by Müller of Potsdam. The entire cycle this time was run through in less than four hours, the comet having, in that brief space, condensed with a vivid outburst of light into a seeming star, and the seeming star having expanded back again into a comet. Scarcely less transient, though not altogether similar, changes of aspect were noted by M. Pertin, January 13 and 19, 1884. On the latter date, the continuous spectrum given by a reddish-yellow disk surrounding the true nucleus seemed intensified by bright knots corresponding to the rays of sodium. 
A comet discovered by Mr. Sauerthal at the Royal Observatory, Cape of Good Hope, February 19, 1888, distinguished itself by blazing up on May 19th to four or five times its normal brilliancy, at the same time throwing out from the head two lustrous lateral branches. These had, on June 1st, spread backward so as to join the tail with an effect like the playing of a fountain. Ten or eleven days later, they had completely disappeared, leaving the comet in its former shape and insignificance. Its abrupt display of vitality occurred two full months after perihelion. On the morning of July 7th, 1889, Mr. W. R. Brooks of Geneva, New York, eminent as a successful comet hunter, secured one of his customary trophies. The faint object in question was moving through the constellation Cetus, and turned out to be a member of Jupiter's numerous family of comets, revolving round the sun in a period of seven years. Its past history came then, to a certain extent, within the scope of investigation, and proved to have been singularly eventful. Nor had the body escaped scatheless from the vicissitudes to which it had been exposed. Observing from Mount Hamilton, August 2nd and 5th, Professor Barnard noticed this comet, 1889 v, to be attended in its progress through space by four outriders. The two brighter companions, the fainter pair survived a very short time, were perfect miniatures, Professor Barnard tells us, of the larger comet, each having a small, fairly defined head and nucleus with a faint, hazy tail, the more distant one being the larger and less developed. The three comets were in a straight line, nearly east and west, their tails lying along this line. There was no connecting nebulosity between these objects, the tails of the two smaller not reaching each other or the large comet. To all appearance, they were absolutely independent comets. Nevertheless, Spittler at Vienna in the early days of August perceived, as it were, a thin cocoon of nebulosity woven round the entire trio. One of them faded from view September 5th. The other actually outshone the original comet on August 31st, but was plainly of inferior vitality. It was last seen by Bernard on November 25th, with the 36-inch refractor, while its primary afforded an observation for position with the 12-inch March 20th, 1890. A cause for the disruption it had presumably undergone had, before then, been plausibly assigned. The adventures of Lexel's comet have long served to exemplify the effects of Jupiter's despotic sway over such bodies. Although bright enough in 1770 to be seen with the naked eye, and ascertained to be circulating in five and a half years, it had never previously been seen, and failed subsequently to present itself. The explanation of this anomaly, suggested by Lexel, and fully confirmed by the analytical inquiries both of Laplace and Le Verrier, was that a very close approach to Jupiter in 1767 had completely changed the character of its orbit and brought it within the range of terrestrial observation, while in 1779, after having only twice traversed its new path, at its second return it was so circumstanced as to be invisible from the earth, it was, by a fresh encounter, diverted into one entirely different. Yet the possibility was not lost sight of that the great planet, by inverting its mode of action, might undo its own work and fling the comet once more into the inner part of the solar system. This possibility seemed to be realized by Chandler's identification of Brooks and Lexel's comet. An exceedingly close approach to Jupiter in 1886 had, he found reason to believe, produced such extensive alterations in the elements of its motion as to bring the errant body back to our neighborhood in 1889. But his inference, though ratified by Mr. Charles Lane Poor's preliminary calculations, proved dubious on closer inquiry and was rendered wholly inadmissible by the circumstances attending the return of Brooks' Comet in 1896. The companion objects watched by Bernard in 1889 had, by that time, perhaps, become dissipated in space, for they were not redetected. They represented in all likelihood 
wreckage from a collision with Jupiter dating perhaps so far back as 1791, when Mr. Lane Poor found that one of the fateful meetings to which short-period comets are especially subject had taken place. The Lexel Brooks case was almost duplicated by the resemblance to Davico's lost comet of 1844 of one detected November 20th, 1894, by Edward, son of Lewis Swift. Schulhof announced the identity, and Chandler, under reserve, vouched for it. Had the comet continued to pursue the track laboriously laid down for it at Boston, and shown itself at the due epoch in 1900, its individuality might have been considered assured, but the formidable vice-regent of the sun once more interposed, and, in 1897, swept it out of the terrestrial range of view. Hence, the recognition remains ambiguous. On the morning of March 7, 1892, Professor Lewis Swift discovered the brightest comet that had been seen by northern observers since 1882. About the time of perihelion, which occurred on April 6, it was conspicuous as it crossed the celestial equator from Aquarius towards Pegasus, with a nucleus equal to the third magnitude star and a tail twenty degrees long. This tail was multiple, and multiple in a most curiously variable manner. It divided up into many thin nebulous streaks, the number and relative luster of which underwent rapid and marked changes. Their permanent record on Bernard's and W. H. Pickering's plates marked a noteworthy advance in cometary photography. Plate 4 reproduces two of the Lick pictures taken with a six-inch camera on April 5th and 7th, respectively, with, in each case, an exposure of about one hour. The tail is in the first composed of three main branches, the middle one having sprung out since the previous morning, and the branches are, in their turn, split up into finer rays, to the number of perhaps a dozen in all. In the second, a very different state of things is exhibited. The southern component, Professor Bernard remarked, which was the brightest on the fifth, had become diffused and fainter, while the middle tail was very bright and broad. Its southern side, which was the best defined, was wavy in numerous places, the tail appearing as if disturbing currents were flowing at right angles to it. At 42 degrees from the head, the tail made an abrupt bend towards the south, as if its current was deflected by some obstacle. In the densest portion of the tail, at the point of deflection, are a couple of dark holes, similar to those seen in some of the nebulae. The middle portion of the tail is brighter, and it looks like crumpled silk in places. Next morning, the southern was the prominent branch, and it was loaded at one degree forty-two minutes from the head with a strange excrescence, suggesting the budding out of a fresh comet in that incongruous situation. Some of these changes, Professor Bernard thought, might possibly be explained by a rotation of the tail on an axis passing through the nucleus, and Pickering, who formed a similar opinion on independent grounds, assigned about ninety-four hours as the period of the gyrating movement. He, moreover, determined accelerative velocities outward from the sun of definite condensations in the tail, indicating for its materials, on Bredichin's theory, a density less than one-half that of hydrogen. This conclusion applied also to Rodam's comet, which exhibited a year later phenomena analogous to those remarked in Swift's. Their photographic study led Professor Hussey to significant inferences as to the structure and rapid changes of cometary appendages. Seven comets were detected in 1892, and all, strange to say, were visible together towards the close of the year. Among them was a faint object, which unexpectedly left a trail on a plate exposed by Professor Bernard to the stars in Aquila on October 12th. This was the first comet actually discovered by photography, the Sohag comet having been simultaneously seen and pictured. It has a period of about six years. Holmes's comet is likewise periodical in rather less than seven years. Its path, 
which is wholly comprised between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, is less eccentric than that of any other known comet. Subsequently to its discovery, on November 6th, it underwent some curious vicissitudes. At first bright and condensed, it expanded rapidly with increasing distance from the sun, to which it had made its nearest approach on June 13th, until, by the middle of December, it was barely discernible with powerful telescopes as a feebly luminous mist on the face of the sky. But on January 6th, 1893, observers in Europe and America were bewildered to find, as if substituted for it, a yellow star of the seventh magnitude, enveloped in a thin nebulous husk, which enclosed a faint miniature tail. This condensation and recovery of light lasted in its full intensity only a couple of days. The almost evanescent faintness of Holmes's comet at its next return accounted for its invisibility previous to 1892, when it was evidently in a state of peculiar excitement. Mr. Perrine was barely able, with the Lick 36-inch, to find the vague nebulous patch which occupied its predicted place on June 10, 1899. The origin of comets has been long and eagerly inquired into, not altogether apart from the cheering guidance of ascertained facts. Sir William Herschel regarded them as fragments of nebulae, scattered debris of embryo worlds, and Laplace approved and adopted the idea. But there was a difficulty. No comet has yet been observed to travel in a decided hyperbola. The typical cometary orbit, apart from disturbance, is parabolic, that is to say, it is indistinguishable from an enormously long ellipse. But this circumstance could only be reconciled with the view that the bodies thus moving were causal visitors from outer space by making, as Laplace did, the tacit assumption that the solar system was at rest. His reasoning was, indeed, thereby completely vitiated, as Gauss pointed out in 1815, and the objections then urged were reiterated by Schiaparelli, who demonstrated in 1871 that a large preponderance of well-marked hyperbolic orbits should result if comets were picked up en route by a swiftly advancing sun. The fact that their native movement is practically parabolic shows it to have been wholly imparted from without. They passively obeyed the pull exerted upon them. In other words, their condition previous to being attracted by the sun was one very nearly of relative repose. They shared, accordingly, the movement of translation through space of the solar system. This significant conclusion had been indicated, on other grounds, as the upshot of researches undertaken independently by Carrington and Mohn in 1860, with a view to ascertaining the anticipated existence of a relationship between the general lie of the paths of comets and the direction of the sun's journey. It is tolerably obvious that if they wandered at haphazard through interstellar regions, their apparitions should markedly aggregate toward the vicinity of the constellation Lyra, that is to say, we should meet considerably more comets than would overtake us, for the very same reason that falling stars are more numerous after than before midnight. Moreover, the comets met by us should be, apparently, swifter moving objects than those coming up with us from behind, because, in the one case, our own real movement would be added to, in the other subtracted from, theirs. But nothing of all this can be detected. Comets approach the sun indifferently from all quarters, and with velocities quite independent of direction. We conclude, then, that the cosmical current which bears the solar system towards its unknown goal carries also with it nebulous masses of undefined extent, and at an undefined remoteness, fragments detached from which, continually entering the sphere of the sun's attraction, flit across our skies under the form of comets. These are, however, almost certainly so far strangers to our system that they had no part in the long processes of development by which its present condition was attained. 
They are perhaps survivals of an earlier, and by us scarcely and dimly conceivable state of things, when the swirling chaos from which sun and planets were, by a supreme edict to emerge, had not as yet separately begun to be. End of Part 2, Chapter 11, Part 3, Recent Comets, Continued Recording by Aaron Carlo in San Clemente, California Part 2, Chapter 12 of A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio. InterfaceAudio.com A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clark. Chapter 12. Stars and Nebulae. That a science of stellar chemistry should not only have become possible, but should already have made material advances, is assuredly one of the most amazing features in the swift progress of knowledge our age has witnessed. Custom can never blunt the wonder with which we must regard the achievement of compelling rays emanating from a source devoid of sensible magnitude through immeasurable distance to reveal by its distinctive qualities the composition of that source. The discovery of revolving double stars assured us that the great governing force of the planetary movements and of our own material existence sways equally the courses of the farthest suns in space the application of prismatic analysis certified to the presence in the stars of the familiar materials no less of the earth we tread than of the human bodies built up out of its dust and circumambient vapors we have seen that as early as eighteen twenty three fraunhofer ascertained the generic participation of stellar light in the peculiarity by which sunlight spread out by transmission through a prism shows numerous transverse rulings of interrupting darkness. No sooner had Kirchhoff supplied the key to the hidden meaning of those ciphered characters than it was eagerly turned to the interpretation of the dim scrolls unfolded in the spectra of the stars. Donati made at Florence in 1860 the first efforts in this direction, but with little result, owing to the imperfections of the instrumental means at his command. His comparative failure, however, was a prelude to others' success. Almost simultaneously, in 1862, the novel line of investigation was entered upon by Huggins near London, by Father Secchi at Rome, and by Lewis M. Rutherford in New York. Fraunhofer's device of using a cylindrical lens for the purpose of giving a second dimension to stellar spectra was adopted by all, and was indeed indispensable. For a luminous point, such as a star, appears, becomes, when viewed through a prism, a variegated line, which, until broadened into a band by the intervention of a cylindrical lens, is all but useless for purposes of research. This process of rolling out involves, it is true, much loss of light, a scanty and precious commodity as coming from the stars, but the loss is an inevitable one, and so fully it is compensated by the great light-grasping power of modern telescopes that important information can now be gained from the spectroscopic examination of stars far below the range of the unarmed eye. The effective founders of stellar spectroscopy, then, since Rutherford shortly turned his efforts elsewhere, were Father Secchi, the eminent Jesuit astronomer of the Collegio Romano, where he died February 26, 1878, and Sir William Huggins, with whom the late Professor W. A. Miller was associated. The work of each was happily directed as to supplement that of the other. With less perfect appliances, the Roman astronomer sought to render his extensive rather than precise, at Tulse Hill, searching accuracy over a narrow range was aimed at and attained. 
to father secchi is due the merit of having executed the first spectroscopic survey of the heavens above four thousand stars were passed in review by him and classified according to the varying qualities of their light his provisional establishment eighteen sixty three to sixty seven of four types of stellar spectra has proved a genuine aid to knowledge through the facilities afforded by it for the arrangement and comparison of rapidly accumulating facts moreover it is scarcely doubtful that these special distinctions correspond to differences in physical condition of a marked kind the first order comprises more than half the visible and probably an overwhelming proportion of the faintest stars sirius vega regulus altair are amongst its leading members their spectra are distinguished by the breadth and intensity of the four dark bars due to the absorption of hydrogen and by the extreme faintness of the metallic lines of which nevertheless hundreds are disclosed by careful examination the light of these syrian orbs is white or bluish and it is found to be rich in ultraviolet rays capella and arcturus belong to the second or solar type of stars which is about one-sixth less numerously represented than the first. Their spectra are quite closely similar to that of sunlight, in being ruled throughout by innumerable fine dark lines, and they share its yellowish tinge. The third class includes most red and variable stars, commonly synonymous, of which Betelgeuse in the shoulder of Orion and Mira in the whale are noted examples their characteristic spectrum is of the fluted description it shows like a strongly illuminated range of seven or eight variously tinted columns seen in perspective the light falling from the red end towards the violet this kind of absorption is produced by the vapors of metalloids or of compound substances to the fourth order of stars belongs also a collonated spectrum but reversed the light is thrown the other way the three broad zones of absorption which interrupt it are sharp toward the red, insensibly gradated towards the violet end. The individuals composing class four are few and apparently insignificant, the brightest of them not exceeding the fifth magnitude. They are commonly distinguished by a deep red tint and gleam like rubies in the field of the telescope. Father Secchi, who in 1867 detected the peculiarity of their analyzed light, ascribed to it the presence of carbon in some form in their atmospheres, and this was confirmed by the researches of H. C. Vogel, director of the Astrophysical Observatory at Potsdam. The hydrocarbon bands, in fact, seen bright in commons, are dark in these singular objects, the only ones in the heavens, save one bright-lined star and a rare meteor, which displays a commentary analogy of the fundamental sort revealed by the spectroscope. The numbers of all four orders are, however, emphatically suns. They possess, it would appear, photospheres, radiating all kinds of light, and differ from each other mainly in the varying qualities of their absorptive atmospheres the principle that the colors of stars depend not on the intrinsic nature of their light but on the kinds of vapors surrounding them and stopping out certain portions of that light was laid down by huggins in 1864 the phenomena of double stars seems to indicate a connection between the state of the investing atmospheres by the action of which their often brilliantly contrasted tints are produced and their mutual physical relations a tabular statement put forward by professor holden in june eighteen eighty made it at any rate clear that inequality of magnitude between the components of binary systems accompanies unlikeness in color and that stars more equally matched in one respect are pretty sure to be so in the other besides blue and green stars of a decided tinge are never solitary they invariably form part of systems so that association has undoubtedly a predominant influence upon color nevertheless the crude notion thrown out by zollner in 1865 that yellow and red stars are simply white stars in various stages of cooling 
obtained for a time undeserved currency. Darest, indeed, protested against it, and Angstrom, in 1868, substituted atmospheric quality for mere color, as a criterion of age and temperature. His lead was followed by Lockyer in 1873, and by Vogel in 1874. The scheme of classification due to the Potsdam astrophysicist differed from Father Secchi's only in presenting his third and fourth types as subdivisions of the same order, and inserting three subordinate categories, but their variety was rationalized by the addition of the seductive idea of progressive development. Thus the white Syrian stars were represented as the youngest, because the hottest of the sidereal family, those of the solar pattern as having already wasted much of their store by radiation, and being well advanced in middle life, while the red stars with banded spectra figured as effete suns, hastening rapidly down the road to final extinction. Vogel's scheme is, however, incomplete. It traces the downward curve of decay, but gives no account of the slow ascent to maturity. The present splendor of Vega, for instance, was prepared, according to all creative analogy, by almost endless processes of gradual change. What was its antecedent condition? The question has been variously answered. Dr. John Stone Stoney advocated, in 1867, the comparative youth of red stars. A. Ritter of Aix la Chapelle divided them in 1883 into two squadrons, posted the one on the ascending, the other on the descending branch of the temperature curve, and corresponding, presumably, with Secchi's third and fourth orders of stars with banded spectra. Whether in the interim they should display spectra of the Syrian or of the solar type was made to depend on their greater or less massiveness. But the revelation actually existing perhaps inverts that contemplated by Ritter. Certainly, the evidence collected by Mr. Mondor in 1891 strongly supports the opinion that the average solar star is a weightier body than the average Syrian star. On November 17, 1887, Sir Norman Lockyer communicated to the Royal Society the first of a series of papers embodying his meteoritic hypothesis of cosmical constitution, stated and supported more at large in a separate work bearing that name, published in 1890. The fundamental proposition wrought out in it was that all self-luminous bodies in the celestial space are composed either of swarms of meteorites or of masses of meteoric vapor produced by heat. On the basis of this supposed community of origin, sidereal objects were distributed in seven groups along a temperature curve ascending from nebulae and gaseous or bright line stars, through red stars of the third type and a younger division of solar stars to the high Syrian level then descending through the more strictly solar stars to red stars of the fourth type, carbon stars, below which lay only the Caput Maturum, entitled Group 7. The groundwork of this classification was, however, insecure, and has given way. Certain spectroscopic coincidences, avowedly only approximate, suggesting that stars and nebulae of every species might be formed out of variously aggregated meteorites, failed of verification by exact inquiry, and spectroscopic coincidences admit of no compromise. Those that are merely approximate are, as a rule, unmeaning. In his presidential address at the Cardiff meeting of the British Association in 1891, Dr. Huggins adhered in the main to the line of advance traced by Vogel. The inconspicuousness of metallic lines in the spectra of the white stars he attributed not to the paucity, but to the high temperature of the vapors producing them, and the consequent deficiency of contrast between their absorption rays and the continuous light of photospheric background. Such a state of things would more probably, in his opinion, be found in conditions anterior to the solar stage, while a considerable cooling of the sun would probably give rise to banded spectra due to compounds. 
he adverted also to the influential effects upon stellar types of varying surface gravity which being a function of both mass and bulk necessarily gains strength with wasting heat and consequent shrinkage the same leading ideas were more fully worked out in an atlas of representative stellar spectra published by sir william and lady huggins in 1899 they were moreover splendidly illustrated by a set of original spectrographic plates while precision was added to the adopted classification by the separation of helium from hydrogen stars the spectrum of the exotic substance terrestrially captured in 1895 is conspicuous by absorption as vogel lockyer and delandres promptly recognized in a considerable number of white stars among them the pleiades and most of the brilliance in orion mr mclean whose valuable spectrographic survey of the heavens was completed at the cape in eighteen ninety seven found reason to conclude that they are in the first stage of development from gaseous nebulae and in this the tulse hill investigators unhesitantly concur the strongest evidence for the primitive state of white stars is found in their nebular relations the components of groups still involved and entangled with silver braids of cosmic mist show perhaps invariably spectra of the helium type occasionally crossed by bright rays possibly all such stars have passed through a bright line stage but further evidence on the point is needed relative density furnishes another important test of comparative age and syrian stars are on the whole undoubtedly more bulky proportionately to their mass than solar stars the rule however seems to admit of exceptions hence the change from one kind of spectrum to the other is not that inevitably connected with the attainment of a particular degree of condensation there is reason to believe that it is anticipated in the more massive globes despite their comparatively slow cooling as a consequence of the greater power of gravity over their investing vaporous envelopes this conclusion is enforced by the relations of double star spectra the fact that in unequal pairs the chief star most frequently shows a solar its companion a Sirian, spectrum can scarcely be otherwise explained than by admitting that while the sequence of types is pursued in an invariable order it is pursued much more rapidly in larger than in small orbs it need not indeed be supposed that all stars are identical in constitution and present identical life histories individualities in the one and divergencies in the other must be allowed for yet the main track is plainly continuous and leads by insensible gradations from nebulae through helium stars to the Sirian and onward to the solar type whence by an inevitable transition fluted or antarian spectra develop the first known examples of the class of gaseous stars lyri and cassiopeiae were noticed by father secchi at the outset of his spectroscopic inquiries both show bright lines of hydrogen and helium so that the peculiarity of their condition probably consists in the intense ignition of their chromospheric surroundings the entire radiating surfaces might be described as faculous, that is to say, brilliant formations, such as have been photographed by Professor Hale on the sun's disk, cover perhaps the whole, instead of being limited to a small portion of the photospheric area. But this state of things is more or less inconstant. Some at least of the bright rays indicative of it are subject to temporary extinctions, Already in 1871 to 72, Dr. Vogel suspected the prevalence of such vicissitudes, and their reality was ascertained by M. Eugène von Gothard. After the completion of his new astrophysical observatory at Herene in the autumn of 1881, he repeatedly observed the spectra of both stars without perceiving a trace of bright lines and was thus taken quite by surprise when he caught a twinkling of the crimson sea in cassiopeiae august thirteenth eighteen eighty three a few days later the whole range including d three was lustrous 
duly apprised of the recurrence of a phenomenon he had himself vainly looked for during some years m von Konkoli took the opportunity of the great vienna refractor being placed at his disposal to examine with it the relighted spectrum on august twenty seventh in its wealth of light c was dazzling d three and the green and blue hydrogen rays shone somewhat less vividly d and the group b showed faintly dark while three broad absorption bands sharply terminated towards the red diffuse towards the violet shaded the spectrum near its opposite extremities the previous absence of bright lines from the spectrum of this star was however by no means so protracted or complete as m von gothard supposed at dunecht c was superbly visible december twentieth eighteen seventy nine f was seen bright on october twenty eighth of the same year and frequently at greenwich in eighteen eighty to eighty one the curious fact has moreover been adverted to by dr copeland that c is much more variable than f to vogel june eighteenth eighteen seventy two the first was invisible while the second was bright at dunecht january eleventh eighteen eighty seven the conditions were so far inverted that c was resplendent f comparatively dim no spectral fluctuations were detected in cassiopeiae by keeler in eighteen eighty nine but even with the giant telescope at Mount Hamilton, the helium ray was completely invisible. It made nevertheless capricious appearances at South Kensington during that autumn, and again October 21, 1894, while in September of 1892, Belopolsky could obtain no trace of it on orthochromatic plates exposed with the 30-inch Polkawa refractor still more noteworthy is the circumstance that the well-known green triplet of magnesium recorded as dark by keeler in eighteen eighty nine came out bright on fifty-two spectrographs of the star taken by father sidgraves during the years eighteen ninety one to ninety nine no fluctuations in the hydrogen spectrum were betrayed by them but subordinate lines of unknown origin showed alternate fading and vivification the spectrum of Lyrae undergoes transitions to some extent analogous, yet involving a different set of considerations. First noticed by von Gothard in 1882, they were imperfectly made out two years later to be of a cyclical character. This, however, could only be effectively determined by photographic means. Beta Lyrae is a short period variable its light changes with great regularity from 3.4 to 4.4 magnitude every 12 days and 22 hours, during which time it attains a twofold maximum with an intervening secondary minimum. The question then is of singular interest, whether the changes of spectral quality visible in this object correspond to its changes in visual brightness. A distinct answer in the affirmative was supplied through Mrs. Fleming's examination of the Harvard plates of the star's spectrum, upon which in 1891 she found recorded diverse complex changes of bright and dark lines, obviously connected with the phases of luminous variation, and obeying in the long run precisely the same period. Something more will be said presently as to the import of this discovery. Bright hydrogen lines have so far been detected, for the most part photographically at Harvard College, in about 60 stars, including Pleione, the surmised lost Pleiad, P. Cygni, noted for instability of light in the 17th century, and the extraordinary southern variable, N. Carini. In most of these objects, other vivid rays are associated with those due to hydrogen, a blaze of hydrogen moreover accompanies the recurring outbursts of about one hundred and fifty long period variables giving banded spectra of the third type professor pickerington discovered the first example of this class towards the close of eighteen eighty six in mira sete further detections were made visually by mr espen and the conjunction of bright hydrogen lines with dusky bands has been proved by mrs fleming's long experience in studying the harvard photographs to indicate unerringly the subjection of the stars thus characterized to variations of lustre accomplished in some months 
a third variety of gaseous star is named after messieurs wolf and rayet who discovered at paris in eighteen sixty seven its three typical representatives close together in the constellation cygnus six further specimens were discovered by dr copeland five of them in the course of a trip for the exploration of visual facilities in the andes in eighteen eighty three and a large number have been made known through spectral photographs under professor pickering's direction at the close of the nineteenth century over a hundred such objects had been registered none brighter than the sixth magnitude with the single exception of argus the resplendent continuous spectrum of which first examined by respighi and lockyer in eighteen seventy one is embellished with the yellow and blue rays distinctive of the type here then we have a stellar globe apparently at the highest point of sunlight incandescence sharing the peculiarities of bodies verging toward the nebulous state examined with instruments of adequate power their spectra are seen to be highly complex they include a fairly strong continuous element a numerous set of absorption lines and a range of emission lines more or less completely represented in different stars especially conspicuous is a broad effluence of azure light found by dr vogel in eighteen eighty three and by sir william and lady huggins in eighteen ninety to be of multiple structure and hence to vary in its mode of display its suggested identification with the blue carbon fluting was disproved at tulse hill metallic vapors give no certain sign of their presence in the atmospheres of these remarkable bodies but nebulum is stated to shine in some hydrogen and helium account for a large proportion of their spectral rays thirty-two wolf rayet stars were investigated spectroscopically and spectrographically by professor campbell with the great lick refractor in 1892 to 94 and several disclosed the singularity already noticed by him in argus of giving out mixed series the members of which change from vivid to obscure with increase of refrangibility it is difficult to imagine by what chromospheric machinery this curious result can be produced alcyon and the pleiades presents the same characteristic alone among the hydrogen lines crimson sea glows in its spectrum while all others are dark luminosity of the wolf rayet kind is particularly constant both in quantity and quality it seems to be incapable of developing save under galactic conditions all the stars marked by it lie near the central line of the milky way or in the magellanic clouds they tend also to gather into groups circles of four degrees radius include respectively seven in argo eight in cygnus the first spectroscopic star catalog was published by dr vogel in potsdam in 1883 it included four thousand and fifty one stars distributed over a zone of the heavens extending from twenty degrees north to twenty degrees south of the celestial equator more than half of these were white stars while well, red stars with banded spectra occurred in the proportion of about one thirteenth of the whole. To the latter genus, M. Dunaire, then of Lund, now director of the Uppsala Observatory, devoted a work of standard authority, issued at Stockholm in 1884. This was a catalogue with descriptive particulars of 352 stars, showing banded spectra, 297 of which belonged to Secchi's third, fifty-five to his fourth class vogel's third a and three b since then discovery has progressed so rapidly at first through the telescopic reviews of mr espen then in the course of the photographic survey carried on at harvard college that considerably over one thousand stars are at present recognized as of the family of betelgeuse and mira well about two hundred and fifty have so far exhibited the spectral pattern of nineteen piscium one fact well ascertained as regards both species is the invariability of the type the prismatic flutings of the one and the broader zones of the other are as if stereotyped they undergo in their fundamental outlines no modification 
though varying in relative intensity from star to star. They are always accompanied by, or superposed upon, a spectrum of dark lines, in producing which sodium and iron have an obvious share, and certain bright rays, noticed by Secchi with his imperfect appliances, as enhancing the chiaroscuro effects in carbon stars, came out upon plates exposed by Hale and Ellerman in 1898, with the stellar spectrograph of the Yerkes Observatory. Their genuineness was shortly afterwards visually attested by Keeler, Campbell, and Dunay, but no chemical interpretation has been found for them. End of section 36. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. Part two, chapter twelve, part two of a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century by Mary Agnes Clark chapter twelve stars and nebulae part two a fairly complete preliminary answer to the question what are the stars made of was given by sir william huggins in eighteen sixty four by laborious processes of comparison between stellar dark lines and the bright rays emitted by terrestrial substances he sought to assure his conclusions regardless of cost in time and pains he averred indeed that taking into account restrictions by weather and position the thorough investigation of a single star spectrum would be the work of some years of two however those of betelgeuse and alderbaran he was able to furnish detailed and accurate drawings the dusky flutings in the prismatic light of the first of these stars have not been identified with the absorption of any particular substance but associated with them are metallic lines of which seventy-eight were measured and a good many identified by huggins while the wavelengths of ninety-seven were determined by vogel in eighteen seventy one a photographic research made by keeler at the allegheny observatory in eighteen ninety seven convinced him that the linear spectrum of third type stars of the betelgeuse pattern essentially repeats that of the sun but with marked differences in the comparative strength of its components hydrogen rays are inconspicuously present that an exalted temperature reigns at least in the lower strata of the atmosphere is certified by the vaporization there of matter so refractory to heat as iron nine elements among them iron sodium calcium and magnesium were recognized by huggins as having stamped their signature on the spectrum of aldebaran while the existence in sirius and nearly all the other stars inspected of hydrogen together with sundry metals was rendered certain or highly probable this was admitted to be a bare gleaning of results nor is there reason to suppose any of his congeners inferior to our sun in complexity of constitution definite knowledge on the subject however made little advance beyond the point to which it was brought by huggins's early experiments until spectroscopic photography became thoroughly effective as a means of research in this as in so many other directions sir william huggins acted as pioneer in march eighteen sixty three he obtained microscopic prints of the spectra of sirius and capella but they told nothing no lines were visible in them they were mere characterless streaks of light nine years later dr henry draper of new york got an impression of four lines in the spectrum of vega then huggins attacked the subject again in eighteen seventy six when the eighteen inch speculum of the royal society had come into his possession using prisms of iceland spar and lenses of rock crystal and this time with better success a photograph of the spectrum of vega showed seven strong lines still he was not satisfied 
he waited and worked for three years longer at length on december eighteen eighteen seventy nine he was able to communicate to the royal society results answering to his expectations the delicacy of eye and hand needed to obtain them may be estimated from the single fact that the image of a star had to be kept by continual minute adjustments exactly projected upon a slit one over three hundred and fifty of an inch in width during nearly an hour in order to give it time to imprint the characters of its analyzed light upon a gelatin plate raised to the highest pitch of sensitiveness but by this time he had secured in his wife a rarely qualified assistant the altered violet spectrum of the white stars of which vega was taken as the type was thus shown to be a very remarkable one a group of broad dark lines intersected it arranged at intervals diminishing regularly upward and falling into a rhythmical succession with the visible hydrogen lines all belonged presumably to the same substance and the presumption was rendered a certainty by direct photographs of the hydrogen spectrum taken by h w vogel at berlin a few months earlier in them seven of the white star series of grouped lines were visible and the full complement of twelve appeared on cornu's plates in eighteen eighty six in yellow stars such as capella and arcturus the same rhythmical series was partially represented but associated with a great number of other lines their state as regards ultraviolet absorption approximating to that of the sun while the redder stars betrayed so marked a deficiency in actinic rays that from betelgeuse with an exposure forty times that required for sirius only a faint spectral impression could be obtained and from aldebaran in the strictly invisible region almost none at all thus by the means of stellar light analysis acquaintance was first made with the ultraviolet spectrum of hydrogen and its harmonic character as expressed by balmer's law supplies a sure test for discriminating among newly discovered lines those that appertain from those that are unrelated to it delandre's five additional prominence rays for instance were at once seen to make part of the series because conforming to its law while a group of six dusky bands photographed by sir william and lady huggins april fourth eighteen ninety near the extreme upper end of the spectrum of sirius were pronounced without hesitation for the opposite reason to have nothing to do with hydrogen their true affinities are still a matter for the inquiry as regards the hydrogen spectrum however the stars had further information in reserve until recently it was supposed to consist of a single harmonic series although by analogy three should coexist in eighteen ninety six accordingly a second bound to the first by unmistakable numerical relationships was recognized by professor pickering in spectrographs of the two point five magnitude star zeta pupus and the identification was shortly afterwards extended to prominent wolf rayet emission lines the discovery was capped by dr rydberg's indication of the wolf rayet blue band at lambda four thousand six hundred eighty eight as the fundamental member of the third and principal hydrogen series none of the pickering lines as they may be called to distinguish them from the huggins series can be induced to glimmer in vacuum tubes they seem to characterize bodies in a primitive state and are in many cases associated with absorption rays of oxygen the identification of which by mr mclean in eighteen ninety seven was fully confirmed by sir david gill the typical oxygen star is beta crucis one of the brilliants of the southern cross but the distinctive notes of its spectrum occur in not a few specimens of the helium class thus sir william and lady huggins photographed several ultraviolet oxygen lines in beta lyri and found in rigel signs of the presence of nitrogen which as well as silicium proves to be a tolerably frequent constituent of such orbs for some unknown reason metalloids tend to become effaced as metals in the normal course of stellar development exert a more and more conspicuous action
dr schneider's spectrographic researches at potsdam in 1890 and subsequently exemplify the immense advantages of self-registration in a restricted section of the spectrum of capella he was enabled to determine nearly three hundred lines with more precision than had then been attained in the measurement of terrestrial spectra this star appeared to be virtually identical with the sun in physical constitution although it emits according to the best available data about one hundred and forty times as much light and is hence presumably one thousand six hundred times more voluminous an equally close examination of the spectrum of betelgeuse showed the predominance in it of the linear near absorption of iron but its characteristic flutings do not extend to the photographic region spectra of the second and third orders are for this reason not easily distinguished on the sensitive plate a spectrographic investigation of all the brighter northern stars was set on foot in eighteen eighty six at the observatory of harvard college under the form of a memorial to dr h draper whose promising work in that line was brought to a close by his premature death in eighteen eighty two no individual exertions could however have realized a tithe of what has been and is being accomplished under professor pickering's able direction with the aid of the draper and other instruments supplemented by mrs draper's liberal provision of funds a novel system was adopted or rather an old one originally used by fraunhofer was revived the use of a slit was discarded as unnecessary for objects like the stars devoid of sensible dimensions and giving hence a naturally pure spectrum and a large prism placed in front of the object glass analyzed at once with slight loss of light the rays of all the stars in the field their spectra were taken as it were wholesale as many as two hundred stars down to the eighth magnitude were occasionally printed on a single plate with a single exposure no cylindrical lens was employed the movement of the stars themselves was turned to account for giving the desirable width to their spectra the star was allowed by disconnecting or suitably regulating the clock to travel slowly across the line of its own dispersed light so broadening it gradually into a band excellent results were secured in this way about fifty lines appear in the photographed spectrum of aldebaran and eight in that of vega on january twenty sixth eighteen eighty six an exposure of thirty-four minutes a simultaneous impression was obtained of the spectra among many others of close upon forty pleiades with few and doubtful exceptions they all proved to belong to the same type an additional argument for the common origin of the stars forming this beautiful group was thus provided the draper catalogue of stellar spectra was published in eighteen ninety it gives the results of a rapid analytical survey of the heavens north of twenty five degrees of southern declination and includes ten thousand three hundred and fifty one stars down to about the eighth magnitude the telescope used was of eight inches aperture and forty-five focus its field of view owing to the portrait lens or doublet form given to it embracing with fair definition no less than one hundred square degrees an objective prism eight inches square was attached and exposures of a few minutes were given to the most sensitive plates that could be procured in this way the sky was twice covered in duplicate each star appearing as a rule on four plates the registration of their spectra was sought to be made more distinctive than had previously been attempted secchi's first type being divided into four his second into five subdivisions but the differences regarded in them could be confidently established only for stars above the sixth magnitude the work supplies none the less valuable materials for general inferences as to the distribution and relations of the spectral types the labor of its actual preparation was borne by a staff of ladies under the direction of mrs fleming materials for its completion to the southern pole have been accumulated with the identical instrument used at cambridge transferred for the purpose in eighteen ninety nine to peru and the forthcoming second draper catalog will comprise thirty thousand stars in both hemispheres as supplements to this great enterprise two important detailed discussions of stellar spectra were issued in eighteen ninety seven and nineteen o one respectively the first by miss a c maury 
dealt with six hundred and eighty one bright stars visible in the northern hemisphere the second by miss a j cannon with one thousand one hundred and twenty two southern stars both authors traced with care and ability the minute gradations by which the long process of stellar evolution appears to be accomplished the progress of the draper memorial researches was marked by discoveries of an unexampled kind the principle upon which motion in the line of sight can be detected and measured with the spectroscope has already been explained it depends as our readers will remember upon the removal of certain lines dark or bright it matters not which from their normal places by almost infinitesimal amounts the whole spectrum of the moving object in fact is very slightly shoved hither or thither according as it is travelling towards or from the eye but for convenience of measurement one line is usually picked out from the rest and attention concentrated upon it the application of this method to the stars however is encompassed with difficulties it needs a powerfully dispersive spectroscope to show line displacements of the minute order in question and powerful dispersion involves a strictly proportionate enfeeblement of light this where the supply is already to a deplorable extent niggardly can ill be afforded for which reason the operation of determining a star's approach or recession is even apart from atmospheric obstacles an excessively delicate one it was first executed by sir william huggins early in eighteen sixty eight selecting the brightest star in the heavens as the most promising subject of experiment he considered the f line in the spectrum of sirius to be just so much displaced towards the red as to indicate the orbital motion of the earth being deducted recession at the rate of twenty nine miles a second and the reality and direction of the movement were ratified by vogel and losses observation march twenty two eighteen seventy one of a similar but even more considerable displacement the inquiry was resumed by huggins with improved apparatus in the following year when the velocities of thirty stars were approximately determined the retreat of sirius which proved slower than had at first been supposed was now announced to be shared at rates varying from twelve to twenty nine miles by betelgeuse rigel castor regulus and five of the principal stars in the plough arcturus on the contrary gave signs of rapid approach as well as pollux vega deneb in the swan and the brightness of the pointers numerically indeed these results were encompassed with uncertainty thus arcturus is now fully ascertained to be travelling towards the sun at the comparatively slow pace of less than five miles a second and sirius moves twice as fast in the same direction the great difficulty of measuring so distended a line as the syrian f might indeed well account for some apparent anomalies the scope of sir william huggins's achievement was not however to provide definitive data but to establish as practicable the method of procuring them in this he was thoroughly successful and his success was of incalculable value spectroscopic investigations of stellar movements may confidently be expected to play a leading part in the unravelment of the vast and complex relations which we can dimly detect as prevailing among the innumerable orbs of the sidereal world for it supplements the means which we possess of measuring by direct observation movements transverse to the line of sight and thus completes our knowledge of the courses and velocities of stars at ascertained distances while supplying for all a valuable index to the amount of perspective foreshortening of apparent movement thus some even if an imperfect knowledge may at length be gained of the revolutions of the stars of the systems they unite to form of the paths they respectively pursue and of the forces under the compulsion of which they travel the applicability of the method to determining the orbital motions of 
double stars was pointed out by fox talbot in 1871 but its use for their discovery revealed itself spontaneously through the harvard college photographs in spectrograms of ursi majoris mizar taken in 1887 and again in 1889 the k line was seen to be double while on other plates it appeared single a careful study of miss a c maury of a series of seventy impressions indicated for the doubling a period of fifty-two days and showed it to affect all the lines in the spectrum the only available and no doubt the true explanation of the phenomenon was that two similar and nearly equal stars are here merged into one telescopically indivisible their combined light giving a single or double spectrum according as their orbital velocities are directed across or along our line of sight the movements of a revolving pair of stars must always be opposite in sense and proportionately equal in amount that is they all at times travel with speeds in the inverse ratio of their masses hence unless the plane of their orbits be perpendicular to a plane passing through the eye there must be two opposite points where their velocities in the line of sight reach a maximum and two diametrically opposite points where they touch zero the lines in their common spectrum would thus appear alternately double and single twice in the course of each revolution to that of mazar at first supposed to need one hundred and four days for its completion a period of only twenty days fourteen hours was finally assigned by vogel anomalous spectral effects probably due to the very considerable eccentricity of the orbit long impeded its satisfactory determination the mean distance apart of the component stars as now ascertained is just twenty two million miles and their joint mass quadruples that of the sun but these are minimum estimates for if the orbital plane be inclined much or little to the line of sight the dimensions and mass of the system should be proportionately increased an analogous discovery was made by miss maury in eighteen eighty nine but in the spectrum of beta aurigae the lines open out and close up on alternate days indicating a relative orbit with a radius of less than eight million miles traversed in about four days this implies a rate of travel for each star of sixty five miles a second and a combined mass four point seven times that of the sun the components are approximately equal both in mass and light and the system formed by them is transported towards us with a speed of some sixty miles a second the line shifting so singularly communicative proceed in this star with perfect regularity this new class of spectroscopic binaries could never have been visually disclosed the distance of beta aurigae from the earth as determined somewhat doubtfully by professor pritchard is nearly three and a third million times that of the earth from the sun parallax equals zero point zero six minutes whence it has been calculated that the greatest angular separation of the revolving stars is only five thousandths of a second of arc to make this evanescent interval perceptible a telescope eighty feet in aperture would be required the zodiacal star spisa alpha were genus was announced by dr vogel april twenty fourth eighteen ninety to belong to the novel category with the difference however of possessing a nearly dark instead of a brilliantly lustrous companion in this case accordingly the tell-tale spectroscopic variations consist merely in a slight swinging to and fro of single lines no second spectrum leaves a legible trace on the plate spisa revolves in four days at the rate of fifty-seven miles a second or quicker in proportion as its orbit is more inclined to the line of sight round a centre at a minimum distance of three millions of miles but the position of the second star being unknown the mass of the system remains indeterminate the lesser component of the splendid slowly revolving binary castor is also closely double its spectral lines were found by Beloposky in eighteen ninety six to oscillate once in nearly three days the secondary globe being apparently quite obscure 
further study of the movements thus betrayed elicited the fact that the major axis of the eclipse traversed revolves in a period of two thousand one hundred days as a consequence most likely of the flattened shape of the stars still more unexpected was the simultaneous assignment by campbell and newell of a duplex character to capella here both components shine though with a different quality of light one giving a pure solar spectrum the other claiming prismatic affinity with procyon their mutual circulation is performed in one hundred and four days and the radius of their orbit cannot be less and may be a great deal more than fifty one million miles hence the possibility is not excluded that the star which has an authentic parallax of zero point zero eight minutes may be visually resolved indeed signs of elongation were thought to be perceptible with the greenwich twenty eight inch refractor while only round images could be seen at lick another noteworthy case is that of polaris found by campbell to have certainly one and probably two obscure attendants through his systematic investigations of stellar radial velocities with the mills spectrograph knowledge in this department has since eighteen ninety seven progressed so rapidly that the spectroscopic binaries of our acquaintance already number half a hundred and ten times as many more doubtless lie within easy range of detection now it is evident that a spectroscopic binary if the plane of its motion made a very small angle with the line of sight would be a variable star for during a few hours of each revolution some at least of its light should be cut off by a transit of its dusky companion such eclipse stars are actually found in the heavens the best and longest known member of the group is algol in the head of medusa the demon star of the arabs this remarkable object normally above the third magnitude loses and regains three-fifths of its light once in sixty-eight point eight hours the change being completed in about twelve hours its definite and limited nature and punctual recurrence suggested to goodrick of york by whom the periodicity of the star was discovered in seventeen eighty three the interposition of a large dark satellite but the conditions involved by the explanation were first seriously investigated by pickering in eighteen eighty he found that the phenomena could be satisfactorily accounted for by supposing an obscure body zero point seven six four the bright star's diameter to revolve round it in a period identical with that of its observed variation this theoretical forecast was verified with singular exactitude at potsdam in eighteen eighty nine a series of spectral photographs taken there showed each of algol's minima to be preceded by a rapid recession from the earth and succeeded by a rapid movement of approach towards it they take place accordingly when the star is at the furthest point from ourselves of an orbit described round an invisible companion the transits of which across its disk betray themselves to notice by the luminous vicissitudes they occasion the diameter of this orbit traversed at the rate of twenty six miles a second is just two million miles and it is an easy further inference from the duration and extent of the phases exhibited that algol itself must be in round numbers one million its attendant eight hundred and thirty thousand miles in diameter assuming both to be of the same density vogel found their respective masses to be four ninths and two ninths that of the sun and their distance ascended to be three million two hundred and thirty thousand miles this singularly assorted pair of stars possibly form part of a larger system their period of revolution is shorter now by six seconds than it was in goodrick's time and dr chandler has shown by an exhaustive discussion that its inequalities are comprised in a cycle of about one hundred and thirty years they arise in his view from a common revolution in that period of the close couple about a third distant body emitting little or no light in an orbit inclined twenty degrees to our line of vision and of approximately the size of that described by uranus round the sun 
the time spent by light in crossing this orbit causes an apparent delay in the phases of the variable when algol and its eclipsing satellite are on its further side from ourselves balanced by acceleration while they traverse its hither side dr chandler derives confirmation for his plausible and ingenious theory from a supposed undulation in the line traced out by algol's small proper motion but the reality of this disturbance has yet to be established meanwhile m tisserand late director of the paris observatory preferred to account for algol's inequalities on the principle later applied by belopolsky to those of castor that is to say he assumed a revolving line of apsides in an elliptical orbit traversed by a pretty strongly compressed pair of globes the truth of this hypothesis can be tested by close observation of the phases of the star during the next few years the variable in the head of medusa is the exemplar of a class including twenty-six recognized members all of which doubtless represent occulting combinations of stars but their occultations result merely from the accident of their orbital planes passing through our line of sight hence the heavens must contain numerous systems similarly constituted though otherwise situated as regards ourselves some of which like spisa where genus will become known through their spectroscopic changes while others because revolving in planes nearly tangent to the sphere or at right angles to the visual line may never disclose to us their true nature among eclipsing stars should probably be reckoned the peculiar variables beta lyri and v puppis each believed to consist of a pair of bright stars revolving almost in contact three stars on the other hand distinguished by rapid and regular fluctuations have been proved by belopolsky to be attended by non-occulting satellites which circulate nevertheless in the identical periods of light change gore's catalogue of known variables included in eighteen eighty four one hundred and ninety entries and the number was augmented to two hundred and forty three on its revision in eighteen eighty eight chandler's first list of two hundred and twenty five such objects published about the same time received successive expansions in eighteen ninety three and eighteen ninety six and finally included four hundred entries a new catalogue of variable stars still wider in scope will shortly be issued by the german astronomische Gesellschaft mr a w roberts's researches on southern variables have greatly helped to give precision while adding to the extent of knowledge in this branch dr gould held the opinion that most stars fluctuate slightly in brightness through surface alterations similar to but on a larger scale than those of the sun and the solar analogy might be pushed somewhat further it perhaps affords a clue to much that is perplexing in stellar behaviour wolf pointed out in eighteen fifty two the striking resemblance in character between curves representing sun-spot frequency and curves representing the changing luminous intensity of many variable stars there were the same steep ascent to maximum and more gradual decline to minimum the same irregularities in heights and hollows and it may be added the same tendency to a double maximum and complexity of superposed periods it is impossible to compare the two sets of phenomena thus graphically portrayed without reaching the conclusion that they are of closely related origin but the correspondence indicated is not as has often been hastily assumed between maxima of some spots and minima of stellar brightness but just the reverse the luminous outbursts not the obscurations of variable stars obey a law analogous to that governing the development of spots on the sun objects of the kind do not then gain light through the closing up of dusky chasms in their photospheres but by an actual increase of surface brilliancy together with an immense growth of these brilliant formations prominences and faculae which in the sun accompany or are appended to spots a comparison of light curves with curves of spot frequency leaves no doubt on this point and the strongest corroborative evidence is derived from the emergence of bright lines in the spectra of long period variables rising to their recurring maxima End of chapter twelve part two
part two chapter twelve part three of a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century by agnes mary clark chapter twelve stars and nebulae part three every kind and degree of variability is exemplified in the heavens at the bottom of the scales are stars like the sun of which the lustre is tried by our instrumental means sensibly steady at the other extreme are ranged the astounding apparitions of new or temporary stars within the last thirty-six years eleven of these stellar guests as the chinese call them have presented themselves and we meet with a twelfth no farther back than april twenty seventh eighteen forty eight but of the new star in Ophiuchus, found by mr hind on that night little more could be learnt than of the brilliant objects of the same kind observed by tycho and kepler the spectroscope had not then been invented let us hear what it had to tell of later arrivals about thirty minutes before midnight of may twelve eighteen sixty six mr john birmingham of millbrook near tuam in ireland saw with astonishment a bright star of the second magnitude unfamiliarly situated in the constellation of the northern crown four hours earlier schmidt of athens had been surveying the same part of the heavens and was able to testify that it was not visible there that is to say a few hours or possibly a few minutes suffice to bring about a conflagration the news of which may have occupied hundreds of years in travelling to us across space the rays which were its messengers admitted within the slit of sir william huggins's spectroscope may sixteen proved to be of a composition highly significant as to the nature of the catastrophe the star which had already declined below the third magnitude showed what was described as a double spectrum to the dusky flutings of secchi's third type four brilliant rays were added the chief of these agreed in position with lines of a hydrogen so that the immediate cause of the outburst was inferred to have been the eruption or ignition of vast masses of that subtle kind of matter the universal importance of which throughout the cosmos is one of the most curious facts revealed by the spectroscope t coronae as the new star was called quickly lost its adventitious splendour nine days after its discovery it was again invisible to the naked eye it is now a pale yellow slightly variable star near the tenth magnitude and finds a place as such in argelander's charts it was thus obscurely known before it made its sudden leap into notoriety the next temporary discovered by dr schmidt at athens november twenty fourth eighteen seventy six could lay no claim to previous recognition even in that modest rank it was strictly a parvenu there was no record of its existence until it made its appearance as a star of nearly the third magnitude in the constellation of the swan its spectrum was examined december two by cornu at paris and a few days later by vogel and o lassi at potsdam it proved of a closely similar character to that of t coronae a range of bright lines including those of hydrogen and probably of helium stood out from a continuous background impressed with strong absorption it may be presumed that in reality the gaseous substances which by their sudden incandescence had produced the apparent conflagration lay comparatively near the surface of the star while the screen of cooler materials intercepting large portions of its light was situated at a considerable elevation in its atmosphere the object meanwhile steadily faded 
by the end of the year it was of no more than seventh magnitude after the second week of march eighteen seventy seven strengthening twilight combined with the decline of its radiance to arrest further observation it was resumed september two at denec with a strange result practically the whole of its scanty light it had then sunk below the tenth magnitude was perceived to be gathered into a single bright line in the green and that the most characteristic line of gaseous nebulae the star had in fact so far as outward appearance was concerned become transformed into a planetary nebula many of which are so minute as to be distinguishable from small stars only by the quality of their radiations it is now having sunk to about the fourteenth magnitude entirely beyond the reach of spectroscopic scrutiny perhaps none of the marvellous changes witnessed in the heavens has given a more significant hint as to their construction than the stellar blaze kindled in the heart of the great andromeda nebula some undetermined number of years or centuries before its rays reached the earth in the month of august eighteen eighty five the first published discovery was by dr hartwig at dorpat on august thirty one but it was found to have been already seen on the nineteenth by mr isaac w ward of belfast and on the seventeenth by m ludovic gouli of rouen the negative observations on the sixteenth of temple and max wolf limited very narrowly the epoch of the apparition nevertheless it did not like most temporaries attain its maximum brightness all at once when first detected it was of the ninth by september one it had risen to the seventh magnitude from which it so rapidly fell off that in march it touched the limit of visibility sixteenth magnitude with the washington twenty six inch its light bleached very perceptibly as it faded during the earlier stages of its decline the contrast was striking between the sharply defined ruddy disk of the star and the hazy greenish-white background upon which it was projected and with which it was inevitably suggested to be in some sort of physical connection let us consider what evidence was really available on this point to begin with the position of the star was not exactly central it lay sixteen seconds of arc to the southwest of the true nebular nucleus its appearance did not then signify a sudden advance of the nebula towards condensation nor was it attended by any visible change in it save the transient effect of partial effacement through superior brightness equally indecisive information was derived from the spectroscope to vogel hasselberg and young the light of the nova seemed perfectly continuous but huggins caught traces of bright lines on september two confirmed on the ninth and copeland succeeded on september thirty in measuring three bright bands with an acute angled prism specially constructed for the purpose a shimmer of f was suspected and had also been perceived by mr o t sherman of yale college still the effect was widely different from that of the characteristic blazing spectrum of a temporary star and prompted the surmise that here too a variable might be under scrutiny the star however was certainly so far new that its rays until their sudden accession of strength were too feeble to affect even our reinforced senses not one of the one thousand two hundred and eighty three small stars recorded in charts of the nebula could be identified with it and a photograph taken by dr common august sixteenth eighteen eighty four on which a multitude of stars down to the fifteenth magnitude had imprinted themselves showed the uniform soft gradation of nebulous light to be absolutely unbroken by a stellar indication in the spot reserved for the future occupation of the nova 
so far then the view that its relation to the nebula was a merely optical one might be justified but it became altogether untenable when it was found that what was taken to be a chance coincidence had repeated itself within living memory on the twenty first of may eighteen sixty monsieur hours perceived at konensberg a seventh magnitude star shining close to the centre of a nebula in scorpio numbered eighty in messier's catalogue three days earlier it certainly was not there and three weeks later it had vanished the effect to mr pogson who independently discovered the change may twenty eight was as if the nebula had been replaced by a star so entirely were its dim rays overpowered by the concentrated blaze in their midst now it is simply incredible that two outbursts of so uncommon a character should have accidentally occurred just on the line of sight between us and the central portions of two nebulae we must then conclude that they showed on these objects because they took place in them the most favoured explanation is that they were what might be called effects of overcrowding that some of the numerous small bodies presumably composing the nebulae jostled together in their intricate circlings and obtained compensation and heat for their sacrifice in motion but this is scarcely more than a plausible makeshift of perplexed thought mr w h s monk on the other hand has suggested that new stars appear when dark bodies are rendered luminous by rushing through the gaseous fields of space just as meteors kindle in our atmosphere the idea which has been revived and elaborated by dr seeliger of munich is ingenious but was not designed to apply to our present case neither of the objects distinguished by the striking variations just described is of gaseous constitution that in scorpio appears under high magnifying powers as a compressed cluster that in andromeda is perhaps as sir j herschel suggested optically nebulous through the smallness of its constituent stars if stars they deserve to be called on the eighth of december eighteen ninety one dr max wolf took a photograph of the region about chi Aurigi. no stranger so bright as the eighth magnitude was among the stars depicted upon it on the tenth nevertheless a stellar object of the fifth magnitude situated a couple of degrees to the northeast of beta tauri and previously unrecorded where eleventh magnitude stars appeared imprinted itself upon a harvard negative subsequent photographs taken at the same place showed it to have gained about half a magnitude by the twentieth but the plates were not then examined and the discovery was left to be modestly appropriated by an amateur the rev dr anderson of edinburgh by whom it was announced february one eighteen ninety two through the medium of an anonymous postcard to dr copeland the astronomer royal for scotland by him and others the engines of modern research were promptly set to work and to good purpose nova aurigi was the first star of its kind studied by the universal chemical method it is the first accordingly of which authentic records can be handed down to posterity they are of a most remarkable character the spectrum of the new object was photographed at stonyhurst and south kensington on february three a few days later at harvard and lick in america at potsdam and Heroni on the continent of europe but by far the most complete impression was secured february twenty two with an exposure of an hour and three quarters by sir william and lady huggins through whose kindness it is reproduced in plate five figure one the range of bright lines displayed in it is of astonishing vividness and extent it includes all the hydrogen rays dark in the spectrum of sirius 
separately printed for comparison besides many others still more refrangible as yet unidentified very significant too is the marked character of the great prominence lines h and k the visual spectrum of the nova was splendidly effective a quartet of brilliant green rays two of them due to helium caught the eye and they had companions too numerous to be easily counted the hydrogen lines were broad and bright c blazed as mr espin said like a danger signal on a dark night the sodium pair were identified at tulse hill and the yellow helium ray was suspected to lurk close behind them figure two in the same plate shows the spectrum as it was seen and mapped by lady huggins february two two six together with the spectra employed to test the nature of the emissions dispersed in it one striking feature will be at once remarked it is that of the pairing of bright with dark lines both in the visible and the photographic regions this singular peculiarity was unmistakable and since the two series plainly owned the same chemical origin their separate visibility implied large displacement otherwise they would have been superposed not juxtaposed measurements of the bright rays accordingly showed them to be considerably pushed down towards the red while their dark companions were still more pushed up towards the blue end thus the spectrum of nova aurigae like that of beta lyrae with which it had many points in common appeared to be really double it was supposed to combine the light of two distinct bodies one of a gaseous nature moving rapidly away from the earth the other giving a more sun-like spectrum approaching it with even higher speed the relative velocity determined at potsdam for these oppositely flying masses amounted to five hundred and fifty miles a second and this prodigious rate of separation was fully maintained during six weeks it did not then represent a mere periastral rush past to the bodies exhibiting its effects and parting company for ever under its stress it must have belonged with slight diminution in perpetuity the luminous outburst by which they became visible was explained by sir william huggins in a lecture delivered at the royal institution may thirteenth eighteen ninety two on the tidal theory of clinkerfuis and wilsing disturbances and deformations due to the mutual attraction of two bulky globes at a close approach would he considered give rise to enormous eruptions of the hotter matters from within immensely greater but similar in kind to solar eruptions and accompanied probably by large electrical disturbances the multiple aspect and somewhat variable character of both bright and dark lines were plausibly referred to processes of reversal such as are nearly always in progress among sun-spots but the long duration of the star's suddenly acquired lustre did not easily fit in with the adopted rationale a direct collision on the other hand was out of the question since there had obviously been little if any sacrifice of motion and the substitution of a nebula for one of the stars compelled recourse to scarcely conceivable modes of action for an explanation of the perplexing peculiarities of the compound spectrum an unexpected denouement however threw all speculations off the track the nova contained most of its brightness fluctuations notwithstanding until march nine after which date it ran swiftly and uniformly down towards what was apprehended to be total extinction 
no marked change of spectrum attended its decline when last examined at tulse hill march twenty four all the more essential features of its prismatic light were still faintly recognizable the object was steadily sinking on april twenty six when a supposed final glimpse of it was caught with the lick thirty six inch it was then of about the sixteenth magnitude but on august seventeen it had sprung up to the tenth as professors holden shaberl and campbell perceived with amazement on turning the same instrument upon its place and to professor barnard it appeared two nights later not only revived but transformed into the nucleus of a planetary nebula three minutes across the reality of this seeming distension however at once disputed was eventually disproved it unquestionably arose from the imperfect focusing power of the telescope for rays of unusual quality the rekindled nova was detected in this country by mr h corder on whose notification mr espin on august twenty one examined its nearly monochromatic spectrum the metamorphosis of nova cygni seemed repeated the light of the new object like that of its predecessor was mainly concentrated in a vivid green band identified with the chief nebula line by copeland von goddard and campbell the second nebula line was also represented indeed the last named observer recognized nearly all the eighteen lines measured by him in the nova as characteristic of planetary nebulae of particular interest is the emergence in the star spectrum photographed by von goddard of an ultraviolet line originally discovered at tulse hill in the orion nebula which is also very strong in the lyra annular nebula obviously then the physical constitution of nova aurigae became profoundly modified during the four months of its invisibility the spectrum of february was or appeared compound that of august was simple it could be reasonably associated only with a single light source many of the former brilliant lines too had vanished and been replaced by others at first inconspicuous or absent as a result the solar prominence type to which the earlier spectrum had seemed to conform was completely effaced in the later the cause of these alterations remains mysterious yet its effects continue the chromatic behaviour of the semi-extinct nova when scrutinised with great refractors shows its waning light to be distinctly nebular like nearly all its congeners the star is situated in the full stream of the milky way and we learn without surprise that micrometrical measures by burnham and barnard failed to elicit from it any sign of parallactic shifting it is hence certain that the development of light of which the news reached the earth in december eighteen ninety one must have been on a vast scale and of ancient date nova aurigae at its maximum assuredly exceeded the sun many times in brightness and its conflagration can scarcely have occurred less and may have occurred much more than a hundred years ago by means of the photographic surveys of the skies carried on in both hemispheres under professor pickering's superintendence such amazing events have been proved to be of not infrequent occurrence within six years five new stars were detected from draper memorial or chart plates by mrs fleming besides the retrospective discovery of a sixth which had rapidly burnt itself out eight years previously in perseus nova normi was the intermediate successor of nova aurigae nova carinae and nova centauri lit up in eighteen ninety five the latter in a pre-existent nebula nova 
sagittarii and nova aquilae attained brief maxima in eighteen ninety eight and eighteen ninety nine respectively now three out of these five stars reproduced with singular fidelity the spectrum of nova aurigae they displayed the same brilliant rays shadowed invariably on their blue sides by dark ones palpably then the arrangement was systematic and significant it could not result merely from the casually directed opposite velocities of bodies meeting in space the hypothesis of stellar encounters accordingly fell to the ground and has been provided with no entire satisfactory substitute most speculators now fully recognize that motion displacements cannot be made to account for the doubled spectra of novi and seek recourse instead to some kind of physical agency for producing the observed effect and since this is also visible in certain permanent though peculiar objects notably in p signi b lyri and eta carini the acting cause must also evidently be permanent and inherent the new star of the new century was a visual discovery dr anderson duplicated with added eclat his performance of nine years back in the early morning of february twenty two nineteen o one he perceived that algol had a neighbour of nearly its own brightness which a photograph taken by mr stanley williams at brighton proved to have risen from below the twelfth magnitude within the preceding twenty-eight hours and it was still swiftly ascending on the twenty-third it outshone capella for a brief space it took rank as the premier star of the northern hemisphere a decline set in promptly but was pursued hesitatingly the light fluctuated continually over a range of a couple of magnitudes and with a close approach during some weeks to a three-day periodicity a year after the original outburst the star was still conspicuous with an opera-glass the spectrum underwent amazing changes at first continuous save for fine dark lines of hydrogen and helium it unfolded within forty-eight hours a composite range of brilliant and dusky bands disposed in the usual fashion of novi these lasted until far on in march when hydrogen certainly and probably other substances as well ceased to exert any appreciable absorptive action blue emissions of the wolf rayet type then became occasionally prominent in remarkable correspondence with the varying lustre of the star finally a band at lambda thirty nine sixty nine found by wright at lick to characterize nebular spectra assumed abnormal importance and in july the nebular transformation might be said to be complete striking alterations of color attended these spectral vicissitudes white to begin with the star soon turned deep red and its redness was visibly intensified at each of its recurring minima of light blanching however ensued upon the development of its nebulous proclivities and its surviving rays are of a steely hue all the more important investigations of nova persei were conducted by photographic means libraries of spectral plates were collected at the yerkes and lick observatories at south kensington stonyhurst and potsdam and await the more exhaustive interpretation of the future meanwhile extraordinary revelations have been supplied by immediate photographic delineation on august twenty two and twenty three nineteen o one professor max wolf by long exposures with the sixteen inch bruce twin objectives of the koningstuhl observatory heidelberg obtained indications of a large nebula finely ramified extending southeast of the nova and the entire formation came out in four hours with the yerkes two-foot reflector directed to it by mr ritchie on september twenty 
it proved to be a great spiral encircling and apparently emanating from the star but if so tumultuously and under stress of catastrophic impulsions a picture obtained by mr perrine with the crossley refractor in seven hours nineteen minutes on november seven and eight disclosed the progress of a startling change comparison with the yerkes photograph showed that during the intervening forty-eight days four clearly identifiable condensations had become displaced all to the same extent of about ninety seconds of arc and in fairly concordant directions suggesting motion round the nova as well as away from it the velocity implied however is so prodigious as virtually to exclude the supposition of a bodily transport of matter it should be at the rate of no less than twenty thousand miles a second admitting the object to be at a distance from us corresponding to an annual parallax of one-tenth of a second and actual measurements show it to be indefinitely more remote the fact of rapid variations in the nebula was reaffirmed though with less precision from yerkes photographs of november nine and thirteen mr ritchie inferring a general expansion of its southern portions much further evidence must be at hand before a sane judgment can be formed as to the nature of the strange events taking place in that secluded corner of the galaxy and it is highly probable that the illumination of the nebulous wreaths round the star will prove no less evanescent than the blazing of the star itself we have been compelled somewhat to anticipate our narrative as regards inquiries into the nature of nebulae the excursions of opinion on the point were abruptly restricted and defined by the application to them of the spectroscope on august twenty ninth eighteen sixty four sir william huggins sifted through his prisms the rays of a bright planetary nebula in draco to his infinite surprise they proved to be mainly of one colour in other words they avowed their origin from a mass of glowing vapour as to what kind of vapour it might be by which herschel's conjecture of a shining fluid diffused at large throughout the cosmos was thus unexpectedly verified an answer only partially satisfactory could be afforded the conspicuous bright line of the draco nebula seemed to agree in position with one emitted by nitrogen but has since proved to be distinct from it of its two fainter companions one was unmistakably the f line of hydrogen while the other in position intermediate between the two still remains unidentified by eighteen sixty eight huggins had satisfactorily examined the spectra of about seventy nebulae of which one-third displayed a gaseous character all of these gave the green ray fundamental to the nebular spectrum and emanating from an unknown form of matter named by sir william huggins nebulum it is associated with seven or eight hydrogen lines with three of yellow helium and with a good many of undetermined origin the absence of the crimson radiation of hydrogen perceived with difficulty only in some highly condensed objects is an anomaly very imperfectly explained as a physiological effect connected with the extreme faintness of nebular light an approximate coincidence between the chief nebula line and a fluting of magnesium having been alleged by lockyer in support of his meteoritic hypothesis of nebular constitution it became of interest to ascertain its reality the task was accomplished by sir william and lady huggins in eighteen eighty nine and eighteen ninety and by professor keeler with the advantages of the mount hamilton apparatus and atmosphere in eighteen ninety to ninety one the upshot was to show a slight but sure discrepancy as to place and a marked diversity as to character between the two qualities of light the nebular ray wavelength five thousand seven millionths of a millimetre 
is slightly more refrangible than the magnesium fluting edge and it is sharp and fine with no trace of the unilateral haze necessarily clinging even to the last remnant of a banded formation end of chapter twelve part three part two chapter twelve of a popular history of astronomy during the nineteenth century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Carlo in San Clemente, California. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clark. Part 2, Chapter 12, Stars and Nebulae, Part 4. Planetary and annular nebulae are, without exception, gaseous, as well as those termed irregular, which frequent the region of the Milky Way. Their constitution usually betrays itself to the eye by their blue or greenish color, while those yielding a continuous spectrum are of a dull white. Among the more remarkable of these are the well-known nebula in Andromeda and the great spiral in Canis Venatici, and, as a general rule, the emissions of all such nebulae as present the appearance of star clusters grown misty through excessive distance are of the same kind. It would, however, be eminently rash to conclude thence that they are really aggregations of sun-like bodies. The improbability of such an inference has been greatly enhanced by the occurrence, at an interval of a quarter of a century, of stellar outbursts in the midst of two of them for it is practically certain that the temporary stars were equally remote with the hazy formations they illuminated. Hence, if the constituent particles of the latter be suns, the incomparable vaster orbs by which their feeble light was well-nigh obliterated must, as was argued by Mr. Proctor, have been on a scale of magnitude such as the imagination recoils from contemplating. Nevertheless, Dr. Shiner, not without much difficulty, obtained in January 1899 spectrographic prints of the Andromeda Nebula, indicative, he thought, of its being a cluster of solar stars. Sir William and Lady Huggins, on the other hand, saw, in 1897, bright intermixed with dark bands in the spectrum of the same object, and Mr. Maunder conjectures all white nebulae to be made up of sunlets in which the coronal element predominates, while chromospheric materials assert their presence in nebulae of the green variety. Among the ascertained analogies between the stellar and nebular systems is that of variability of light. On October 11, 1852, Mr. Hind discovered a small nebula in Taurus, Shakornak observed it at Marseille in 1854, but was confounded four years later to find it vanished. D'Arrest missed it October 3rd and redetected it December 29, 1861. It was easily seen in 1865 through 1866, but invisible in the most powerful instruments from 1877 to 1880. Barnard, however, made out an almost evanescent trace of it, October 15, 1890, with the Great Lick Telescope, and saw it easily in the spring of 1895, while six months later it evaded his most diligent search. Then again, on September 28, 1897, the Yerkes 40-inch disclosed it to him as a mere shimmer at the last limit of visibility and it came out in three diffuse patches on plates to which, on December 6th and 27th, 1899, Keeler gave prolonged exposures with the Crossley Reflector. Moreover, a fairly bright adjacent nebula, perceived by O. Struve in 1868 and observed shortly afterwards by D'Arrest, has totally vanished, and was most likely only a temporary apparition. These are the most authentic instances of nebular variability. Many others have been more or less plausibly alleged. 
But Professor Holden's persuasion, acquired from an exhaustive study of the record since 1758, that the various parts of the Orion Nebula fluctuate continually in relative luster, has not been ratified by photographic evidence. The case of the Trifid Nebula in Sagittarius, investigated by Holden in 1877, is less easily disposed of. What is certain is that a remarkable triple star centrally situated, according to the observations of both the Herschels, 1784 through 1833, in a dark space between the three great lobes of the nebula, is now, and has been since 1839, densely involved in one of them. And since the hypothesis of relative motion is on many grounds inadmissible, the change that has apparently taken place must be in the distribution of light. One no less conspicuous was adduced by Mr. H. C. Russell, director of the Sydney Observatory. A particular bright part of the great Argo Nebula, as drawn by Sir John Herschel, has, it would seem, almost totally disappeared. He noticed its absence in 1871 using a seven-inch telescope, failed equally later on to find it with an eleven-and-a-half-inch, and his long exposure photographs show no vestige of it. The same structure is missing from, or scarcely traceable in, a splendid picture of the nebula taken by Sir David Gill in twelve hours distributed over four nights in March 1892. An immense gaseous expanse has, it would seem, sunk out of sight. Materially it is no doubt there, but the radiance has left it. Nebulae have no ascertained proper motions. No genuine change of place in the heavens has yet been recorded for any one of them. All equally hold aloof, so far as telescopic observation shows, from the busy journeyings of the stars. This seeming immobility is partly an effect of vast distance. Nebular parallax has, up to the present, proved evanescent, a nebular parallactic drift, in response to the sun's advance through space, remains likewise imperceptible. It may hence be presumed that no nebulae occur within the sphere occupied by the nearer stars. But the difficulty of accurately measuring such objects must also be taken into account. Displacements which would be conspicuous in stars might easily escape detection in ill-defined hazy masses. Thus, the measures executed by Darrest in 1857 have not yet proved effective for their designed purpose of contributing to the future detection of proper motions. Some determinations made by Mr. Burnham with the Lick refractor in 1891 will ultimately afford a more critical test. He found that nearly all planetary nebulae include a sharp stellar nucleus, the position of which, with reference to neighboring stars, could be fixed no less precisely than if it were devoid of nebulous surroundings. Hence, the objects located by him cannot henceforward shift, were it only to the extent of a small fraction of a second, without the fact coming to the knowledge of astronomers. The spectroscope, however, here as elsewhere, can supplement the telescope. And what it has to tell, it tells at once, without the necessity of waiting on time to ripen results. Sir William Huggins made, in 1874, the earliest experiments on the radial movements of nebulae, but with only a negative upshot. None of the six objects examined gave signs of spectral alteration, and it was estimated that they must have done so had they been in course of recession from or approach towards the Earth by as much as 25 miles a second. With far more powerful appliances, Professor Keeler renewed the attempt at Lick in 1890-91. His success was unequivocal. Ten planetary nebulae yielded perfectly satisfactory evidence of line-of-sight motion, the swiftest traveler being the well-known greenish globe in Draco, found to be hurrying towards the Earth at the rate of 40 miles a second. For the Orion Nebula, a recession of about 11 miles was determined, 
the whole of which may, however, very well belong to the solar system itself, which, by its translation towards the constellation Lyra, is certainly leaving the great nebula pretty rapidly behind. The anomaly of seeming nebular fixity has nevertheless been removed, and the problem of nebular motion has begun to be solved through the demonstrated possibility of its spectroscopic investigation. Keeler's were the first trustworthy determinations of radial motion obtained visually. That the similar work on the stars begun at Greenwich in 1874 and carried on for 13 years remained comparatively unfruitful was only what might have been expected, the instruments available there being altogether inadequate for the attainment of a high degree of accuracy. The various obstacles in the way of securing it were overcome by the substitution of the sensitive plate for the eye. Air tremors are thus rendered comparatively innocuous, and measurements of stellar lines displaced by motion with reference to fiducial lines from terrestrial sources photographed on the same plates can be depended upon within vastly reduced limits of error. Studies for the realization of the spectrographic method were begun by Dr. Fogel and his able assistant, Dr. Scheiner, at Potsdam in 1887. Their preliminary results, communicated to the Berlin Academy of Sciences March 15, 1888, already showed that the requirements for effective research in this important branch were at last about to be complied with. An improved instrument was erected in the autumn of the same year, and the 51 stars, bright enough for determination with a refractor of 11 inches aperture, were promptly taken in hand. A list of their motions in the line of sight, published in 1892, was of high value both in itself and for what it promised. One noteworthy inference from the data it collected was that the eye tends, under unfavorable circumstances, to exaggerate the line displacements it attempts to estimate. The velocities photographically arrived at were of much smaller amounts than those visually assigned. The average speed of the Potsdam stars came out only 10.4 miles a second, the quickest among them being Aldebaran, with a recession of 30 miles a second. More lately, however, Deslandres and Campbell have determined for Eta Hercules and Zeta Cephei, respectively approaching rates of 44 and 54 miles a second. The installation in 1900 of a photographic refractor 31 and a half inches in aperture, coupled with a 20-inch guiding telescope, will enable Dr. Fogel to investigate spectrographically some hundreds of stars fainter than the second magnitude, and the materials thus accumulated should largely help to provide means for a definite and complete solution of the more than secular problem of the sun's advance through space. The solution should be complete because, including a genuine determination of the sun's velocity, apart from assumptions of any kind M. Hohmann's attempt in 1885 to extract some provisional information on the subject from the radial movements of visually determined stars, gave a fair earnest of what might be done with materials of a better quality. He arrived at a goal for the sun's way shifted eastward to the constellation Cygnus, a result congruous with the marked tendency of recently determined apexes to collect in or near Lyra, and the most probable corresponding velocity seemed to be about 19 miles a second, or just that of the Earth in its orbit. A more elaborate investigation of the same kind, based by Professor Campbell in 1900 upon the motions of 280 stars, determined with extreme precision, suffered in completeness through lack of available data from the southern hemisphere. The outcome, accordingly, was an apex most likely correctly placed as regards right ascension, but displaced southward by some 15 degrees. The speed of 12 miles a second assigned to the solar translation approximates doubtless very closely to the truth. A successful beginning was made in nebular spectrography by Sir William Huggins, March 7, 1882. Five lines in all stamped themselves upon the plate during 45 minutes of exposure to the rays of the strange object in Orion. 
Of these, four were the known visible lines, and a fifth, high up in the ultraviolet at wavelength 3727, has evidently peculiar relationships as yet imperfectly apprehended. It is strong in the spectra of many planetaries. It helped to characterize the nebular metamorphosis of Nova Aurigae, yet failed to appear in Nova Persei. Two additional hydrogen lines, making six in all, were photographed at Tulse Hill from the Orion Nebula in 1890, and Dr. Copeland's detection in 1886 of the yellow ray D3 gave the first hint of the presence of helium in this prodigious formation. Nor are there wanting spectroscopic indications of its physical connection with the stars visually involved in it. Sir William and Lady Huggins found a plate exposed February 5, 1888, impressed with four groups of fine, bright lines, originating in the continuous light of two of the trapezium stars, but extending some way into the surrounding nebula. And Dr. Shiner argued a wider relationship from the common possession by the nebula and the chief stars in the constellation Orion, of a blue line, bright in the one case, dark in the others, since identified as a member of one of the helium series. The structural unity of the stellar and nebular orders in this extensive region of the sky has also, by direct photographic means, been unmistakably affirmed. The first promising autographic picture of the Orion Nebula was obtained by Draper, September 30, 1880. The marked approach towards a still more perfectly satisfactory result shown by his plates of March 1881 and 1882 was unhappily cut short by his death. Meanwhile, M. Janssen was at work in the same field from 1881 with his accustomed success. But Dr. A. Ainsley Common left all competitors far behind with a splendid picture taken January 30, 1883, by means of an exposure of 37 minutes in the focus of his three-foot silver-on-glass mirror. Photography may thereby be said to have definitely assumed the office of historiographer to the nebulae, since this one impression embodies a mass of facts hardly to be compassed by months of labor with a pencil, and affords a record of shape and relative brightness in the various parts of the stupendous object it delineates, which must prove invaluable to the students of its future condition. Its beauty and merit were officially recognized by the award of the Astronomical Society's gold medal in 1884. A second picture of equal merit, obtained by the same means, February 28, 1883, with an exposure of one hour, is reproduced in the frontispiece. The vignette includes two specimens of planetary photography. The Jupiter, with the great red spot conspicuous in the southern hemisphere, is by Dr. Common. It dates from September 3, 1879, and was accordingly one of the earliest results with his 36-inch, the direct image in which imprinted itself in a fraction of a second, and was subsequently enlarged on paper about twelve times. The exquisite little picture of Saturn was taken at Paris by Messrs. Paul and Prosper Henry, December 21, 1885, with their 13-inch photographic refractor. The telescopic image was in this case magnified eleven times previous to being photographed, an exposure of about five seconds being allowed, and the total enlargement, as it now appears, is nineteen times. A trace of the dusky ring perceptible on the original negative is lost in the print. A photograph of the Orion Nebula, taken by Dr. Roberts in 67 minutes, November 30, 1886, made a striking disclosure of the extent of that prodigious object. More than six times the nebulous area depicted on Dr. Common's plates is covered by it, and it plainly shows an adjacent nebula, separately catalogued by Messier, to belong to the same vast formation. This disposition to annex and appropriate has come out more strongly with every increase of photographic power. Plates exposed at Harvard College in March 1888 with an eight-inch portrait lens 
the same used in the preparation of the Draper catalogue, showed the old established fish mouth nebula not only to involve the stars of the sword handle, but to be in tolerably evident connection with the most easterly of the three belt stars, from which a remarkable nebulous appendage was found to proceed. A still more curious discovery was made by W. H. Pickering in 1889. Photographs taken in three hours from the summit of Wilson's Peak in California revealed the existence of an enormous, though faint, spiral structure, enclosing in its span of nearly 17 degrees the entire stellar and nebulous group of the belt and sword, from which it most likely, although not quite traceably, issues as if from a nucleus. A startling glimpse is thus afforded of the cosmical importance of that strange hiatus in the heavens which excited the wonder of Huygens in 1656. The inconceivable attenuation of the gaseous stuff composing it was virtually demonstrated by Mr. Ranyard. In March 1885, Sir Howard Grubb mounted for Dr. Isaac Roberts at Magull near Liverpool, his observatory has since been transferred to Crowborough in Sussex, a silver-on-glass reflector of 20 inches aperture, constructed expressly for use in celestial photography. A series of nebula pictures obtained with this fine instrument have proved highly instructive both as to the structure and extent of these wonderful objects. Above all, one of the great Andromeda Nebula, to which an exposure of three hours was given on October 1, 1888. In it, a convoluted structure replaced and rendered intelligible the anomalously rifted mass seen by Bond in 1847. The effects of annular condensation appeared to have stamped themselves upon the plate, and two attendant nebulae presented the aspect of satellites already separated from the parent body and presumably revolving round it. The ring nebula in Lyra was photographed at Paris in 1886, and shortly afterwards by von Gotthard with a 10-inch reflector, and he similarly depicted in 1888 the two chief spiral and other nebulae. Photographs of the Lyra nebula taken at Algiers in 1890 and at the Vatican Observatory in 1892 were remarkable for the strong development of a central star, difficult of telescopic discernment, but evidently of primary importance to the annular structure around. The uses of photography in celestial investigations become every year more manifold and more apparent. The earliest chemical star pictures were those of Castor and Vega, obtained with the Cambridge refractor in 1850 by Whipple of Boston under the direction of W. C. Bond. Double star photography was inaugurated under the auspices of G. P. Bond, April 27, 1857, with an impression, obtained in eight seconds, of Mizar, the middle star in the handle of the plow. A series of measures from 62 similar images gave the distance and position angle of its companion with about the same accuracy attainable by ordinary micrometrical operations. And the method and upshot of these novel experiments were described in three papers remarkably forecasting the purposes to be served by stellar photography. The matter next fell into the able hands of Rutherford, who completed in 1864 a fine object glass of 11 and a half inches, corrected for the ultraviolet rays, consequently useless for visual purposes. The sacrifice was recompensed by conspicuous success. A set of measurements from his photographs of nearly fifty stars in the Pleiades, and their comparison with Bessel's places, enabled Dr. Gould to announce, in 1866, that during the intervening third of a century no changes of importance had occurred in their relative positions and Mr. Harold Jacobi similarly ascertained the fixity of 75 of Rutherford's Atlantids between the epoch 1873 and that of Dr. Elkin's heliometric triangulation of the cluster in 1886, extending the interval to 27 years by subsequent comparisons with plates taken at Lick, September 27, 1900. Positive, however, as well as negative results have ensued from the application of modern methods to that antique group. 
On October 19, 1859, Wilhelm Tempel, a Saxon peasant by origin, later a skilled engraver, discovered with a small telescope bought out of his scanty savings an elliptical nebulosity stretching far to the southward from the star Merope. It attracted the attention of many observers, but was so often missed owing to its extreme susceptibility to adverse atmospheric influences as to rouse unfounded suspicions of its variability. The detection of this evasive object gave a hint, barely intelligible at the time, of further revelations of the same kind by more cogent means. A splendid photograph of 1,421 stars in the Pleiades, taken by Messrs. Henry with three hours' exposure, November 16, 1885, showed one of the brightest of them to have a small spiral nebula, somewhat resembling a strongly curved comet's tail, attached to it. The reappearance of this strange appurtenance on three subsequent plates left no doubt of its real existence, visually attested at Pokova, February 5, 1886, by one of the first observations made with the 30-inch equatorial. Much smaller apertures, however, sufficed to disclose the Maya Nebula, once it was known to be there. Not only did it appear greatly extended in the Vienna 27-inch, but Messrs. Perrotin and Tholan saw it with the Nice 15-inch, and M. Kammermann of Geneva, employing special precautions, with a refractor of only 10 inches aperture. The advantage derived by him for bringing it into view from the insertion into the eyepiece of a uranium film gives, with its photographic intensity, valid proof that a large proportion of the light of this remarkable object is of the ultraviolet kind. The beginning thus made was quickly followed up. A picture of the Pleiades, procured at Magol in 89 minutes, October 23, 1886, revealed nebulous surroundings to no less than four leading stars of the group, namely Alcyone, Electra, Merope, and Maya. And a second impression, taken in three hours on the following night, showed further that the nebulosity extends in streamers and fleecy masses till it seems almost to fill the spaces between the stars and to extend far beyond them. The coherence of the entire mixed structure was, moreover, placed beyond doubt by the visibly close relationship of the stars to the nebulous formations surrounding them in Dr. Roberts' striking pictures. Thus, Goldschmidt's notion that all the clustered Pleiades constitute, as it were, a second Orion trapezium in the midst of a huge formation of which Temple's nebula is but a fragment has been to some extent verified. Yet it seemed fantastic enough in 1863. Then, in 1888, the Messieurs Henry gave exposures of four hours each to several plates which exhibited on development some new features of the entangled nebulae. The most curious of these was the linking together of stars by nebulous chains. In one case, seven aligned stars appeared strung on a silvery filament like beads on a rosary. The row of stars, so often noticed in the sky, may then be concluded to have more than an imaginary existence. Of the 2,326 stars recorded in these pictures, a couple of hundred among the brightest can, at the outside, be reckoned as genuine Pleiades. The great majority were relegated, by Pickering's and Stratonoff's counts of the stellar populace, in and near the cluster to the position of outsiders from it. They are undistinguished denizens of the abysmal background upon which it is projected. Investigations of its condition were carried a stage further by Barnard. On November 14, 1890, he discovered visually, with the Lick refractor, a close nebulous satellite to Merope, photographs of which were obtained by Keeler in 1898. It appears in them of a rudely pentagonal shape, a prominent angle being directed towards the adjacent star. Finally, an exposure of ten hours made by Bernard with the Willard lens indicated the singular fact that the entire group is embedded in a nebulous matrix, streaky outliers of which blur a wide surface of the celestial vault. The artist's conviction of the reality of what his picture showed 
was confirmed by negatives obtained by Bailey at Arequipa in 1897 and by H. C. Wilson at Northfield, Minnesota, in 1898. With the Ealing three-foot reflector, sold by Dr. Common to Mr. Crossley and by him presented to the Lick Observatory, Professor Keeler took in 1899 a series of beautiful and instructive nebula photographs. One of the trifid may be singled out as of particular excellence. An astonishing multitude of new nebula were revealed by trial exposures with this instrument. A conservative estimate gave 120,000 as the number coming within its scope. Moreover, the majority of those actually recorded were of an unmistakable spiral character, and they included most of Sir John Herschel's double nebula, previously supposed to exemplify the primitive history of binary stellar systems. Dr. Max Wolff's explorations with a 6-inch Vogtländer lens in 1901 emphatically reaffirmed the inexhaustible wealth of the nebula heavens. In one restricted region, midway between Presepi and the Milky Way, he located 135 nebula where only three had, until then, been catalogued and he counted 108 such objects clustering round the star 31 Coma Berenices, and so closely that all might be occulted together by the moon. The general photographic catalogue of nebula which Dr. Wolf had begun to prepare will thus be a most voluminous work. The history of celestial photography at the Cape of Good Hope began with the appearance of the great comet of 1882, no special apparatus was at hand, so Sir David Gill called in the services of a local artist, Mr. Alice of Mowbray, with whose camera, strapped to the observatory equatorial, pictures of conspicuous merit were obtained. But their particular distinction lay in the multitude of stars begemming the background. See plate 3. The sight of them at once opened to the royal astronomer a new prospect. He had already formed the project of extending Agelende's Durchmusterung from the point where it was left by Schoenfeld to the southern pole, and his ideas regarding the means of carrying it into execution crystallized at the needle touch of the cometary experiments. He resolved to employ photography for the purpose. The exposure of plates was accordingly begun under the care of Mr. Ray Woods in 1885, and in less than six years the sky, from 19 degrees of south latitude to the pole, had been covered in duplicate. Their measurement and the preparation of a catalogue of the stars imprinted upon them were generously undertaken by Professor Kaptein, and his laborious task has at length been successfully completed. The publication in 1900 of the third and concluding volume of the Cape Photographic Durchmusterung placed at the disposal of astronomers a photographic census of the heavens fuller and surer than the corresponding visual enumeration executed at Bonn. It includes 454,875 stars, nearly to the tenth magnitude, and their positions are reliable to about one second of arc. The production of this important work was thus a result of the Cape Comet pictures, yet not the most momentous one. They turned the scale in favor of recourse to the camera when the Messrs. Henry encountered, in their continuation of Chaconac's half-finished enterprise of ecliptical charting, sections of the Milky Way defying the enumerating efforts of eye and hand. The perfect success of some preliminary experiments made with an instrument constructed by them expressly for the purpose was announced to the Academy of Sciences at Paris May 2, 1885. By its means, stars estimated as of the 16th magnitude clearly recorded their presence and their places, and the enormous increase of knowledge involved may be judged of from the fact that, in a space of the Milky Way in Cygnus, 2 degrees 15 minutes by 3 degrees, where 170 stars had been mapped by the old laborious method, about 5,000 stamped their images on a single Henry plate. These results suggested the grand undertaking of a general photographic survey of the heavens, and Gill's proposal, June 4, 1886, of an international congress for the purpose of setting it on foot, 
was received with acclamation and promptly acted upon. Fifty-six delegates of seventeen different nationalities met in Paris, April 16, 1887, under the presidentship of Admiral Mouchet, to discuss measures and organize action. They resolved upon the construction of a photographic chart of the whole heavens, comprising stars of a fourteenth magnitude to the surmised number of twenty millions, to be supplemented by a catalogue framed from plates of comparatively short exposure, giving start to the eleventh magnitude. These will probably amount to about one million and a quarter. For procuring both sets of plates, instruments were constructed precisely similar to that of Messrs. Henry, which is a photographic refractor, 13 inches in aperture and 11 feet focus, attached to a guiding telescope of 11 inches aperture, corrected, of course, for the visual rays. Each place covers an area of four square degrees, and since the series must be duplicated to prevent mistakes, about 22,000 plates will be needed for the chart alone. The task of preparing them was apportioned among 18 observatories scattered over the globe, from Mexico to Melbourne. But three in South America, having become disabled or inert, were replaced in 1900 by those at Cordoba, Montevideo, and Perth, Western Australia. Meanwhile, the publication of results has begun and is likely to continue for at least a quarter of a century. The first volume of measures from the Potsdam catalog plates was issued in 1899, and its successors, if on the same scale, must number nearly 400. Moreover, 96 heliogravure enlargements from the Paris chart plates, distributed in the same year, supplied a basis for the calculation that the entire atlas of the sky, composed of similar sheets, will form a pile 30 feet high and 2 tons in weight. It will, however, possess an incalculable scientific value, for millions of stars can be determined by its means from their imprinted images, with an accuracy comparable to that attainable by direct meridian observations. One of the most ardent promoters of the scheme, it may be expected to realize, was Admiral Mouchet, the successor of Le Verrier in the direction of the Paris Observatory. But it was not granted to him to see the fruition of his efforts. He died suddenly June 25, 1892. Although not an astronomer by profession, he had been singularly successful in pushing forward the cause of the science he loved, while his genial and open nature won for him wide personal regard. He was replaced by M. Tisserand, whose mathematical eminence fitted him to continue the traditions of Delaunay and Le Verrier. But his career, too, was unhappily cut short by an unforeseen death on October 20, 1896. And the more eminent among the many qualifications of his successor, M. Maurice Louis, are of the practical kind. The sublime problem of the construction of the heavens has not been neglected amid the multiplicity of tasks imposed upon the cultivators of astronomy by its rapid development. But data of a far higher order of precision and indefinitely greater in amount than those at the disposal of Herschel or Struve must be accumulated before any definite conclusions on the subject are possible. The first organized effort towards realizing this desideratum was made by the German Astronomical Society in 1865, two years after its foundation at Heidelberg. The original program consisted in the exact determination of the places of all Agelander's stars to the ninth magnitude, exclusive of the polar zone, from the reobservation of which, say, in the year 1950, astronomers of two generations hence may gather a vast store of knowledge, directly of the apparent motions, indirectly of the mutual relations binding together the suns and systems of space. Thirteen observatories in Europe and America joined in the work, now virtually terminated. Its scope was, after its inception, widened to include southern zones as far as the Tropic of Capricorn, this having been rendered feasible by Schoenfeld's extension, 1875 through 1885, of Augelander's survey. 30,000 additional stars thus taken in were allotted in zones to five observatories. Another important undertaking of the same class is the reobservation of the 47,300 stars in Lalande's Histoire Celeste. Begun under Arago in 1855, its upshot has been the publication of the great Paris catalogue, 
issued in eight volumes between 1887 and 1902. From a careful study of their secular changes in position, M. Bosset has already derived the proper motions of a couple of thousand out of nearly 50,000 stars enumerated in it. End of Part 2, Chapter 12, Stars and Nebulae, Part 4 Recording by Aaron Carlo in San Clemente, California